Hidden Darkness, Book 4 of the Hidden Saga, by Amy Patrick. Narrated by Amy DeLuca. Chapter 1. Ryan. Fire is a funny thing. It provides light, heat. It can mean life. It can bring death. It inspires fascination and fear. And it all starts with one tiny spark. Blow on that ember, and the flame will grow. Properly fed, it can live forever. But deprive it of oxygen and fuel, and the light will go out for good, leaving only the memory of its warmth. I don't think I can wait a month. I rolled on top of Lad, straddling his lean waist and pinning his hands over his head to the bed beneath us. Shirtless and smiling up at me, his blonde shoulder-length hair spread out on my heart-covered pillowcase, he looked like something from a dream, the best dream of my life. I won't be able to wait either, he said sounding breathless, but easily breaking my hold and lifting me off of his body. If you continue to tempt me like this. He deposited me on the bedspread beside him, the heat in his eyes doing nothing to discourage me. As it usually was when we were alone together for any length of time, my heart was galloping, and my skin was super sensitive all over, craving his touch. The feeling was too compelling to resist, and it made me brave, reckless with longing. That is the idea, I said. My hand stole to his abdomen, caressing the silky skin stretched over hard, segmented muscle, then drifting down to trace the top edge of his waistband. Looking at his body literally left me in awe sometimes as did the thought that it was all mine, or would be soon. Who could blame me for wanting him right now? My parents were out for the evening, having a romantic date night, while Lad and I had stayed in to watch TV. Naturally, we'd ended up in my room, kissing and touching and generally driving each other crazy. But as always, Lad was stopping things before they got all the way to permanent bond territory. His hand clamped over mine, halting its progress. Shuddering with effort, he slanted his eyes at me, his breath whistling through his clenched teeth. Ryan, please. Why not? I whimpered as the tension broke and my heart sank. I already knew what his answer would be. I don't want to compromise you. Well, that was a new word. I couldn't help but be amused despite my disappointment. Have you been reading historical novels again? He grinned at me. Jane Austen. She was quite brilliant. Yes, I know. And she wrote about another era entirely. Compromise me? What is really going on here? If we're getting married in a few weeks, what does it matter if we go ahead and bond now? Don't you want to? Lad raised a brow and dipped his chin in that sardonic, what do you think, way. You are absolutely killing me, lying there looking so beautiful. Of course I want to possess you, every part of you, completely. Just as my pulse sped up with hope, he added, After we are married. Lad had proposed to me on the bridge to the wedding shrine in Altum, shortly after Knox and Vancha's wedding, and we had set the date for our own ceremony for as soon as possible, as soon as the traditional mourning period for Lad's father, Ivar, the murdered king, was ended. It couldn't come soon enough for me, I didn't even care that I'd be the only married senior at Deep River High School. Sometimes I thought I might burn up from sheer longing before the day finally arrived. Lad's heated expression sobered as he stared into my eyes, playing with a lock of hair that hung over my shoulder. 
there are no takebacks, you know. I know that. It's forever. However long that turns out to be for me. Since I was only three quarters elven, there was no guarantee I possessed immortality like Lad did. It was likely I'd have at least an extended lifespan, but there was no way to know by how much. It didn't matter to me. But for him, being with an elven human hybrid was a sacrifice. If I died before him, he'd have the mark and be unable to bond with anyone else for eternity. It wasn't fair but he swore it was what he wanted, and I had to trust it was true. Besides, I simply couldn't live without him. I'm not afraid of being bonded together permanently, but it sounds like you are. My voice sounded as pouty as my face undoubtedly looked. His arms snaked around my waist, drawing me close to his warm body again. He spoke against my lips. I'm not afraid for my own sake. I want you more than anything I've ever or ever will want. The tone of his voice told me it was true. So did the emotions I could read pouring from his heart and flowing around me like the deep rushing current of Altum's subterranean river. And the feel of his body pressed against me, hard and powerful, confirmed it. So why was he stalling? What are you afraid of, then? Lad's mesmerizing, leaf-green eyes filled with gravity. If anything should happen to me. I sat up, my stomach clenching around a shot of cold alarm. Wait, what's going on? Has there been a threat to your life? Davis is dead. I thought there was peace between the dark and light courts now, thanks to you and Knox. And to you and Vansha, no, there's no specific threat. He petted my arm and shoulder, running a large hand up and down in a calming gesture. Don't worry. It's just that there are still some who are undoubtedly unhappy with the new allegiance, with the dissolution of the plot to restore elven reign over humanity. And the beautiful green eyes clouded. My father was assassinated right there in Altum, right under the noses of all his guards and loyal subjects. If it could happen to him. I propped myself up on one elbow, my tone developing an insistent edge. That will not happen to you, lad. You told me no one had ever considered before that a king could be murdered. But now you're all aware of the possibility. You're being careful, aren't you? And I'll be with you. I can read the emotions of those who approach you. I could warn you of danger. He gave me an amused grin and sifted a big hand through my hair. My little guardian, thank you. But you cannot be with me at all times. You have a company to take care of. You have school. He was right. Between school and supervising things at the tea factory afterward, I mostly saw him on weekends and nights if he could get away from his duties. At the moment, though, my own schedule seemed inconsequential. I was in full crisis management mode. My pulse ticked a fast and steady beat as the words spilled out of me. I'll drop out. If it's a matter of life and death, if you need me there to help keep you safe, and Grandma can run the company for now. She can teach Mom everything she'll need to know so she can take her place later on. Nothing is more important to me than your life. His warm fingertip covered my lips, hushing my frantic plan-making. I'll be fine. I shouldn't have even mentioned it. You need to finish school. You need to have a life. And the tea production is too important to us all. You're absolutely right. I'm well guarded. The fan pods in this country are disbanded. Knox says they're making progress getting rid of them in Europe. The tea distribution is steadily expanding worldwide. And we have a peace pact with the Dark Court, finally. So what are we even talking about then? Why delay? He drew in a deep breath and let it out on a long sigh. I'll just feel better 
if we wait until after we're married, okay? After that, I promise you, no force on earth or in Alfheim could stop me from making you completely mine. His voice ached with raw longing, reigniting the internal flame that always seemed to smolder inside me when he was near. I wanted him so much. And he did want me. I knew it. It made me nervous that he would put off something he so obviously desired. How big was the threat of assassination? Unless he's stalling for another reason. And there it was. The doubt. Though I knew better, uncertainty still tickled my brain from time to time, left over from that awful time when I believed Lad no longer loved me, or that he never really had. Now the tickle was increasing in intensity until it was almost painful. Was he afraid he would change his mind again? Did he want to keep his options open, just in case? No, Ryan. No, don't even go down that path. I love you, he said, mind to mind, pushing me gently to my back again. His fingers stroked my cheek as he stared down at me with an adoring gaze, making me feel like the most desirable girl in the world. My eyes met his, recognizing unshakable certainty. I knew Lad wasn't reading my mind. We could communicate without words, but elves weren't mind readers. He just knew me too well. I love you too, for better or worse. We've already had the worst. It will only get better and better for you and me. Lad punctuated his reassurance with a deep, drugging kiss that set my heart to an urgent new rhythm. How long until that wedding again? I asked, kissing him back, and communicating my eagerness with my body. I hitched one leg over his hip and arched to get as close to him as possible, as close as he'd allow. Lad responded with gratifying enthusiasm, his breath now coming in heavy gusts as he fought for control. One month, six days, and four hours. Chapter Two, Lad. The great hall was filled with my subjects, a typical workday. Surveying the sea of expectant faces, all of them wanting something from me, I longed to be free in the forest, climbing and jumping from branch to branch, turning my face up to the sunshine with the wind on my skin, or to spend some time in my nest hideaway, quietly reading the new books Ryan had given me. What I really wanted was to be alone with her somewhere anywhere. Although, if I was going to have any chance of hanging on to my resolve, we really should have a chaperone night and day. There was no denying it. I was whipped. I was absolutely at her mercy. And if she only knew how close I was to giving in to her seductive looks and touches, her plea to bond ahead of our wedding date, well, I had to do everything in my power to resist it. I knew she had lingering doubts, fears that her being part human might somehow prevent us from being together. That wasn't what I was worried about at all. I actually had less fear for Ryan before I knew she was three-quarters elven. At least then, if something ever happened to me, she'd be able to get over it and move on eventually. But now, chances were she'd be as likely to have the mark as I would. If my enemies were ever to succeed and something happened to me, she'd be left alone, possibly for eternity. I didn't want that for her. Even the idea of it made my stomach coil into sickening knots. But I also couldn't let her go. I wasn't that strong. The wedding was a little over a month away. Maybe by then I'd feel safer about relations with the Dark Council. By then, Ryan's tea would have had more time to be distributed worldwide, and perhaps Knox would have good news for me concerning the international fan pod situation. There is a call for you, Your Highness, Ricard said. As my personal assistant, he'd been given the task of monitoring my cell phone. Yep, 
I had a cell phone. I wanted to be accessible to Ryan during the time she wasn't here in Altum with me. Ryan? I asked, my heart bounding to instant attention. My girl did that to me. Every time. No, your highness, it's your brother. I rose from my chair at the head of the room, striding toward him quickly. Knox, excellent. I'll call him back immediately. He dropped the phone into my hand, and I left the royal residence, heading for the spiraling tunnel that would take me to the surface. Because no signal could reach that far underground, Ricard went outside and checked my phone messages at frequent intervals. He always let me know right away if there was a matter that needed my attention. Emerging from the tunnel, I breathed deeply of the fresh, pine-scented air. It was good to have a break. I climbed the mammoth magnolia tree that loomed over our subterranean kingdom. It had stood for thousands of years, its base the diameter of a water tower, its gray-barked limbs thicker than my arm span. Reaching the upper branches, I pulled the phone from my pocket and checked the screen. Four bars, good. I'd need all of them to have a decent connection with Knox overseas. At times when we'd talked during this trip, the signal had been less than crystal clear. I hit the button to return his call. He picked up after three rings. Lad, how are you? How are things back at the old mud hole? I chuckled. Things in Altum are fine. How's your bride? Where are you two now? Ireland. It's fantastic. She's fantastic. We're headed to Scotland next. Asia and Australia will come after the break. How are things? Busy. There's a lot to do. His jovial tone had changed to a serious one. He knew I wasn't referring to the band's tour with my question, but to the international fan pod situation. It's not as out of control as it was in the U.S., but it's still significant. And not all the clan leaders are eager to disband them. Many of their subjects have grown quite used to them. I had a hell of a time with that English boy band. They really didn't want to let their girls go. <laughs> I bet. But you're doing the right thing. You don't have to tell me twice. After what I saw in my own house and what Ryan went through with Reggie... Ryan had infiltrated the fan pod of NFL quarterback Reggie Dillon in an effort to rescue her best friend Emmy, and had nearly died in the process. Not to mention the humiliation and pawing she'd had to endure. Just thinking of it had me gouging the tree bark with my fingernails, picturing Reggie's sadistic grin. The dark elves under Davis Hart's rule had not been a nice bunch. But he was gone now and I shared joint rule with Knox. While he traveled the world, taking the temperature of elven-human relations globally, I was supposed to be keeping an eye on things domestically. It wasn't the easiest thing, considering I'd rarely had contact with members of the Dark Court other than during the assemblage, when everyone was on their best behavior. I had a lot to learn. When am I to expect that emissary? I asked Knox. We'd sent a representative from the Light Court to the seat of Dark Elven Power in California to help foster relations between our formerly antagonistic clans. I had yet to receive word on when our exchange diplomatic guest would arrive. Oh, yeah, should be this week, Knox said. Sorry for the delay. Apparently there was some disagreement within the Dark Council on whom to send, but they've finally worked it out. Someone trustworthy? Auden assures me of that. And can you trust him? Ryan had told me about Auden. She'd met him briefly at a gathering of the Dark Court in Los Angeles. She said he'd been rather close to Davis, was actually his second in command. Now he was head of the Dark Council. Although he'd sworn fealty to Knox, Ryan said the man had given her the creeps. I know, he's a crafty old jackal and Davis's bosom buddy, Knox said. But he assured me of his loyalty in the elven way, so I know he wasn't lying. Listen, I'd love to have chosen the ambassador myself, but it's the council's job. We're not a dictatorship, you know. Too bad. I would have made a great dictator, don't you think? He joked. 
Well, who is he? What's he like? My tone was impatient. This was important information and not really a joking matter in my opinion. I'd be letting this ambassador into my kingdom, allowing him to interact with my people, my mother, with Ryan. Knox chuckled. You need to get above ground more, my friend, and get away from all those dusty old light elves. Your emissary is a she. Her name is Ava. Chapter 3, Ava How exactly was I supposed to be a watch? We were on the set of a men's wristwatch shoot, and I was trying to follow the photographer's instructions. Really, I was. But some of these guys were just a little too far out there. Be the watch? Are you kidding me? The funny thing was, the watch was barely showing in any of the shots Guillermo had taken so far. It was wrapped around the wrist of Cully Rune, and when he was on the set, the only thing anyone, men, women, and photographic equipment included, wanted to focus on was his face. Yes, he was that good-looking. He was also well aware of it. Come on, Iva, he whispered close to my ear his light Australian accent and knowing tease. You're acting like I smell bad or something, when I know for a fact I don't. Cully arched one perfect eyebrow at me, daring me to contradict him, daring me to resist him. I inched a bit closer to his six-foot-three frame, and no, he did not smell bad. He smelled pretty amazing, actually. It was his ego that repulsed me. Maybe I should have been more understanding. When people worshipped you and treated you as if you were some sort of god, you probably couldn't help but believe it after a while. Cully Roon was the hottest male model working in the fashion industry. He charged exorbitant fees to walk the runway during fashion week, and his check for today's shoot would no doubt quadruple mine. I was basically there as his prop anyway. He was supposed to project all his adoration and desire for this $10,000 timepiece on me. And I was apparently supposed to embody a gaudy hunk of metal. You are the watch, Ava. You're gorgeous, desirable. Everybody wants you, the photographer encouraged, moving around us and clicking steadily. I know this body does. Cully purred. His hot breath fanned my neck, making goosebumps rise on my flesh. Real pretty. Shut up, I muttered, trying to hold on to my fierce and desirable expression. You're not helping. He laughed, his white teeth flashing under the hot studio lights. You're gonna have to get used to me, you know. We're about to be spending a lot of time together. I tried to ignore him and focus on being the watch, but his extreme nearness and extreme cockiness was making this the most difficult shoot I'd done since I was a fledgling model just getting my start in L.A. at 17 years old. If I didn't need this job so much, I'd just walk out of here right now and get in my car, drive to the beach, or better yet, up the coast of Ventura County, to one of those farms where you could wander the dusty crop rows and gather ripe raspberries and heirloom tomatoes and black-eyed peas, where the air smelled like freshly turned dirt and ripening peaches, and you heard birds and honeybees, and you felt like the city didn't even exist. Excuse me? An imperious female voice interjected, and my stomach sank to my toes. Great. Excuse me, may I have a word with my daughter, please? Ava, Ava, dear, she called. Guillermo wore an incredulous expression as he turned to see the tall, red-haired bombshell clicking into the room on her stiletto heels, white designer suit hugging her slim curves, icy blue eyes boring into me. She spoke again, exerting her full regal presence 
and a hefty dose of sway. It will only take a moment, and it will help, I assure you. The photographer's expression changed instantly. His tone was deferential. Of course, no problem. Take all the time you like. To me, he said, I can see which end of the gene pool you came from. Little did he know, my father had been just as tall and physically attractive as my mother. It was an elven thing. That was why so many of us dominated the television and movie screens, and especially the magazine ads like the one we were shooting today. Mother beckoned me with her manicured fingers. I extricated myself from Cully's arms, crossing the bright studio to where she stood, my throat growing tighter with each step in her direction. How's it going, darling? She asked aloud. Inside my brain, she hissed, What do you think you're doing? I've never seen you do such a lackluster job. It's almost as if you're trying not to work well with him. Do I have to remind you? We need this, Ava. Well, I'm sorry, I said, not sounding very sorry at all as I spoke to her mind. But it's awkward. If you wanted me to be comfortable, maybe you should have given me a little more warning. Or maybe introduced us before throwing us together like this. For the sake of the humans in the room, I answered her first question aloud. Oh, it's great. We're just getting warmed up. Lovely. I'll just stay and watch if you don't mind. She gave me a saccharine smile which I returned with equal insincerity. Working with her helicoptering over me was like trying to win a swim meet with a backpack full of bricks at gunpoint. Great, I said. He's just arrived in the States. You should make him feel welcome, not antagonize him, she continued mind to mind. And be charming. You're perfect for each other, you'll see. And you don't want to displease Auden. You have a job to do. Well, then let me do my job. I spun away from her toward the refuge of the set and slammed directly into the intern who'd been sent out for sandwiches. Brown takeout boxes flew in every direction. The drink tray she'd been balancing crashed to the floor, sending a flood of tea and soda and ice cubes over her shoes and mine. Her face went purple. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. She grabbed a stack of napkins and started frantically dabbing at my toes. Please don't worry about it, it was my fault. I squatted, grabbing a handful of napkins myself and swiping the floor, trying to help contain the disaster. The intern, Claire, she'd said earlier, gasped. Oh no, let me get it, you don't need to do this. Really, Claire, I'm fine. Looks like you got the worst of it, I said, eyeing her wet pants legs and Chuck Taylor's, which had been a light blue, but were now a sickly brownish color. Ava, you are not a janitor, Mother sniffed. Get off the floor right now. You'll make yourself even more disheveled. Let the girl clean it up. Wardrobe, makeup, see to your model. She'll be ruined. I did stand, but not because I was worried over my appearance. Crossing the room to my purse, I dug out my wallet and went back to Claire, who was nearly in tears now, trying to gather the tumbled catering boxes. Having just bought a pair of chucks for myself, I knew how pricey they were. I also knew Claire couldn't afford to replace hers. She was still in college, and her internship with Guillermo was unpaid. Here, I pulled 520s out of my wallet and pressed them into Claire's hand. This is for your shoes. When she just stared dumbfounded at the cash in her hand, I added, they're really cute and they look new. That tea and stuff is never going to wash out right. Get some new ones. Just to make sure she wouldn't argue, I used a little sway in my suggestion. Uh, thanks a lot, she finally said. These are my favorites. Okay then. I smiled at her. Okay, she said, sounding a little dazed. 
and carried the rescued boxes to a table along one wall of the studio. Taking care to avoid the sticky area on the floor, Mother rushed to my side and gripped my upper arm. She shot a worried glance over at Cully. Was it really necessary for you to grovel on the floor with the help and give her our money? She wasn't a fan of any humans, but she held particular disdain for those without power and influence. She probably assumed Cully felt the same, which he probably did. I yanked my arm out of her grasp. Yes, mother, it was necessary. I have to get back to work now. Struggling to tamp down my annoyance and calm my raging pulse, I walked back toward Cully, passing the makeup artist and the photographer's assistant on the way. I caught a snatch of their whispered conversation. Stage mother, nightmare. I pretended not to hear them, but what they said was true. Thora Morton had earned quite a reputation for herself around the L.A. fashion scene. If I'd been human... I would probably be considered unhirable by this point. I was a passably good model, and I worked hard, but pretty girls out here were a dime a dozen. If you got a reputation for being difficult in any way, you didn't get many bookings. My reputation was that I had the stage mom from hell. It was only thanks to her sway and my own glamour smoothing things over that the jobs kept coming including this one with Cully. How nice that your mom came for a visit, he said when I reached him, his voice tinged with wicked amusement. Oh, yes, I muttered under my breath. It's wonderful to have her around when I'm trying to work. He chuckled darkly. At least she cares enough to be on the same continent with you. All the sarcasm was gone replaced by a sullen tone that surprised me. For the first time since meeting him, I was interested in what Cully had to say. I met his eyes directly. You don't see your mother much? From what I knew of him, he had grown up in Melbourne with his mom, Faleen. She'd been sent there by his father, Auden Rune, presumably to supervise the Australian clans, and the spouses rarely saw each other, though they remained married, of course. If you consider once or twice a year a lot, then yes, I see her quite often. His ultra-blue eyes met mine. I came here straight from Eton. Feline thought England would be the best place for me to spend the majority of my time since I was about 13. Wow, you moved away from home at 13? That seemed kind of young to be on your own. As annoying as mother could be, as much as I despise some of the things she pushed me to do, I couldn't imagine being sent away to fend for myself when I was barely out of my tweens. Perhaps detecting a note of sympathy in my voice, Cully straightened, his I-don't-give-a-shit demeanor snapping back into place. And why not? It's a great school. I got the finest education money can buy. Rubbed elbows with the future leaders of the world. And I learned the greatest lesson of all. What's that? I asked as we moved back into our position so Guillermo could resume the session. Cully gazed at me, his expression exuding heat and desire and longing, all for the sake of the camera. To look out for myself. If you want something in this life, Angel, you'd better take it, because no one is going to give you what you need. How sad, and how true. I must have been frowning, because Guillermo spoke up. Hey guys, let's focus now. A few more good shots and we'll be out of here. I once again did my best to be a watch, but Cully's words continued to spin through my brain. Maybe we were perfect for each other. My new fiancé was as jaded as I was. Finally finished with the shoot, I headed off set, beyond ready to change into my own clothes and remove the four pounds of makeup caked on my skin. Oh my God, look at his 
eyes. I have never seen eyes so green. Before stepping into the dressing room, I glanced to the side of the studio where the photographer's assistant was crowded around a monitor with several other people, poring over the photo files from our shoot. What are you talking about? They're violet, the guy next to her said. He was in charge of lighting, which meant he'd been up close and personal with both me and Cully throughout the day. Excuse me, but I've worked with him five times now, argued the makeup artist. He's got the deepest brown eyes I've ever seen. And that mocha skin. Mmm, if he isn't God's gift, I don't know who is. I had no idea what any of them were talking about. I had just spent the better part of four hours inches away from his face, and Cully's eyes were sky blue. I was sure of it, because I remembered thinking I'd never ever seen anyone with eyes quite that shade, or quite that lovely, before. And mocha skin? His complexion was pale perfection. I walked in on the object of their adoration, stripping off the shirt he'd been wearing for the shoot. Oh, sorry, I blurted, stumbling back out of the dressing room and closing the door, nearly blinded by the sight of an unreal set of abs and beautiful, well-muscled arms. The door opened again immediately. Cully stood there, bare-chested and smiling, and definitely not mocha or any shade close to it. I leaned a little closer and inspected his eyes once more. Yep, the bluest blue irises I'd ever seen, with dark gray rims and the kind of eyelashes that made all the female models hate him. He chuckled at my scrutiny. I realize it's impossible to get enough of me, but is there something specific I can do for you, love? Cully asked. Opening the door wide, he swept one of those sculpted arms in an invitation for me to enter. I didn't relish the idea of being in the small space alone with him, especially as he was partially undressed, but I stepped inside and closed the door behind me. I had something to ask him. I needed to know before I traveled with him. Cully, can I ask you a question? What is your glamour? Some kind of hypnosis? Oh, now she's curious about me. Well, we are supposed to get to know each other, I began. Then I decided to just go with the truth. I heard some of the crew talking about you. About your eye color, actually. And your hair? Understanding spread across his face, and he nodded. Heard that, did you? He walked to the clothing rack and took a shirt from its hanger, dragging it on in no particular hurry. It's not hypnosis. It's sort of a visual thing, an illusion, if you will. Illusion? What do you mean? Like a magician? He stopped dressing to study me, cataloging my eyes, my lips, my skin, my hair. You are fair-skinned. A few adorable freckles. Your eyes are a lovely shade of brown. Your lips are full. And from the looks of them, quite delicious. My face heated in a flash of embarrassment. I blinked several times, shaking my head. Oh, what are you... He held up a finger. Let me finish. I'd estimate that you're about five foot ten. And your hair is my favorite shade, a lovely dark ginger with golden highlights around your pretty face. Have I got it about right? I was so flustered I could barely manage to respond. I, uh, I am 5'10", and my hair is red. Yeah? And what do I look like? Lifting my hands, I twisted to gesture around us. There are about 20 mirrors in here, and you've had thousands of photos taken of you. You know what you look like. He buttoned his shirt, thank God, and stepped closer to me. No. 
What do I look like to you? If he wanted me to return his ridiculous, over-the-top compliments, he was out of luck. He could step right outside and find plenty of willing humans if he wanted to be worshipped. Cully smiled, reading my reluctance to play his game. Humor me, Iva. I huffed an impatient breath. Fine. Your hair is platinum blonde, nearly white. Your eyes are blue. Your skin is like mine, fair, but no freckles. Really? He said, sounding for all the world as if he was truly intrigued by my bland, perfunctory description. And do you like the way I look? Ugh, I was done with this stupid conversation and this arrogant guy. I spun toward the door. I have to go. Mother is waiting. His hand on my shoulder stopped me. White, please, I'm trying to answer your question. Turning to face him again, I blinked up into those blue eyes, which now seemed impossibly to have brightened in color. I did like the way he looked. Too much. My glamour, he started, then stopped and licked his lips. Lips that were, as he'd said of mine, full and delicious looking. I do have blonde hair, and blue eyes, and fair skin. I also have dark brown eyes, and mocha skin, and violet eyes, and straight sandy brown hair, and vivid green eyes, with black curly hair. What are you talking about? You're not making any sense. Ever heard the saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Yes. That's my glamour. I look like whatever a person wants me to look like. When they look at me, they see what they want to see. In each person's eyes, I am their ideal. Wow, that is... I shrank away from him, my back coming up against the door as he continued to prowl toward me. I have never been passed over for a modeling job, ever. I'm chosen by every casting director, no matter which type they're searching for, because I always look right for the part. I let out a long, shuddering breath, reeling in astonishment. So that explains it then. Yeah, the humans can't help but react to me as they do male or female, as far as they can see, in person or in photographs, I'm the perfect man. And as you know, our glamour works on most elves as well, though not as strongly. Right, because of course, you're not perfect, nobody is. He grinned, clearly amused at my diss. <laughs> of course not. As my father likes to remind me on a regular basis, I'm no more important than anyone else in the dark court. Just another cog in the wheel. At the mention of his father, I shivered. My mom might have been demanding and over-involved, but his father, Auden, was downright scary. His dedication to the dark court knew no bounds, and I was all too familiar with how far he was willing to go to protect it. That's why I'd been so determined to hate his son when we'd met for the first time today. The hatred was a little hard to hold on to now that I realized Cully was just as much a pawn as I was. I have to go, I whispered, and fled the room. His lilting voice followed me down the hall. Be seeing you soon, Angel. Mother met me in front of the studio, and we climbed into the back of a waiting Range Rover. I couldn't wait to get home to my cozy apartment and dive into a new book on my e-reader. It was the closest thing to freedom I experienced in my life. Or maybe my roommate Brenna would be home, 
and we could veg out and watch a marathon of some trashy TV series. But instead of making the turn that would take us to Venice Beach, the driver pulled onto the highway. I leaned toward the front seat, trying to catch his eye in the rearview mirror. Wait, where are we going? When he didn't answer, I turned to look at my mother. Where are we going? Auden has summoned you. We're going to his office. Why? What's this about? Her eyes didn't meet mine. Instead, she kept them on her hands and adjusted her rings. I don't know. He wouldn't tell me. But it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, say yes. Watching her run her thumb repeatedly over the band on her left ring finger, the familiar weight of guilt settled over me like a heavy old blanket steeped in that musty attic smell. I always do. Outside my window, the other cars passed in a blur. I slumped in my seat, letting out a long breath. What choice do I have? Chapter 4 Ryan Altum was a flurry of activity as I made my way from the royal residence to my family's quarters in another part of the cavernous underground kingdom. It was Saturday, and as I had no school today, I'd spent last night in my private suite in the palace. Even outside of Lad's home, there was a palpable feeling of excitement. For the first time in centuries, an ambassador from the dark court would be in residence. It was supposed to cement the peace between the tribes and create more cooperation, more openness between them. Elves rushed along the paths, carrying items toward the palace in preparation for today's welcoming ceremonies. Many were more finely dressed than usual. I would be too, after Grandma Nina helped me get ready. She'd offered to let me wear one of her own vintage elven-made dresses for the occasion. I ascended one of the stone staircases built into the cavern wall. The residential areas were set up something like high-rises, with families occupying entire floors in multi-room dwellings. Arriving at my Ama and Afi's door, I opened it and walked in without knocking. I was family now. Grandma greeted me just inside. Good morning, Ryan. Have you seen your great-grandparents today? Having grown up in Altum, she was entirely comfortable with silent communication and had easily fallen back into using it now that she spent most of her time here. Ama and Afi were the names I used for her parents, Dirk and Elsa, who appeared about 30 years younger than her, but seemed like grandparents in every other way. Their other daughter, Catrienne, my great aunt, had never had children, so I was the only grandchild. Once they'd gotten past the fact that I was part human and met me, they doted on me to a ridiculous degree. I walked through the marketplace but didn't see them. Maybe they've gone to the palace already? They are attending the ceremony today, right? Yes, but they'll come back here first. Ama is supposed to be bringing the flowers for you to present to Ava. Beyond the new emissary's name and profession, Lad said he knew little about her. One thing was for sure. As a dark elf, she'd have a lot of experience interacting with humans and the ability to communicate aloud. For that reason, I was anticipating Ava Morton's arrival as much as everyone else here. Though I could now communicate in the elven way, I really missed spoken language when I spent time in Altum. I had started giving English lessons to a few elves who'd expressed interest in learning, but the number was small. I followed Grandma to her room to get dressed. I liked it here, surrounded by things from her childhood, a doll she'd loved, her beautiful elven clothing. Detailed bronze miniatures lined up on her dressing table, each representing a famous historical figure from elven lore. I usually enjoyed staying here myself, but tradition held that the royal bride be assigned her own suite of rooms in the palace, and Lad and I had stayed up late last night. It had been easier to just tiptoe down the hallway than trek across the kingdom in a wee hour's walk of shame. Probably no one would have criticized my staying overnight in Lad's room. I was his betrothed, and he was the king. 
but he insisted he couldn't have me sleeping so close by if he were going to keep his vow of premarital chastity. Grandma pulled the dress from a large wooden wardrobe. Well, what do you think? Oh, it's so beautiful. Do you think it'll fit? I took the delicate dress from her and held it up. Like all elven made clothing, it felt so light. It was like holding a tissue rather than a garment. They felt wonderful on, like being naked, but warmer. Slipping it over my head, I went to stand in front of the mirror above the dressing table. It fits, she said, slipping back into verbal communication, as she often did when I was around. She came up behind me and fastened the back buttons, then planted a kiss on my cheek. You look like the princess you are. Pride shone in her eyes as she smiled at me in the mirror, and warmth rushed through my heart. If I wasn't so selfish, I would say the best thing that had come of my meeting Glad was that Grandma Nina had been reunited with her family after 40 years of estrangement. She was the happiest I'd ever seen her. Though her hair was white, as it had been since her 20s, she appeared younger and healthier, too. Well, I hope I can look the part. I told her, feeling a simmer of nerves in my belly. Because I guess that's my future, receiving emissaries, being the royal hostess. Today's just the start. I would never have an actual leadership role here. For one thing, I was female, and that wasn't how light elven hierarchy worked. For another, I wasn't fully elven. I was only accepted because of Lad. But I was happy just to be allowed to be with him in his kingdom. It was enough. And he wasn't the least bit ashamed of me, making sure we were seen together as often as possible. For today's event, we'd be seated side by side in the front of the great hall. I was a bit nervous about that, unsure of how his people would see it since we weren't married yet. And I wasn't actual royalty until that day. The hall was already nearly full when we got to the small room adjoining it and I peeked through the front door. You'll be fine. Grandma squeezed my hand, obviously reading my anxiety. When in doubt, just smile and pretend you've seen it all before. I grabbed her hand tighter. I don't know if I'm ready for this. Sure you are, darling. And ready or not, that boy needs you. I nodded rapidly. Yes, okay. Lad needed me. I could do it for him. I would just pretend I'd seen it all before. And that I wasn't about to throw up. Grandma went to sit with her sister and parents while I waited for Lad. A few minutes later, he swept in with a rush of energy and fresh, woodsy-scented air. His gaze fell on me, and his eyes sparked with pleasure. Good morning. His greeting was punctuated with a vigorous kiss. The nerves in my belly were replaced with a pleasant tingle, as if I'd bitten into the most decadent frosted cupcake. Yes, this was where I was meant to be, wherever he was, no matter what that entailed. Good morning yourself. You've been outside. I went for a little walk before having to spend the day cooped up doing business. A walk in the treetops, no doubt, I laughed. Did you get a look at her? He knew I meant Ava, who was rumored to be exceptionally beautiful in person. When Lad told me she was a model, of course I looked her up online. And yes, she was stunning. But you never knew. Sometimes people looked different up close. No, not yet, he said. She hasn't arrived, though I'm assured she's close. Come on, let's take our places in the hall. With my hand on his arm, we proceeded through the enormous, ornately carved wooden doors into the great hall, escorted by two brawny elven guards. They were more of an accessory than a necessity at a gathering like this, but I guessed it was important to demonstrate that Lad and his future queen were well guarded. We took our seats, and I looked out over the hall, over the otherworldly collection of beautiful faces and flawless figures, 
fighting to make myself accept it all as my new reality. I'd almost gotten used to Lad's physical perfection. Almost. But to see so many of his people gathered together in one place, there was no question I was not in Kansas anymore, so to speak. Spotting Grandma in the front row, I lifted a hand to wave to her and Katrienne and my Amma and Afi beside her. Amma lifted a bouquet of assorted fall flowers to show me she had them for later. Lad's assistant, Ricard, stepped up behind him and touched him lightly on the shoulder. Lad turned toward the young man, listening to his silent message. Then he leaned close to me. She's here. The doors at the back of the hall opened, and my heart fluttered. Most of the dark elves I'd met had been intimidating, if not downright mean. Would this woman be like Amalia, who'd been assigned to supervise the fan pot at Knox's house? Or Ingrid, who'd served as Reggie Dillon's warden slash pimp? For a moment, we all waited, staring at the open doorway. In walked a stunning redhead. Not a grown woman, but a girl, maybe a couple years older than me. Her pictures had made her look more mature. She was long-legged and slim, with huge dark eyes and a serious expression. She wore a white floor-length skirt with a deep slit and a colorful beaded halter top. She looked every bit the Hollywood fashion model, striding confidently down the hall's central aisle toward us. Ava's beauty lived up to her photographs and then some. But my eyes were drawn to her companion. He was one of the most striking guys I'd ever seen. Not as handsome as Lad, but nearly so. And that was saying something. In fact, he looked a lot like him. Big framed and blonde with piercing green eyes. I tore my gaze away and glanced over the crowd. All eyes were locked on the beautiful pair. Together they approached the throne, walking at a measured pace, not seeming the least bit anxious about being at the center of such focused public attention. Dark elves through and through. Your Highness, the girl said. I am Ava Morton. I'm most grateful for your warm hospitality and look forward to serving you in your kingdom. Reports of your leadership glamour are well-founded. She dipped her head in a respectful bow, showing the top of her glistening red hair. The guy beside her bowed deeply as well. Lad addressed her aloud. I assumed because that's how she had spoken to him. It's our kingdom now. You are most welcome, Ava. I'm sure your own glamour and your presence will be of great benefit to both our courts. And I see you have a travel escort. He is welcome to stay and refresh himself before the journey back to California. Ava took a step forward, raising her palms in an imploring gesture. If it is possible and pleasing to your highness, I ask that he be allowed to stay. This is Cully Rune. There was a pause. He is my betrothed. Lad's head snapped back. Oh, I wasn't informed that you were betrothed, or planning to bring him along. There was no time. It just happened, and we cannot bear to be apart. You must understand. Now she cut her eyes over to me, acknowledging me for the first time since entering the hall. Lad noticed it, too. He glanced between the two of us. Of course he understood. If she and this Cully person felt about each other the way Lad and I felt, then this ambassadorship would be a misery for the both of them if they were forced to live apart. I could tell Lad wanted to be compassionate but he was understandably concerned about the surprising alteration in plans. It bothered me, too. Sure, long-distance communication was a bit of a challenge for the technology-phobic light elves, but there must be some kind of information exchange going on between the two courts. And this was a big change. We'd essentially have two emissaries from the Dark Court, two outsiders living among us. 
two dark elves with glamours we didn't yet know and intentions we couldn't be entirely certain of. Feeling protective of Lad, I extended my glamour toward the girl. Hmm. Despite her confident facade, she was nervous. Afraid, even. Maybe that Lad would say no to her request? The guy was harder to read. As I studied him, he gave me a quick side glance, and I could have sworn he winked. One corner of his mouth edged up in a hint of a smile. Good God, he was cocky. Though he looked nothing like him, he reminded me a little of Knox. All I could read from him was sardonic amusement and a pretty hefty sense of self-confidence. Whatever he was here to do, he had no doubt he'd get the job done. The two of them waited patiently before Lad. Finally, a smile spread across my fiancé's face. Of course. Congratulations to you both, and welcome to you, Cully. Please communicate my best wishes to your father. I hope you'll soon feel at home here. Cully bowed again, keeping his remarkable eyes trained on the throne. Thank you, your highness. I'm certain I will. Chapter 5. Lad After the gathering, our newly arrived guests were shown to their quarters to rest up from their trip to California. Ryan and I retreated to my room. She was beautiful, with her long hair pulled up, exposing her pretty neck, and soft tendrils falling down around her face. The elven gown she wore complimented her figure, teasing me with its nearly sheer layers. I drew her into my arms, which was where I wanted her all the time. Glancing over at my bed across the room, I had to laugh at myself. Well, that was actually where I wanted her. But we were getting to that. If I could blink and skip ahead to our wedding day, I would do it in a heartbeat. I'd move the date up if I thought I could get away with it. But tradition was everything to my people, and how could I violate the mourning requirements for my own father? Mother would never forgive me. I'd have to be patient, somehow. Pulling the pins from her hair, I sifted my fingers through the silky length of it. You were great today. Very regal. I don't like it. Her beautiful eyes were troubled. Unable to resist, I kissed her softly, then pulled back. What don't you like? Being a monarch? Join the club. Or, if it's my room you don't like, you can change it any way you want once we're married. Or, we'll move into your suite. Or, select another one in the royal residence. We have about, no oh, 50 to choose from. She gave a giggle and a light slap to my arm. No, you know what I mean. The fact that she showed up here with someone else. And she was nervous. They're betrothed, Ryan. You know the significance of that. You know what it feels like to be apart. This ambassadorship could be a long-term thing. According to Knox, she had no choice about accepting it. The least I can do is let her be with her fiancé. She was probably nervous because she thought I'd turn him away. What else could I do? I started kissing her again, but she resisted. And finally, I ordered my libido to take five so I could hear her out. Something feels weird to me, she said. He didn't seem like a man in love. Now she had my attention. The muscles in my neck pulled tight. Had he said something to her, mind to mind? Come on to her? If so, he'd be out on his pretty boy ass within the half hour, no matter who his daddy was. What do you mean? Did he say something to you? No, it's nothing. I just think he enjoys female attention. I let out a long breath. Don't we all? Only I want the attention of just one female. 
Smiling, I pulled her close again and dropped another kiss on her lips. You should be happy she's betrothed. Now you don't have to worry about her trying to seduce me like you were always accusing Vansha of doing. Of course, I had known all along that Vansha did not desire me. Her affections were reserved for one guy and one guy only, Knox. We'd only agreed to the betrothal to give her cover for her investigation of Davis's scheme. She'd never have worked her way back into his good graces otherwise. Vansha and I had never kissed, never even held hands, except for when we were forced to do so to support our story. Ryan was the only girl I'd ever kissed, the only girl I ever would kiss for eternity. She blushed, my playful accusation hitting its mark. All right, all right, you don't need to remind me of my pathetic insecurity. And you're right. Ava probably just wants some company here in Light Elf Land. As far as she knows, you're the only one here who even speaks aloud. Maybe she and I will become friends. There's my girl. Now I kissed her more deeply, angling her delicate face to give me better access. The sweet taste of her mouth made me ravenous, and the feel of her softness under my hands drove me crazy. Ryan thought she was the one having difficulty waiting. I might not be able to rule my kingdom if I didn't get some relief soon. I'd be a flaming mass of unsated lust by the time our wedding night finally arrived. As if sensing my weakness, Ryan ran her hands over my abdomen hungrily. Her lips touched the exposed skin at the V of my shirt's neckline. Mmm, you feel so good. Are you sure you won't change your mind? Was I sure? <laughs> Not at the moment. I wasn't sure of anything beyond how much I wanted her. As she kissed my neck and inched her playful fingers lower, I groaned, praying for willpower. I felt like I'd been fighting my desire for Ryan nearly all my life and I didn't have much strength left. We were so close to the wedding. It wouldn't be so bad, would it? My eyes drifted to the bed again. And then I thought of my father, of how he'd been alive and angrily telling me to get my act together one minute. And less than an hour later, he was gone forever, his immortal life snatched away by a crafty and deceitful adversary. I was in a position of power, but I was also vulnerable and selfish. There was no way I could spend my life apart from Ryan, not while she lived. But until the moment we were bonded, I could rein in my selfishness enough to protect her from the eternal, irreversible consequences should something happen to me. Once we were bonded, that was it. We'd both be in it forever. But until then, I would be strong and consider her best interests, not my own body's demands. My fingers wrapped around her tiny wrists, halting the progress of her ardent exploration. Okay, I think that's enough torture for now. Instead of a pout or reluctant cooperation, her expression held a shade of desperation when she turned her face up to me. Let's not wait anymore, lad. I mean it. I'm afraid. I froze, tightening my grip on her. Afraid of what? Are you saying you want to just go ahead and get it over with because you don't think it will be good? No, no, of course not. It will be good, I have no doubt. I'm afraid of something stopping the wedding especially after this morning's surprises. What? Why? Just a bad feeling. She paused for a moment. Have you met Ava's fiancé, Cully, before? No. Why? You made a reference to his father. Oh, that. I recognized his last name. And then I made the connection. 
His father is Auden Rune, the new head of the Dark Council. You met him, remember? Ryan's eyes went wide and dark. Of course. I also remember what Knox said that night. He said Auden was mercenary. And then he said something about his kid. I can't remember exactly, but it wasn't flattering. Don't you think it's a weird coincidence that Ava's betrothed happens to be Auden's son? No, I don't. Knox said her mother, Thora, is also on the Dark Council. It makes perfect sense according to the elven tradition of arranged marriages. The two of them are of equal social rank. I don't like it, she said for the second time today. And I really don't like him. Good. I pulled her close again, relishing the feel of her soft curves. Because he's about the best-looking elf I've ever seen, and I don't want him anywhere near my future bride. She broke into a bashful grin, obviously pleased by my possessiveness. I could say the same thing about Ava and my future groom. I brought a hand up to cradle her jaw and made sure she was looking directly into my eyes. Believe me, Ryan, you have nothing to worry about. Chapter 6 Ava I moved restlessly around our suite, pacing from one stucco wall to the next, absently touching the ancient wall hangings and elaborately carved furniture. Not only was I in a foreign kingdom, I felt like I was in another time, another realm, a place I definitely did not belong. Stopping in front of an unusual instrument, I plucked one string and felt the sweet note vibrating through me, bringing a tear to my eye with its exotic beauty. What am I doing here? The people of Altum, especially the young king and his betrothed, had been too welcoming, too kind, too trusting. You don't seem quite comfortable, love. Cully's smooth voice came from behind me, making me jump. He'd entered my room without my realizing it. I wasn't used to his near constant presence yet. Feeling claustrophobic here in the kingdom of mud? One would expect the light court to offer a bit more light. I turned to face him, started to speak, and then stopped myself before beginning again. It's not that. I just... I didn't realize they'd be like that. Who? The light elves? He asked. You've been to the assemblage before, haven't you? Did you not meet any of them then? Or did you forget their quietness? No, I mean Lad and his betrothed, the half-breed. They were... well... It wasn't what I expected. I'd anticipated nerves when meeting the Light King and his future bride. I'd expected to be impressed, even. I'd been warned about the devotion his people had to him. What I hadn't predicted was the obvious devotion between the two of them. I had never even known love like that existed for members of our kind. And that's a problem because... Cully prompted. I glanced back at him, uncertain whether I should put my feelings into words. I'm not as sure as I was before about this plan. I rushed to prevent any misunderstanding. The last thing I needed was for him to report to Auden that I was wavering in my commitment to our bargain. I mean, I'm still in, of course. It's just, now that we're here, now that it's real, I feel a bit anxious. I don't know if it's going to work. A grin spread across Cully's face. Oh, now I see. Overwhelmed by all the true love vibes, are we? I know, it's a bit sickening. If it makes you feel any better, I was surprised myself. They are really into it. He rolled his eyes. So then, what? 
Should I repack my bags? I frowned at his carefree tone. We couldn't just leave Altum and defy his father's orders. Well, maybe he could, but I couldn't. You know that's not a possibility for me. Cully picked up the instrument I'd been admiring and tucked it against his abdomen, picking out a few notes. He cocked his head and glanced up at me, the lazy set of his mouth betrayed by eyes keen with perception. What is your deal with the mighty Auden anyway? He talks about you like you're his favorite lapdog. Lapdog? I sniffed a humorless laugh at the analogy. Prized pit bull was more like it. Auden hadn't put me into the ring and forced me to draw blood from my opponents, but he might as well have. The wounds I inflicted were much more difficult to heal. And we did have a deal, one that would earn me my freedom if I managed to pull this off. Not that I would discuss the details with Cully. I don't want to talk about it, I muttered, walking away from him and hoisting one of my suitcases onto the bed. Maybe if I started pulling out my PJs, he would take the hint and leave. Cully followed me, strumming chords as he strolled across the room. Come on now, Angel. It isn't right to keep secrets from your betrothed. Pretty soon we'll know everything there is to know about each other. Stopping beside me, he used one finger to lift a pair of lacy panties from my bag. I whirled on him, snatching my undergarments from his hand, mortified heat creeping up my neck. Why did you agree to the betrothal anyway? I know why I did it. But what could your father possibly have offered you to make you sign on for this? There was a flash of something in Cully's eyes. Pain? Sadness? It was only there for a split second, replaced immediately by his usual apathetic expression. Why not? He shrugged. Maybe I was bored. He resumed strolling and strumming. Maybe I'm tired of the fast life. Even the most dedicated of hellions needs a break every once in a while. I'd heard that about the son of Auden. He was rumored to be a globe-trotting wild child, irreverent and spoiled, his powerful parents covering his tracks whenever his partying got out of hand and left expensive destruction in its wake. In my life had been anything but decadent. Though my mother was also on the Dark Council, our fortunes had taken a downturn when my father had been killed years ago, by a human of all things. Since then, mother had drowned herself in grief and coppery hair dye, nurturing an intense hatred for the human race and fretting about her future. Her own glamour was basically useless now that she was a widow, all her expectations had fallen to me. I pulled out my most comfortable, most modest pajamas and slammed the suitcase closed again. Well, I have a job to do, and my mother is counting on me. I'm all she has. I owe her. Aren't you the dutiful daughter and loyal subject? Cully laughed, dropping the instrument to his side. I'm sure my father feels I owe him as well. Everyone owes him just because he walks the earth. I ignore half of what the tosser says and distrust the rest. Listening to his freewheeling approach to life just underlined the constrained nature of mine. It was infuriating. It's so easy for you, isn't it? You care about nothing and no one. You just glide through life with no responsibility, no one depending on you, doing whatever you want, wherever you feel like doing it. Cully smirked. Yeah, I've got it made all right. No ties, no dramas. His voice didn't sound quite as unbothered as his words did. Stepping closer, he surprised me by taking my hand, rubbing his thumb over my knuckles in a soft sweep. 
If you want my advice, Angel, it's simple. Don't worry about whether it's right or wrong. As you said, you have your job to do. I have mine. Just get it done. Get your mum off your back. And then get as far away from her and my father as you possibly can and live your life in peace. It always works for me. I stared up into his sky-blue eyes, captured for a moment by the glimpse of vulnerability I'd seen in them. Cully? Yes, my dear darling fiancé, he quipped, bringing my hand to his lips for a meaningless kiss. I yanked it back. What is your job? He studied me for a moment, through slitted eyes, his lips quirking with humor. If I need your help, Angel, I'll let you know. You've got enough on your plate dealing with the desperately devoted Light King. I hope your glamour is as effective as it's reputed to be. So did I. Chapter 7. Ryan I stayed home Saturday night hanging out with Mom and Daddy, who'd moved into the log house with us. Grandma Nina spent the majority of her time in Altam these days, and it didn't make sense for Daddy to keep his apartment in Oxford now that he and Mom were back together. I needed to be around the two of them tonight, to see concrete evidence that love could conquer all, and persuade myself once again that my mother's recent advice to trust in it was founded on something more than sway. If my parents could overcome what they'd been through in the past year and a half, then surely Lad and I could make it past our own challenges, right? Watching my parents snuggle on the couch after supper, I felt a sweet pang in my chest that had nothing to do with the romantic comedy streaming on the TV. They were truly happy. Mom was safe, and I had no doubt they'd spend the rest of their lives together. Turning my attention back to the on-screen couple, who'd just reached the oops were being forced to share a bed scene, I couldn't help but think about Lad and his refusal to share a bed with me before our wedding. The sweet pang was drowned by a dull, troubled ache in my chest, a sense of impending doom. What was wrong with me? Lad loved me. We were getting married. He'd explained his reluctance to go ahead and bond early, but I couldn't seem to shake this worry. After my parents split, it had been so hard for me to trust someone. And then, when I finally had, Lad had broken off our relationship and sent me away. Now we were together again and betrothed and all was forgiven. He was it for me. But was I really that person for him? I guessed I wouldn't feel entirely secure about it until the vows had been said and we were eternally bonded. Perhaps reading the longing on my face, Mom asked, What's Lad up to tonight? He's busy with royal stuff. My tone was grumpier than I'd intended it to be. I kept my eyes on the movie, trying to hide my bad mood. That is the deal you signed up for, you know, she reminded me. Marriage requires compromise, and it won't all be easy, especially with his position. I can't get over the fact that my little girl is going to be a queen. I need to work on my curtsy, Daddy teased. He rose from the couch and executed a dainty little bow, pretending to hold out the hem of an imaginary skirt. I tossed a throw cushion at his head. Daddy, get real. After Mom had healed from the whole Olympics debacle, Grandma and I had sat down with her and told her the truth about her elven heritage. She had taken it a whole lot better than I'd expected. I was pretty confused the whole time I was with Davis, she'd admitted. But I did understand there were things going on that were not normal. And it fills in a lot of blanks about Mama and her mysterious past. 
and my own past with Davis. The chief rule of the elven people, light and dark courts alike, was to keep the secret. Telling mom was not the worst offense and had been inevitable, really. She was half elven. What I hadn't counted on was that she would tell daddy. I promised him total honesty from now on, she'd explained, wholly unrepentant. If you choose to use your sway to make sure he never tells anyone, that's your business. But I'm not keeping anything from him ever again. So far, I hadn't felt the need to do that. He'd sworn never to speak of it outside our family. And besides, I had seen the destructive effect Davis's sway had on Mom's brain. He'd nearly killed her. And my sway was at least as powerful as his. I didn't want to risk Daddy's health that way. Are you two having trouble, honey? Mom asked. Like me, she'd inherited Grandma Nina's glamour for emotional acuity. It came in very handy in her job dealing with grieving families at the funeral home. Here at our home, it could be downright annoying. I had a hard time hiding anything from her. No, no trouble. I sighed and reached for another handful from the popcorn bowl. I'm just ready for the wedding to get here. It's hard to wait. You're afraid something's going to happen before then. Her words were a statement, not a question. Once again, she'd nailed it. No, I... Yes, I am a little nervous about it. Some visitors arrived in Alton today, and that's bound to change things. At the very least, Lad's going to be busy, sharing information with the new ambassador and entertaining her. Ambassador? What's she like? Mom had visited Altum a couple of times, but despite her interest in the home of her ancestors, she said she felt too strange around an entire race of people who communicated silently. I would told her about mind-to-mind -mind communication and even tried to do it with her, but she'd given it only a half-hearted effort. She'd said she was too old to embrace her elven side after all these years not knowing about it. It didn't dampen her curiosity to hear about my experiences, though. Sophisticated, charming, a supermodel. Your typical dark elven nightmare, I said, answering her question about Ava. Daddy laughed. You can't doubt Lad's commitment to you. I've seen him around you. He's totally in love. Taking his seat next to Mom again, he patted her thigh and gave her a quick kiss. I know. I rolled my eyes at my own neurotic tendencies. It's stupid. I just have trust issues, I guess. My father's face fell. I knew he felt partially responsible for that, though I hadn't said it to make him feel guilty. There were reasons beyond his brief affair and the months he'd spent on the road away from us. The main one was sitting right beside him wearing an identical expression of dismay. But they had forgiven each other and seemed to be moving past it. I know you do, baby, Mom said. That's largely my fault. But it's never too late to change. She glanced over at my father. For any of us, just try to have faith in Lad and in your love. It's all going to work out. Later that night, I lay in my bed in my childhood room, staring at the wide, dark window that faced the backyard and the woods beyond it. Unable to sleep, I thought about my parents' words. Was Mom right? Could I change? I wanted to. I wanted to be someone who could love without question, trust without fear. But the future was as boundless and impossible to see as the midnight forest and all the secrets it held. A tiny flash of light caught my attention. One firefly, then another, then another landed on my window, illuminating my room by tiny increments. Within minutes, the entire window was covered by bright, pulsing sparks of light. A message from Lad that he was thinking of me. In that moment, 
I vowed I would change, and my heart swelled with new determination. I would let go of the past completely, let go of worry, and trust in him, trust in us. He deserved that from me. Good night, my love, I whispered in my mind. Good night, sweet girl, he said back to me from somewhere deep in Altum. And finally, I closed my eyes and rested in the knowledge of his love and the fact that nothing and no one could wipe out our beautiful future together. Chapter 8. Lad Our new ambassador was not at all what I'd expected. Ava was bright and funny, eager to learn, and like Ryan, full of surprises. On the morning after her arrival, she startled me by entering the dining room of the royal residence early, smiling and appearing rested from her cross-country journey. I was usually one of the first to be up and dressed in the mornings. I typically ate breakfast alone, except for the servants who moved quietly in and out of the room. It was a routine I enjoyed, allowing me time to think and prepare for the day ahead. This day was different, though. I'd be showing Ava around, answering her questions. I'd have questions for her as well. There was much I had to learn about the Dark Court and its citizens. How many of them were antagonistic toward the Light Court and opposed to our peace treaty, for instance? Good morning. Her voice was a happy sing-song. She seemed so young to be an ambassador. I had expected an authoritative older man, not a girl my own age. At least she looked about my age. She was dressed in human clothes that would probably have made Ryan drool. I'd been told Ava was a fashion model, and I suppose that came with a nice wardrobe. I pushed my chair back and stood. Good morning, Miss Morton. Oh, call me Ava, and please have a seat. Whatever you do, don't call me Miss Morton. That's my mother's name, and God forbid I remind you or anyone of her. Besides, I don't think I'll qualify for the title of Miss until I'm at least 30. She smiled brightly and filled a plate from the buffet laid out on a nearby counter. Bringing it to the table where I sat, she plopped it down without waiting for an invitation. I stood again to pull out her chair for her, and she laughed as she sat down. Oh my gosh, you light elves are so mannerly. I feel like I've stepped into a Regency romance novel or something. I'm sorry if it makes you uncomfortable. Ryan likes it. But I know I am probably out of step with the humans and the dark elves you are usually around. She touched my hand lightly in a reassuring gesture. Oh, don't get me wrong. I love it. Good manners are a lost art. I find you very charming. Thank you. I hope you slept well. Yes, thank you. My bed is heavenly. At the risk of contradicting her newly formed opinion of me and sounding rude, I asked, If I may know, how old are you? Her brown eyes sparkled with humor. Oh, I'm an old lady, 19, a year older than me. I'm surprised you've just recently become betrothed. Is it so different in the dark court? No, we usually bond at 18 as well. But Mother wanted me to establish myself in modeling first. And then I found myself rather reluctant to marry someone I didn't even know, though she fielded quite a few offers for me. I can imagine. I said honestly. I feel the same way about arranged marriages, as you've probably deduced by now. Right. You clearly chose your own bride. That must have caused quite a stink around here. I can't even imagine suggesting bringing a human into the dark court. A stink is putting it mildly. I laughed. I came extremely close to walking away from the throne over it. Her eyes widened and then warmed. So, you must really love her. I do, more than anything. And you must love Cully as well, since you have accepted his offer after refusing so many others. 
There was a beat before she replied. Yes. She lifted her glass and took a drink. So, what's on the agenda today? I haven't been here since I was nine, and I ran around giggling about all the men's tight breeches. I'm looking forward to becoming acquainted with the other attractions in your kingdom. I chuckled at her deliberately cheeky tone. I'll be happy to show you around. I hope you won't be disappointed. She gave me a direct look, filled with good humor. This is such a fascinating place. I don't think that's possible. After breakfast, I gave Ava a tour, starting with the royal residence. Then we went out into the common area with its shops and recreational areas. She watched in fascination as skilled artisans made tools and dishes, silverware and jewelry. In one hut, a mother and daughter worked closely together at a loom, weaving fabric for clothing. Ava stopped and observed with rapt attention as the pair laughed and chatted, their hands a blur of harmonious motion, the product of years of close communication and skill handed down from generation to generation. It made sense, I guess. Her career revolved around clothing. It's so beautiful. Her tone was so low, I wasn't sure it was meant for me to hear. She seemed enthralled by the endless tunnels and antechambers, expressing delight at the stacked multi-level residences rising high on all sides of Altum's interior walls. It's sort of like my family's apartment in New York City, she said, but far less noise and traffic. No matter where we went or what we spoke of, she always seemed to turn the conversation back to Ryan and me. I'll bet she couldn't believe this place when she saw it, Ava said, gazing out over the wide, clear underground river as we approached it. What made you decide to break the rules and bring her back here in the first place? There wasn't much decision on my part in that matter. I shrugged. I had been shot by a hunter, and I was dying. Ryan managed to make contact with my guards and lead them to me. They brought me back here in the nick of time, and Ryan came with me. Wow, so dramatic, she said. You're all right now, though. You seem very fit. Something about her lilting tone gave me pause. And the way her eyes roamed my body before she said the last words made me uncomfortable. But then she turned and nearly skipped away toward the bridge spanning the river, exclaiming over its size and beauty. Perhaps that was the way it was with the dark elves. Knox was certainly an unrepentant flirt, and it had meant nothing, if you didn't count Ryan's case. Dark elves were more like humans than elves in many ways, except, of course, for their appearance and glamour abilities. Speaking of that, Ava had mentioned mine when we first met. We hadn't yet discussed hers. I caught up with her. She was leaning over the railing, studying the crystal clear water. How deep is it? She asked. I don't know. No one has ever been able to reach the bottom of it. I tried once when I was a boy, Perhaps it has no bottom. Resting her chin on her hands, she kept her eyes trained on the fathomless water. Memories are like that. Some are so deep, they seem to have no beginning and no end. Some are so shallow, they barely cause a ripple. They all float around in our brains, either submerged in our subconscious or bobbing on the surface. Her faraway tone made me suspect she was speaking of her own memories. Of her father, perhaps? I'd been told that, like me, she had lost a parent. It was a unique commonality we shared. As elves were immortal, not many people I knew had ever lost a relative. Only violence could end our lives. Thinking of my own father, I said, I find memories can bring peace. They can also haunt you. Sometimes it's better to forget. I glanced over at her profile. Her expression was thoughtful, a little sad. Sometimes, perhaps, I said. How did your father die, if you don't mind my asking? Breaking her concentration on the river, she glanced up at me. 
I don't mind. It was years ago. I was seven. He was killed by a human, a drunk driver. It was a two-car accident. The human lived. I'm so sorry. I knew what that kind of loss felt like. At least I'd had my father for my entire childhood. Thank you. I'm sorry for your loss as well. At least you got revenge on your father's killer. My head jerked back in surprise. For anyone to think I had sought to kill Davis for revenge was shocking. Ryan and Knox and Vancha and I had worked together to end his plot for elven domination over the humans. His death had been an accident. He'd actually caused it himself. Obviously reading my horrified reaction, she continued, I know, you didn't really kill him. We all heard the story. But still, he's dead, isn't he? He got what he deserved. My father's murderer served two years in jail. He's probably out there driving around right now. Her face was a strange mix of melancholy and anger. I wasn't sure what to say. And for the first time since she and Cully arrived, I felt a twinge of concern for Ryan's well-being around our emissaries. I didn't want them saying anything to hurt her feelings or make her feel self-conscious about her part-human heritage. That must be very difficult, I said, probing. It would be understandable if you harbored some very bad feelings toward humans. She straightened and gave me a half-smile. I don't. Not really. I know the crime of that one guy is not the fault of their whole race. Mother is a different story, though. She hates them all. Not only for taking her bondmate's life, but for leaving us without support. My father had no life insurance. We're immortal, after all. I guess he wasn't expecting to die. Unlike Knox's and Vanch's parents, my father wasn't a celebrity. He made a good salary as an entertainment lawyer with Auden's firm, but he wasn't rich. There was no money set aside for the future? No. Apparently, Mother spent every penny Father brought home. When he was gone, so was the money. For the first few years, we scraped by on charity from Auden. Now we survive on what I make from modeling. Still unfamiliar with the ins and outs of dark elven life, I was surprised at her statement. I'd had the impression they were all quite well off due to their sway over humans. Would your mother's glamour not allow her to easily obtain money? Well, she hesitated, her face flushing red. The kind of glamour mother has isn't exactly useful after one has already found a permanent mate. At least, it can't earn money. Well, it might, but she's too proud to use it that way. I see, I said though I didn't really. Reading her discomfort, I didn't pursue the subject. I'm sorry to hear of your family's struggles. Is there some way I can help? We don't use money, but we have plenty of everything here to share. Ava gave me a funny look, as if she'd stumbled upon some previously undiscovered species in the rainforest. You really do have good manners, don't you? I had no idea the light court was so generous. To listen to our high council? You're all a bunch of decrepit old fuddy-duddies burrowed into your little hidey hole like cowardly ticks. I laughed at the unflattering description of my people. Ava's spirited, happy laugh joined mine. She slipped a hand around my arm and pulled me along as she began to walk. You haven't told me your glamour. What is it? I asked, trying to turn the conversation to lighter topics. Her face instantly flushed a deep red once again. I'd, uh, rather not talk about it, if that's okay. She stared fixedly at the ground, fighting for composure. It's embarrassing. I try not to use it when I have a choice. Okay, so not... A better topic. 
Her refusal to discuss her glamour concerned me a little. Then I thought about what she'd said. It's embarrassing. Perhaps she had a glamour that was unfit for polite conversation, like Knox's. At least she wasn't flaunting it as he had. Ready to see more of our decrepit hidey hole? I asked. Oh, yes. I can't wait to see what new wonders you have to show me. As if you haven't impressed me enough already. Ava's words were innocuous enough. But then she followed them up by batting her eyelashes at me and grinning in a way I could only describe as provocative. Having spent so little time around dark elves, I wasn't sure how to interpret it. If only I had Ryan's glamour. Maybe Ava did have sexual glamour, and the body language was unintentional. Just in case, I decided to nip the apparent flirtation in the bud. We'll visit one more site, and then I'll have to escort you back to your quarters. Ryan will be arriving soon. You should invite Cully along on our next tour. Sure, of course. But I have no doubt he's entertaining himself just fine without me. I chuckled. Yes. The servants say he's settled in quite comfortably, giving orders, asking for something every few minutes. Have you two known each other all your lives? Your parents are close, right? Ava kept her eyes on the stone path ahead. Um, yes, our parents have known each other forever. My father was on the council with Auden. Mother took his place after his death. But Cully and I just met recently. He grew up abroad. His mother rules the Australian clans, and he went to school in England. Her answer was rushed, as if she was uncomfortable discussing her fiancé's disjointed upbringing. Maybe she felt it was his place to talk about it. Then she gave me a bright-eyed side glance. What about you and Ryan? How did you meet? A smile overtook my face. I couldn't stop it. We did meet as children, actually. I was out in the woods as usual, exploring. It was nighttime. She was lost, and I found her. I thought light elves didn't mix with humans. I'm surprised you didn't run the other way when you saw her. Yes, well, that is what I was taught to do. But she fascinated me. She was wearing these little pink pants. I'd never seen a girl in pants before. I knew she was human. When I got close, I could tell she was in trouble. She was alone. She was so cold. I thought she might die if I didn't help her. I gave her sail water, and I brought her back here. Ava's eyelids flew open. Oh my God, all hell must have broken loose. I laughed, remembering, oh yes, father was furious. The light council met for hours trying to decide what to do with her. Mother was upset with me, but she did insist I be allowed to stay with the human child while we waited for a verdict. She was worried about her and didn't want her to be afraid. So Ryan and I were locked in my room all night together, unable to even speak to each other. But you know what? We communicated anyway, just through looks and smiles and hand gestures and music. I liked her instantly. She liked me too, I could tell. She fell asleep on my bed. I stayed awake as long as I could, watching her dream. That's so sweet, Ava said. Almost like it was destiny for you to meet. Exactly like destiny. She nodded, looking thoughtful. So then, you continued to see each other over the years and became friends? No, we never saw each other again, not until this year. I tried, but, well, it's a long story. And here we are at the Crystal Cave. There's a hot spring in here that forms a heated pool. It's where we all learn to swim as children. As we entered the warm, humid environment of the cave, I saw there was a class of small children and their adult minders waiting in the shallow end. Oh, they are adorable, Ava said, watching the tiny, naked bodies splashing about. I suppose you'll be wanting one of these before too long. 
I haven't thought that much about it, but yes. Now that she'd brought it up, I could picture a little brown-haired girl with Ryan's beautiful eyes. Or maybe a rambunctious tree-climbing boy who'd challenge me as much as I'd challenged my father. I wouldn't mind having more people in my life to love, I said. After we've been able to go on a honeymoon and have some time to ourselves. Right now, I'm kind of selfish when it comes to my time with Ryan. Oh, a jealous streak, huh? You've got to watch out for those. They can get you into trouble. She punctuated her teasing remark with a wink. Is that what you tell Cully? I asked, teasing her back. At the mention of Cully's name, her expression soured. He's not exactly the jealous type. And you'll figure out soon enough. No one tells Cully Rune anything. So, tell me how you and Ryan ended up running into each other again. That must be a good story. Chapter 9. Ryan After church with my parents, I went to Altum to meet Lad. I was eager to find out how things had gone with Ava this morning. He was planning to show her around and basically give her a welcome to his kingdom while learning more about her. Walking through the common area, I marveled at how much things had changed. Not the place itself, the attitude of Lad's people toward me. I was no longer an intruder, an outsider, though I'd never be just another citizen of this underground world, which was too bad. Those I came into close contact with acknowledged me with a nod or slight bow as I wished them good day in their native language. Naturally, their deferential treatment made me feel weird, but I understood. They showed me respect because I was the betrothed of their king, and soon I'd be their queen. One day, when my natural, believable human lifespan expired, I would move here permanently, assuming I did possess immortality. It was a strange thought that my human life would end, and a whole new one would begin in this land of silence. Good morning, lovely. A very audible voice behind me caused me to whirl around in surprise. From the distinct accent, I knew before I saw him it was Cully. He was casually dressed today in a black sweater and jeans. Even in his human clothes, I was once again caught off guard by how much he resembled my fiancé. He was the only person I'd ever met whose eye color even approached the mesmerizing green of Lad's eyes. I gave him a friendly smile. Hello, how are you getting along here so far? Well, I'm a bit starved for conversation, but the food's decent, he quipped. Stepping closer, he grinned down at me. You are a breath of fresh air, literally. You smell like the woods. His tone and the way he raised a brow with his last statement made it feel like he just told me I smelled like a sirloin tip steak right off the grill. I hadn't thought it possible, but there was actually someone in the world more flirtatious than Knox. I took a step back. Oh, thanks, I guess. Have you seen Lad today? I do believe your betrothed is still occupied with my betrothed. Shall we seek them out and catch them in the act of whatever mischief they've got up to? He gave me an impish smile. I blinked in surprise. Um, I'm sure there's no mischief, but yes, I am supposed to meet him, so I'm on my way to find him. I'll tell Ava you're looking for her. I turned and continued on toward the palace. Cully fell into step beside me. I'll come with you. We third wheels have to stick together. There it was again, the insinuation that I didn't belong here, while Ava somehow did. It irritated me. I cut my eyes over at him. What are you talking about? Oh, nothing. It's just that I'm not really needed here. I'm just the plus one, the man candy. He winked at me. And you... Well, it can't be easy being the only human, especially when everyone here only puts up with you because they've been ordered to. The words were like a hard slap. 
unexpected, stinging, offensive. But not necessarily untrue. Cully had only been in Altum for one day. How would he know how the people here viewed me? Unless it was common knowledge. Is that what you heard? I asked. Oh, don't mind me. Everyone knows I have a big mouth and an even bigger. A wicked smile spread across his face, and his eyes held a devilish spark. Never mind. That's a discussion for another time. Speaking of, how are the wedding plans coming along? You must be eager to get on with it. Still off balance from his earlier remark and now reeling from his obvious attempt to be provocative, I was no longer in the mood for conversation. But we were going to the same place, and he was the ambassador's fiancé. I couldn't exactly tell him to get lost. My tone downgraded from friendly to merely polite. They're coming along fine. How about yours? When's the wedding? Whenever the blushing bride decides to get around to it, I suppose. She's not exactly in a hurry. A less confident fellow might suspect she had her eye on someone else. He punctuated the last sentence with a pointed glance that literally made me stumble on the smooth earthen path. What was going on here? Was he trying to tell me something? More likely, he was just trying to mess with my mind. Extending my emotional glamour in his direction, I did read a sense of naughtiness, though no evil intent. Thankfully, I spotted Lad and Ava ahead, entering the royal residence together. Lad, I called to him, waving. He turned and our eyes met, his filled with unmistakable delight at seeing me. Ah, the bonny prince, Cully muttered under his breath. And my own ravishing fiancé, they look like they've had a satisfying morning. I ignored his ridiculous statement and picked up my pace, hurrying to meet Lad. A sense of relief spread through me as he wrapped me in his arms, affectionate as always. I squeezed him tightly, drawing a deep laugh from him. Well, I'm glad to see you too. How was your evening with your parents? It only made me miss you more. I told him honestly. And I missed you, he said aloud, and then silently, very soon I will have you here with me every night, and I'll have everything I've been missing. Every night. Warmth pulsed through me at his sexy threat. Turning to Ava, I eyed her with a fresh sense of foreboding thanks to Cully's cryptic comments. Hello, how was your tour? Hello, Ryan, she said. It was very nice. And then her eyes dropped to her feet. She looked almost ashamed. My glance shot to Cully's knowing expression. Noticing the odd exchange, Lad asked, What's going on? Is he bothering you? I shook my head. No, he's harmless, just annoying. Agreed. He reached out to shake Cully's hand, speaking to him aloud. Good morning. Did you sleep in? Always. It's my favorite thing about your charming kingdom so far. The complete absence of alarm clocks and annoying sunrises, Cully said. How was your liaison with my betrothed this morning? Lad's brows lowered, his lips forming a flat line. Our tour was fine, though we didn't get to everything. We'll have to continue it tomorrow. I hope you'll join us. Of course. Will Ryan be along as well? No, I suppose you've already seen it all, he said, answering his own question. Turning to Lad, he asked, When did you introduce this lovely little outsider to your hidden world? It was a simple question and by far the most innocuous thing he'd said today. But Lad just stared at him, a strange expression crossing his face. Maybe he was mad Cully had called me an outsider. I, not that long ago, he said. Right, Ryan, it's been? His searching expression startled me. 
I thought guys were supposed to start forgetting your anniversary after you'd been married a long time, not before you even got going. It was about five months ago, I answered, filling in the verbal blank. Lad was hurt, and I followed the guards who brought him back here. Lad blinked and then turned back to Cully and nodded. So I hope you and Ava will continue to settle in. I have a date with my beautiful fiancé now, and then I'll be busy with affairs of the crown for the rest of the day. I'll see you at dinner tonight. Please, don't hesitate to ask the servants for anything you may need. Cully gave us both a little bow. Thank you, good sir. So nice to see you, Ryan. Enjoy your time together, however long that might be. He extended a hand to Ava. Come along, Angel. Let's give these two lovebirds their privacy. With a wink, he spun on his heel and led Ava away from us, whispering in her ear. I was still watching them go, mulling over Cully's strange words when Lad spoke. I am glad you grew up in the human world instead of the dark court. I don't think I've met a dark elf yet I could figure out. I know what you mean. I took his hand, enjoying the warmth of his skin. Are you feeling okay? Yes, why? Don't I look okay? He dropped his lips to mine, already well aware of how attractive I found him. Of course. You just seem distracted, I guess. He sighed dramatically. Such is the life of a king. And I've never had to entertain an ambassador before. I'm always having to learn something new. Reading his feelings, I could tell he was a little overwhelmed and preoccupied. An unexpected cold shiver hit my middle. The last time Lad was preoccupied with kingdom business, he broke things off with me, saying he needed to focus his full attention on his people. Tamping down the disturbing feeling, I chastised myself. Trust, Ryan. Based on Lad's loving expression, it was clear I was his priority. I gave him a happy smile. What you need is some fun. Want to have a picnic? We could stop by the kitchen and take a basket out to the bluff. He smiled at me and narrowed his eyes, shaking his head. The bluff? That's one of my favorite spots. Did I tell you about it? I stared at him, incredulous. How could he have forgotten? He'd taken me there the day he'd finally committed to our relationship and agreed we couldn't be just friends. For him to forget our special picnic and our nap in the hammock there pinched my heart. But then I thought about it. That romantic interlude had been followed by a near-death experience for Lad. On our way home from our afternoon at the bluff, he'd been shot by drunken hunters in the woods and lost consciousness, not to mention an astounding amount of blood. No wonder his memories of that day weren't exactly clear. I squeezed his hand in mine. You showed me, and it was beautiful. It might be just the place to get away and relax. Sounds perfect. And he punctuated his agreement with a perfect kiss. As it had been the first time, the bluff was beautiful. It offered an expansive view of the meadows and woods below, now a stunning quilt of dappled fall color. Birds chirped busily in the nearby trees, and the afternoon sunshine offered the perfect foil to the fall breeze. But in spite of the peaceful beauty surrounding us, I couldn't shake the feeling that Lad wasn't fully present. We chatted while we ate. We kissed and snuggled in the hammock. But there was a faraway look in his eye, and several times I caught him studying me with a quizzical expression on his face. What are you thinking? I scratched my fingers lightly down the inside of Lad's forearm, watching the spray of chill bumps that raised the silky blonde hairs. You seem like your mind is a million miles away today. His shoulders gave a slight shrug. He kept his eyes trained on the pattern my finger now traced on his palm. I don't know. I have a lot to do, I guess. A lot on my mind. Something was going on with him. I could feel it. But he obviously didn't want to share it with me. A little hurt, I made a suggestion I thought might snap him out of it. 
Well, I have school in the morning, and I know you're busy, so maybe I should just head home. I shifted, starting to get out of the hammock. He blinked a few times, taken aback by my sudden change of demeanor. You're not going to attend the welcome dinner tonight? You don't need me to help you welcome Ava. You're doing fine all by yourself. Lad's brows drew together, his expression registering concern and confusion. But he sat up and offered a hand to steady me as I put my feet on the ground. Okay, if that's what you want, I'll walk you home. It wasn't what I wanted. I wanted him to talk me out of it, to ask me to stay with him. He didn't even try to talk me out of it. Now the little hurt morphed into a big one. No, I'll be fine. That would take too long. You should be getting back to your duties. I know you have a lot to do before tonight. He cocked his head, narrowing his eyes as he examined my face. Is everything okay? Sure, it's great. My clipped tone said it was anything but great. I just have homework I put off and a test to study for. I haven't exactly been focused on school this semester. I need to put in a little more effort. And I don't want to take up too much of your time. Ryan. Lad gathered me against him and kissed the top of my head. His love flowed around me like the heat from his unnaturally warm body. I wish I could spend all my time with you. I do want you to do well in school, though. I know it's important to you. And I don't mind walking you home, really. I want to. The knot in my stomach relaxed a bit. This was the lad I knew and loved. I was ridiculous for being so mental. My vow to let go of the past and trust more wasn't starting off so hot. I blew out a long, slow breath, mindfully releasing the tension I'd allowed to build in my body. No, it's okay. I said, it's broad daylight, and you probably do need to get back. I'm just greedy when it comes to you. I'll be fine. He studied my face for a moment. Okay. I like you greedy, by the way. He kissed me, a brief, sweet connection. I'll see you soon, right? After school tomorrow? Of course. Have a good time whining and dining the fashion twins. Who? Ava and Cully, your new ambassador and her fiancé. They're models, you know, fashion. Oh, right. He chuckled to himself. Fine host I am. I almost forgot he came along. Isn't that weird? It was weird. Very weird. Was Lad so focused on Ava that her betrothed was a non-factor to him? A bright, piercing panic shot through my heart like a surgical laser. All the tension zoomed right back in, locking my limbs. Lad, what is Ava's glamour? I don't know. I asked, but she didn't want to talk about it. She said it was embarrassing. Why? Just curious. That wasn't exactly true. I wasn't just curious. I was also suspicious especially knowing she was reluctant to discuss her embarrassing glamour. I had seen sexual glamour up close. I knew how powerful it could be. I could only pray that wasn't the special gift of Lad's special guest. Or if it was, that he had the strength to resist it. Chapter 10, Ryan Instead of going straight home, I made a detour to Lad's nest hideaway. Hopefully, he wouldn't also decide to stop by and catch me here. Fingers trembling, I reached for the first branch, hoisted myself up, and began climbing. Of course, I shouldn't have been snooping, but I couldn't help myself. This was the place Lad kept things that were important to him, things he didn't want others to know about. Maybe there would be some sort of clue here about his current mindset. If there was something I needed to know, even if it was potentially devastating, better to find out before the wedding rather than after we were bonded. 
My heart thumped heavily as I reached the nest and crawled across to the ancient chest where Lad stored his prized possessions. I unlatched it, but hesitated for a moment before lifting the heavy lid, letting my hands rest on its warm, age-smooth surface. It's wrong. Just stop, Brian. Trust him. Trust what you have together. Unfortunately, trust was not my strongest attribute. Maybe it was part of my dark elven nature. Maybe it was the residual effect of my parents' breakup and my past heartbreak at Lad's hands. Raising the lid, I quickly cataloged the trunk's contents. Library books. The framed picture of me Lad had taken from my house. And a wrapped package. What was inside? A welcome gift for his new emissary? Something pretty that would make Ava's eyes light up the way mine had when Lad had first shown me this place? Then a new thought occurred to me. Would he bring her here? It would depend, I guessed, on how strong her appeal to him was. If she did have sexual glamour, and he was susceptible to its power, he would do anything to please her. I had done things I'd never imagined I'd ever do with Knox. Suddenly, I wished he weren't so far away. Knox and I were truly friends now, and he could easily tell me whether Ava did indeed have that dreadful, wonderful gift after a few moments in her presence. Speaking of gifts, I picked up the small box. It was covered in light-colored paper of such a fine texture it almost felt like cloth. Holding it to my ear, I shook it gently. Something shifted inside. I put the box down. For a long time, I stared at it, fighting an internal battle. I shouldn't open the box, but I desperately wanted to. If it's something for her, I'll die. Then the rational part of me spoke up and said it was probably just something for his mom. When was her birthday anyway? I needed to find out since we were about to become family. I picked up the package again and searched for the seam of the wrapping. There was no tape. It was sort of an origami thing with intricate folds I could never hope to duplicate. If I opened this, I'd be busted. Maybe I should just march back to Altum and ask him what was inside. No, I couldn't reveal to him the embarrassing depths of my insecurity. Finally, caving into temptation, I tugged at the paper flaps, my face hot with shame, my heart beating in hard, guilty thumps. Fold by fold, I invaded Lad's secret until finally something fell into my lap. With shaking fingers, I picked it up. It was a tree, intricately carved out of wood. Oh, it was this tree. I recognized it by the branches that started low to the ground. Lad made this. Wonderment filled me at his talent and at the amount of time and effort this must have required. Each tiny leaf was perfection. At the miniature tree's base were two small figures, a little boy and a little girl. Inspecting it closely, I saw both children were laughing, and the boy's hands held the little girl's face between them. Tears filled my eyes, stinging my nose and squeezing my heart. He had carved the scene of our first encounter, the moment we'd met more than ten years ago. Turning the precious carving over in my hand, I noticed an inscription on the bottom. I gave you my warmth. You gave me a voice. What you could not know that day was I also gave you my heart. Forever. There has only been, and will ever be, only you. I will treasure every day I get to have with you. They are the only days that matter. Yours for eternity. Lad. A tear slid down my cheek. It was a wedding present. I should have guessed it the instant I found a wrapped box hidden here. What was wrong with me? 
did I really have so little faith. Lad wasn't the one who was wavering. I was. And for no reason. If I didn't get a handle on my trust issues, I was going to ruin the best thing that had ever happened to me. I did my best to rewrap the gift, following the existing creases, and miraculously managed to get the box back together. Then I began the painstaking process of descending the tree branch by branch. By the time I reached the ground, I knew what I had to do. Screw my unfinished homework. I'd left something far more important unfinished in autumn. Chapter 11 Ava. Following this morning's tour of Altum, I spent the remainder of the day in my quarters, sick at my stomach. My job had gone well today, had been easy, even. Instead of being satisfied or relieved, I was steeped in sadness. If I felt this way now, how was I going to live with myself once I'd completed my mission? It was worse, somehow, than the work I had done for Auden before, though that had always made me feel icky. I hadn't really known those people, or what they would be losing. It had been quick, almost clinical, and I'd never had to stick around to see the aftermath. No doubt I was terrible company for Cully. He paced around my room, restless. This place is dead boring, isn't it? What do they do here all day? Play the harp? Whittle? How should I know? I snapped. I just got here too. Why don't you go for a walk in the woods or something? He glanced over at me. Maybe I will. I heard the king's pretty little human pet likes to do that. Maybe we'll cross paths. When that got no reaction from me, he said, What's the matter with you anyway? You've been in a mood all day. Nothing. I'm fine. I'm just bored, too. Cully crossed the room and plopped onto my bed, stretching out his long limbs, studying me. No, you're not fine. Are you worried about your mission or something? What, is your badass glamour not working on Mr. Perfect? I rolled my eyes. No, it's working. Oh, good. He crossed his arms behind his head. So, what is it then? Second thoughts? You're feeling guilty about messing up the lovebird's happy little nest, aren't you? I turned away from him to hide my sudden flush, busying myself by pouring a glass of sail water from the handmade pitcher on the table. I took a drink. Of course not. Why? Are you having second thoughts? Glancing back over my shoulder at him, I caught Cully's sardonic, are you serious, expression. Not a one. It's not my job to think, he said with a bitter smile. I'm just another pretty face, doing as I'm told. As I said, your best course of action is to get in, do the job, get out and then get as far away from the parentals as possible. It's the closest thing I've ever found to peace on earth. He was quiet for a moment, causing me to look back at him again. His fingers plucked at the threads that made up the elaborate design of the handmade bed covering. They are quite sweet, aren't they, though? His eyes darted up, catching me watching him. I shrugged at his obvious attempt to bait me and turned away again, staring down at the fruit plate that had been provided for us, hungry for none of it. I'd have to force myself to eat at the welcome dinner tonight to avoid questions. I've never seen such a love, he continued. It almost makes one wish to experience it personally. His tone wasn't quite sarcastic. It was more like probing. Shrugging again, I made sure my voice was no big deal light. Not really. I don't see the point in it. The truth was, I was deeply affected by the relationship between the Light King and his betrothed. 
I had never felt that way for someone before, and certainly no one had ever felt that way about me. Our people didn't do things that way. Arranged marriages didn't leave much room for love. But really, who didn't want to be loved? Passionately? Irrationally? Just thinking of being held in someone's arms, being the subject of someone's adoring gazes, made my chest ache with longing and had me blushing all over again. I kept my back to Cully. Why didn't he just leave already? Hadn't we done enough today to support the ruse of a love match? Maybe I could just tell him to... I think someone's a closet romantic. The whisper just behind my ear startled me. I jumped and spun around, colliding with Cully's chest. What are you doing creeping up on me? I yelped. He grinned and stepped close again, backing me up against the table until the contour of it pressed into my thighs. With one hand on either side of my hips, he leaned over me, forcing me to sit on the table edge and lean back to preserve the distance between our faces. Maybe we should take advantage of all those cuddly, sappy feelings you're having. Your bed was awfully comfortable. The corner of his mouth and his brow lifted in a suggestive manner. I raised my hand to slap him, but Cully caught my wrist easily, his grin turning hard. Don't let the pink candy hearts in your eyes make you forget who your real friends are and who the enemy is. The light court has never done a bloody thing for us, Angel. And the humans. He huffed a derisive laugh. Lad is a damn fool to let himself fall for a girl with even one drop of human blood. It weakens him. Love has made him weak. And it will be his downfall. How would you know? I challenged. Have you been burned or something? Why are you such a cynic? Just part of my charm, sweetheart. He backed away from me a few steps and bowed. I'll leave you to your daydreams. See you at dinner. Then he spun on his heel and left the room. The obedient daughter in me knew he was right. But another part of me rebelled against his words. From what I'd seen, the light court was stable and secure its people happy. Lad seemed like a solid and just leader. And from what he had said about her today, Ryan's love hadn't weakened him. She made him stronger, better in every way. I looked at the door where Cully had disappeared. I could never tell him I was having such traitorous thoughts. He would report me to Mother and Auden faster than I could say banishment. And I couldn't just leave Altum without completing my mission. That would bring the same result. I wasn't ready or able to live completely on my own, without a family, without a people. And I had made a deal I couldn't back out of. But I didn't have to do a great job of it, did I? I felt the corners of my mouth pull up. Maybe there was a way to provide for my mother and technically adhere to the deal with Cully's father without doing any real harm here. If I refused to use the full power of my glamour against Lad, only I would know. Excitement rippled through my chest. Yes, that's it. I could go through the motions, make it look convincing, use my gift, just enough to prove to my babysitter slash chaperone slash betrothed, that I had obeyed orders. For the first time since we'd arrived in this foreign kingdom, I felt a sense of hope. Instead of destroying the new peace between the dark and light kings, instead of killing the love between Lad and his bride, I would strike. But I'd leave only a flesh wound behind. My new lightness of spirit evaporated the moment I saw Ryan's face. Entering the formal dining room of the royal residence, she came straight toward me, as if she'd been waiting for me. She was wearing a nice dress and makeup. From a distance, she looked like a high school student dressed for a dance. 
but as she got close, her expression was all business. Ava, I'd like to speak with you privately. She slipped a hand around my back and guided me toward the hallway. Uh-oh, she was on to me. My pulse thrummed in my ears as we walked together. I had heard she had powerful emotional glamour. Had she been able to see right through me from the start? And why had nobody considered that when they sent me into the arena with transparent armor? What's this about? I asked as soon as we passed through the tall, arched doorway into the empty hall. She stopped and faced me. This is about your glamour and my fiancé. Oh, well, you don't have to worry. I'm not... She held up a hand in a silencing gesture. Please, just let me speak, and then you can have a turn, okay? I nodded. I'm not a stranger to glamour. I've been on both ends of it, and I know how it can affect people's behavior and their thoughts and feelings. She swallowed, took a breath, and went on. Lad and I have been to hell and back. We have earned our happy ending, and I'm not about to let anything or anyone get in the way of that now when we're so close to it. But I wasn't planning. Again, her hand went up, and I subsided. I appreciate that Lad is very appealing. I can't blame anyone for thinking so. But just in case it's not totally clear to you, he's taken. I'm not sure what's going on or not going on between you and Cully, but Lad and I are not just betrothed in the elven tradition. We're in love. He's mine. And if you want to fight for him, you're on. She let out a breath. Now, what would you like to say? I stood there, shaking my head like an idiot. Her speech had stolen my breath. The sincerity and determination, the passion. My pulse raced as rapidly as my mind. I wanted to feel that for somebody. I wanted someone to feel it for me. And to think I had come here to wipe it out. If my decision hadn't already been made, I would have made it here and now. I promise you, I have no intention of interfering with your relationship. The two of you inspire me, and I wish you only the best. For a moment, she studied me. Maybe she was reading my emotions? Then her shoulders relaxed, and once again she looked like a high school girl ready for a nice dinner date. Great. Let's go find our seats. But as we entered the dining room together, she said in the elven way, And you can tell your frisky fiancé. I've got my eye on him, too. Chapter 12. Lad The small dining room was one of my favorite rooms in the palace, and I had my most favorite person with me. The low lighting gleamed off of Ryan's beautiful chestnut hair and gilded her bare shoulders. She had surprised me by coming back to Altum tonight. I was concerned about her admitted lack of attention to her schoolwork, but selfishly, I'd been thrilled. I probably would have been fine without her for tonight, as she had said, but I didn't want to be without her, ever. The welcome dinner for our new ambassador wasn't a full-scale banquet. I'd scheduled a larger event for a few days from now when Knox and Vansha would return from abroad and pay us a brief visit. Tonight's gathering was a formal dinner in one of the palace's more intimate dining rooms. My family had actually shared meals here together throughout my childhood. The room was long and narrow, anchored by a heavy rectangular table that was lined with ornate high-backed chairs. Above us all, a chandelier made from a tree trunk and its exposed roots dripped with tiny lights, making the occasion feel festive. My mother and her sister Sophie were there, seated at the far end of the table. The light council members were in attendance. I sat at the head of the table with Ryan to one side of me. Ava sat on my other side, with Cully next to her. He seemed to appreciate the pomp and circumstance, not to mention the plentiful food and wine, though he always seemed to be having a good time no matter where he was. 
Ava was subdued, and on more than one occasion, I noticed her casting wary glances at Ryan. Everything all right? I asked Ryan silently. She cut a side glance at me. Fine. Are you okay? I nodded. I'd been feeling a little strange earlier in the day, but this evening I was in good spirits. After all, I had the most beautiful date here. You look amazing, I whispered to her, leaning close. Of course, I could have said that to her mind to mind, but I enjoyed watching the spray of goosebumps that covered her bare skin when my breath caressed her ear. She leaned a bit closer to me and spoke softly, gazing up into my eyes. And you are the sweetest guy in the whole world. I grinned, feeling like I just swallowed a spoonful of summer sunshine. There was nothing I wouldn't do for this woman. I should pay you more compliments, I teased. It's not that. She dipped her eyes and wore a secret smile. It's everything you do. I can't wait to be your wife. The air left my lungs all at once, leaving me pleasantly lightheaded. She had never said it quite like that before. Sitting close to her, so delicate and beautiful and sweet-smelling, and knowing that in a few short weeks I'd finally be able to act on all the feelings and distracting thoughts I'd been having, I found it hard not to snatch her out of her chair and carry her to my bedroom right then and there. I was about to respond, probably with something entirely inappropriate for a public dinner, when Cully spoke up. I'm looking forward to my tour tomorrow. Will we get to see the sail water facilities? Irritated at having to shift my attention from Ryan to his smug face, I struggled to keep my tone pleasant. Yes, if you'd like. You're interested in production? Oh, of course. Especially as it's in such demand now among humans in your... What's it called, Ryan? Marigold tea? Magnolia sugar tea, she corrected him. I didn't think it was especially popular among dark elves. Since the Summer Olympics, fewer and fewer humans were susceptible to glamour because they had started drinking Ryan's tea, which contained sail water. That meant the dark elves had taken a direct hit. Their songs weren't guaranteed chart toppers anymore. Their movies and TV shows were not as successful as they had been. Of course, not everyone drank it but the number was high enough that its effects were significant. Cully laughed at Ryan's statements as if he found her unbearably cute. Oh, I'm a huge fan. I think you're quite brilliant for discovering its effects and finding a way to get the word out. Not many humans are so clever or so beautiful. He raised a glass in tribute, and Ryan's chin dipped modestly. Thank you she whispered, clearly uncomfortable. Inside, I was seething with annoyance, but I raised my own glass as well, forcing a smile. Hear, here. I couldn't agree more. I took a sip and then kissed Ryan on the cheek, pulling her a little closer to me. How much sail water is actually in the tea? Cully asked, giving Ryan an interested glance. You know I'm not going to answer that. Her tone was firm, but not unfriendly. It's a secret recipe. Of course. Can't blame me for trying. Cully laughed. Don't worry. I'm not going to launch a competing brand or anything. Ava interjected. Sweetie, stop teasing Ryan and let her eat. Ryan shot Ava a grateful look and Ava returned her smile warmly. There was definitely something going on between the two girls, though there seemed to be a new understanding between them. I'd have to ask Ryan about it later. Cully's expression was not so pleasant. In fact, he nearly glared at Ava, and probably said something to her mind to mind as well, because she flushed and shook her head slightly before dropping her gaze to the tabletop. She recovered quickly, though, her tone was bright as she asked me about one of the appetizer offerings on the table. Life here is so different, she said. We make so little of what we use. 
We've gotten so far away from the ways of the first ones. I'm not sure that's a good thing. Tell me about your food production here. Are you mostly a hunting society, or is there a good deal of agriculture as well? As I turned to answer Ava's in-depth question, I saw Cully from the corner of my eye. He was leaning across the table toward Ryan, once again engaging her in conversation. Though I kept a pleasant expression on my face for Ava's sake, my hand curled into a fist beneath the table. I sent Ryan a quick message, more eager to act on it than she could possibly imagine. Let me know if he bothers you, and I'll have him reseated at the children's table. Her answer was immediate and confident, one corner of her mouth pulling up in amusement. Don't worry about me. This guy doesn't faze me at all. Chapter 13, Ryan It was true. Cully Rune may have been pinned and repinned, shared, tweeted, drooled over nonstop on Instagram, but he did nothing for me. Sure, he was a beautiful guy, but the elven world was full of them, and I already had the best of the bunch. At the moment, Lad was being monopolized by Cully's counterpart. He and Ava sat close to each other, deep in discussion about the various food courses being brought to the table and the elven wines that accompanied each one. The atmosphere in here was intimate, even romantic, resembling photos of wine cellar dining rooms I'd seen online. It was mostly quiet, as the majority of the dinner guests communicated with each other mind to mind. Other than the muted clinking of silverware and some soft music piped in from another room, their low voices were the only sound. Glancing over at the two of them, it was impossible not to notice how lovely they looked together. They were elven after all, and they were each pretty much the finest the species had to offer. They made a pretty pair. The sight didn't bother me as much as it would have before. Not that I fully trusted Ava now. My trust was in Lad. But she had assured me she had no romantic interest in him, and I believed her. Still, I would feel more comfortable if I knew what her glamour was. Just as I had earlier, I used my own glamour on Ava, reading her emotions as she interacted with Lad. She smiled and laughed, tossing her hair, and keeping intense eye contact with him. But there was no real attraction between them. She was either faking the whole siren thing, or that was her natural behavior 24-7. She was nervous about something. I couldn't be sure what. When she cut her eyes subtly to Cully, I assumed it had something to do with him. Maybe she was worried about him being jealous? She needn't have worried. He wasn't paying the least bit of attention to her side of the table. Instead, he had turned the full wattage of his admittedly dazzling smile in my direction. What did you think of Los Angeles, Ryan? It was interesting. Unfortunately, there was not enough sightseeing and too much fighting for my life. He gave me a mock pout. That's a shame. You need to make a return trip. I'll be happy to show you around. I guarantee you'll have a better time with me. His come-ons were so outrageous, I almost laughed. I prefer the comforts of home, thank you. Of course. How could anyone not love it here, 50 k's south of Whoop Whoop? Now I did laugh out loud at what I assumed was the Australian term for the middle of nowhere. If you're so bored, you can always go back to California. I raised a challenging brow. There must be at least a few women in Los Angeles you haven't hit on yet. He smirked. And leave my dear betrothed? How could I possibly bear it? In spite of his facetious tone and blasé expression, when I read his emotions, I did detect a note of jealousy after all. Did it bother him for Ava to spend time with Lad? Deciding to test him a bit, I said, She is lovely. Everyone thinks so. Now he allowed his gaze to wander to her. 
She was leaning toward Lad, head tilted to the side, appearing completely fascinated with whatever he was telling her. It's often the most beautiful roses that hide the most vicious thorns, he murmured, then held his wine glass aloft, motioning for one of the servers to refill it. Hmm, an interesting thing to say. Had Ava hurt him? Rejected him in some way? They were betrothed, but with arranged marriages, there was no guarantee of affection or even willingness on either part. I had learned that from Lad and Vanche's parent-orchestrated betrothal. We had been led to believe Ava and Cully were in love and would find it too painful to be separated. But that wasn't necessarily accurate. Based on the emotions I was picking up from him, it could be one of those unrequited attraction situations. Well, I'm not afraid of her thorns, I said. I've seen worse. And I have some experience with sexual glamour myself. It's not impossible to resist. Lad may not even be susceptible to it. Cully's eyes widened suddenly and then narrowed as a grin spread across his face. Oh, you figured out her glamour, have you? Yes, and I'm not threatened. The Dark Council will have to do a little better than that if they want to mess things up in the Light Kingdom. Cully made a little tut-tut noise. I hate to see such an ugly lack of trust in one so pretty. I assure you, we are here as ambassadors, nothing more. Care to repeat that in the elven way? I asked him silently, taking a sip from my own glass. Oh my, the half-breed has some skills. He nodded deferentially then continued mind to mind. I'd be delighted to. Your relationship with the Light King makes no difference to me at all. I wish you all the best on your upcoming wedding. May your love last forever. He gave me a deeper nod, almost a bow, and did a little courtly flourish with one hand. And what about your love? I set my glass down and gave him a direct look. I'm not sure what you mean, he said. I'm offered love on a daily basis from any number of women and men. He was trying to fluster me, to throw me off. Undeterred, I asked again. You care about Ava, don't you? Cully didn't answer me mind to mind. Instead, he gave me a chiding, we're not going there smirk. You seem to put a good deal of faith in love, my lady. I have never found it to be all that reliable. Let us hope the young king is as dependable as he seems. Watching his fiance chatting amiably with mine, he stroked a finger across his full bottom lip. Even the best of us can forget ourselves sometimes. Chapter 14 Ava. The dinner went as well as could be hoped with Cully constantly watching me and Ryan's warning still ringing in my ears. What she didn't know and probably would never believe was that I really didn't plan to seduce her fiancé or harm him in any way. Not anymore. When I saw them acting so loving with each other early in the evening, I was truly happy. Apparently, it wasn't too late. What I'd already done to him hadn't been enough to alter their course. I could still live with myself. Of course, once Cully had taken such a keen interest in my interactions with my intended target, I had to keep up appearances. It was horribly uncomfortable to flirt with Lad right in front of Ryan. Honestly, I was a little shocked she didn't call me on it, or at least throw visual daggers at me but she seemed content and unconcerned throughout the evening. Maybe she hadn't bought my act. I hope Cully had. Now, I was driving through the small town near Altum's rural location, Deep River, the sign at the city limits had read. I was supposed to check in every few days with Mother and hadn't spoken to her since we'd arrived in Mississippi. I was actually eager to talk to her for a change, 
I had something I needed to say. She answered the phone on the first ring. Where have you been? Why haven't you called? How is it going so far with the Light King? Hello, Mother, I answered, pulling into a grocery store lot and parking my car. I'm fine. Thanks for asking. Oh, Ava, why must you always be so combative? Of course I care how you are. But the fact that you're calling tells me your trip went fine. What I'm concerned about is the reason you're there. Yeah, about that. The words drifted as I chickened out. I had imagined myself boldly telling her of my decision, but years of conditioning kicked in and the declaration faded on my tongue. What? You haven't been able to spend time with him yet? I rolled down my car window. The sounds of traffic from the nearby street and a shopping cart rattling across the lot drifted in with a rush of heated air. Though it was fall, the weather here was still steamy. I rolled the window up again and turned up the air conditioner. No, I have. What then? Your glamour isn't working? I got a quick mental image of Lad's face, followed by a sharp blast of gut-churning guilt. No, it works on him. I've seen the proof. An exasperated sigh came through the line. Just tell me what's going on. I surely hope you're not going to say Cully's been a problem. He's supposed to be helping you, not distracting you. It's not Cully. I hesitated, sitting up straighter in my seat, fighting through the fear. It's me. I'm not sure I can do it. Have some confidence, she scolded. You've already said your glamour works on him. No, I mean, I'm not sure I want to do it anymore. Not after actually meeting him and his betrothed. It doesn't feel right. The silence on the other end of the connection was worse than a thousand explosions. Thora Morton never shouted, never even raised her voice. When she did speak again, her calm, measured tone was filled with a malice so deadly, I got goosebumps. You ungrateful little brat. The pause was so long, I wondered if she was even going to continue. But unfortunately, she did. You know how much we need this. Your performance in this task will ensure our survival or seal our doom. I am dependent on Auden's good graces. If he learns of your treason, he'll send us both away penniless. That was true. Auden wasn't known for his generosity or forgiving nature. From what Cully had said, he could barely spare a concern for his own child. He wouldn't hesitate to throw us out if I failed to complete my assignment. But how could I? I don't mean to be disloyal. I just want to do the right thing. Now that I'm here and I've seen it, I don't think the light court means us any harm. I don't think destroying the peace pact is necessary. What is necessary is loyalty to your family, to your mother, who has sacrificed everything for you, she hissed. How will I survive without the support of the dark court, hmm? What would you have me do? Sell my body to the humans? You're lucky your glamour isn't sexual glamour. It's utterly useless when your bondmate has died. I can't marry again unless I marry a human man and glamour him every day, all day long, to keep him away from my bed and make him think he's satisfied so he'll allow me to live with him. I can't think of anything more exhausting or repugnant. Mother, no, of course not. I can still model. I can support us. You could probably model too, or work in news again, or I don't know, there are all sorts of jobs. Mother had been a national news anchor until her perpetually youthful appearance became too difficult to explain. 
Then she'd retired, and we'd lived on my father's considerable income. Jobs, she repeated the word as if it were in some guttural foreign language. Yes, that sounds like a wonderful future. I'll take a never-ending succession of monotonous, low-paying jobs for the rest of my eternal life. If I'm banished from the court, I'll have to move continually and take on new identities in order to cover for my lack of aging. I might as well kill myself now. Please don't say that. You could come here to Altum. I'm sure Lad would welcome you. Huh! I'd rather sleep on a bench in downtown L.A. than rot in that moldy hole in the ground, taking charity from some glorified cave dweller. I thought of the warmth of Altum, its glowing mineral rocks, its slow, gentle way of life, the way people had welcomed me, an outsider, an enemy, a liar. Mother was wrong, but I clearly wasn't going to convince her. Can we maybe tell Auden to send someone else? Tell him my glamour doesn't work on Lad or something? It would be too suspicious to switch ambassadors now. I could tell Lad I'm sick and I need to go home. I certainly felt sick at the prospect of what I'd been asked to do. No, Ava, you were very carefully selected. You're the only one who can do this. No other glamour will get the job done without casting suspicion on the dark court. And you must be joking to suggest lying to Auden. You do remember what I told you about his glamour, don't you? Yes. I shivered again, though the air temperature was perfectly comfortable now. Please, darling. Mother's tone had changed becoming soft and placating. I need you to do this for me, for us. She paused. Your father would have wanted you to take care of your family, the way he always took care of you. The guilt swamped me, just as she knew it would. Closing my eyes and tipping my head back against the headrest, I visualized the horrible night we lost him. Christmas Eve, not a holiday our kind celebrated, but I was in first grade, and having gone to school with humans and becoming familiar with their ways and customs, I'd become totally enamored of the idea of Christmas. It seemed so magical. I'd been crying that night, feeling sorry for myself that I wouldn't have a gift to open, not that I needed anything. I had far more possessions than most of my human schoolmates would ever have. But at the time, it seemed tragic. My father had made up some excuse for leaving the house early that evening, and he'd gone out to buy me a Christmas present. The police came to our house two hours later. The next morning, my mother's hair was pure white, and her eyes, they'd never looked at me the same way. All right, I whispered into the phone, barely managing to choke out the words. What did you say? I said, all right, I'll do it. That's my good girl, Mother cooed. You'll see, darling, it's for the best. When you succeed, you'll have the gratitude of the Dark Council and especially of Auden. His good side is the safest place to be, you know. Okay, fine. I'll check in again on Thursday. There's a banquet Wednesday night in honor of Knox and his bride. They're taking a quick break from their honeymoon. From their tour of destruction, rather. I hear he's been decimating the remaining fan pods in Europe. Such a shame. We've got to put a stop to this soon or risk losing everything we've built. You must... I know, I know, I will. There was a knock on my car window. A man stood just outside it, but I couldn't see his face because he was too tall. All I got was a glimpse of a lean waist encased in faded jeans. I need to go. I'll talk to you soon. Bye, sweetie. Mummy loves you. Okay, bye. 
Hitting the end call button, I rolled down the window. A face appeared in it. Not a man, a boy. Well, a guy about my age. He was kind of a man. I had a quick, dazzling impression of black hair and strong features and a bright, sunny smile. And his eyes. They reminded me of a trip my family had taken to an island in the Caribbean. Our seaplane had flown over what seemed like miles of the clearest turquoise waters. I'd never seen anything to match their color until now. Um, can I help you? I asked, sounding a bit dazed. His smile widened, revealing dimples in both cheeks to match the small one on his chin. Wow. I was going to ask you the same thing. What are you talking about? I noticed your car here when I went into Food Star a while ago. We don't see many California plates around here, or many Corvette convertibles. When I came back out of the store just now, you had your head back on the headrest there like maybe you were having a problem. I thought maybe you were lost or something. No, uh, no thank you. I'm fine. You sure about that? He reached into the window and touched my cheek lightly with a fingertip. I jerked my head back away from the surprising contact. Rubbing the drop of moisture between his fingers, the guy stared at me, waiting for my answer. I was momentarily stunned by his concern and those eyes. Finally, I snapped out of it. I'm fine. I don't need any help. I don't have any problems. What a lie. I had so many problems, I didn't know where to start. Mm, that's too bad, he murmured. What? Why? The sunny smile reappeared, making those turquoise eyes twinkle. I'm pretty good at solving problems. Name's Asher, by the way. His hand came back through the window, leaving me no choice but to shake it. It was a big hand, warm and work roughened. This was no pampered pretty boy. He had to be a mechanic or a construction worker or a farmer or something. I released it quickly. Ava, I'm just passing through. Asher backed away from the window, still smiling, as if something I'd said amused him. Okay, Ava just passing through. If you do need any help, just look for Big Red here. He patted the enormous pickup truck parked next to my car. I'm usually around. He dipped his chin in a respectful little nod and walked away from my car, going to the driver's side of his own vehicle. I let out a long breath, watching him go. That was by far the strangest encounter I'd ever had with a human. Usually they weren't so interesting or well-built. Great, Ava. The last thing you need is another human to sympathize with. Get your mind off the Levi's and on the mission. I put my car in reverse, backed out of my spot, and left the lot of the food star. Just before making the turn from Main Street onto the county road that would take me out to Altam, I noticed a flash of red in the rearview mirror. Asher's truck had been behind me, but was now fading into the distance. Chapter 15, Lad. Wednesday night. I couldn't wait to dance with Ryan. With all the time we'd spent together, it wasn't something we'd done yet. I couldn't exactly go to her school dances or join her in a nightclub after all. Banquets in the light court always involved ballroom dancing something similar to what I'd read about in Regency novels. I was looking forward to teaching her all the steps to our traditional dances and seeing the delight in her eyes when she realized it was actually a particular skill of mine. Growing up in the royal family, I'd had no choice but to put up with a dancing instructor during childhood. The members of my court were in their best formal attire, the men in white shirts and long pants, the ladies in dresses that swept the floor. 
festive music flowed through the room as thick and delicious as the sense of the food displayed on the buffet-style table in the center of it. I sat at the front of the ballroom with Ryan by my side. Taking her hand, I raised it to my lips for a kiss. It was the most affection I could get away with in this situation. I would have preferred a real kiss, or, better yet, a dark corner. You are gorgeous. Is that a new dress? She smiled. It is. You like it? It's part of my honeymoon trousseau, but the seamstress allowed me to wear it early because this is a special occasion. When do you think Knox and Vancha will arrive? Rickard said they should be here any minute. They called when they reached the Deep River city limits. Be patient. I laughed, squeezing her tiny hand. If I didn't know how much you love me, I'd be jealous over how eager you are to see your old flame. She slapped lightly at my arm. Lad, I want to see both of them. I want to hear about Europe. And you do know how much I love you. I nodded, kissing her hand again before scanning the crowd. It looks like our esteemed guests are enjoying themselves. Ava and Cully were talking with a group of people. She looked especially nice tonight in a dramatic black gown that made her stand out among all the light-colored dresses. The females around her wouldn't be jealous of her wardrobe, though. They probably hadn't noticed it. Their eyes were firmly locked on Cully. With his thick, dark hair and deep tan, he was the perfect picture of a glamorous dark elf, dangerous and charming. He reminded me of Knox in many ways. A little too much for my liking, actually, especially when he trained his predatory eyes on Ryan. Her fingers, still laced through mine, tightened. They're here! She jumped up, pointing toward the ballroom doors. Knox and Vansha, they're here, come on! I laughed as I followed my gleeful companion across the dance floor. You know they're supposed to come to us. Don't get all high and mighty on me now. You're both kings. It doesn't matter whose court you're in. Reaching the new arrivals, we exchanged greetings and handshakes, or in Ryan's case, hugs all around. Wow, you look great, she told Vansha. You're so tan and relaxed looking. Have you been painting a lot? Yes, every day. It's been glorious, Van said, her eyes glowing. I set up a canvas along the Canal St. Martin in Paris, painted on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Italy is almost too much. There's more beauty there than an army of artists could ever begin to capture. I'm glad to be coming home for a few days, but I can't say I'll be sorry to head out again for the next leg of our tour. We're going to Asia next, China. I can't wait to learn some new painting techniques there. First, you'll have to fill us in on all the details of your trip so far, I said to her. Then, realizing my mistake, turned to Knox with a sheepish grin. How are you, brother? He laughed. <laughs> Very well. And you won't be getting all the details. You just have to wait for your own honeymoon to find some things out. That's not what I meant. I was speaking of the fan pod situation, of course. How are relations with the European tribes? You mentioned some resistance? Yeah, it turns out the French are very attached to the fan pod system. It's been a little harder to convince them than I'd hoped. But I think we're making progress. How's the domestic diplomacy going? His eyes scanned the room, no doubt in search of my new ambassador. Very well, I think. They're both pleasant enough. Knox's eyes came back to me. Both? What are you talking about? At that moment, Cully turned toward us, then whispered to Ava and tugged her across the room toward our group. Our ambassador brought a considerable bit of luggage, I said under my breath as they approached. Then, smiling widely, I started the conversation. Ava Morton and Cully Rune, I believe you already know Knox and Vansha Jarek. There was a tense silence as Cully and Knox stared at one another. 
Ava and Vancha shared a similarly hostile glance. Okay, so there may have been a little more history than I'd expected. Finally, Knox extended a hand to Cully. Auden didn't mention he was sending his own son to the light court as Ava's plus one. What an honor. Good to see you again after all these years, Cully. Oh, the honor's all mine. And believe me, no one was more surprised than I. Ava and I are betrothed, but father sprang the happy news of our trip on me at the very last moment. Of course, we know the Dark Council members sometimes keep things to themselves when it serves their purposes. He paused for effect. You're looking good for a dead man, my friend. You seem to have a talent for rebirth. Cully grinned, referring to Knox's surprise reappearance at the Summer Olympics following his supposed death in a high-speed car crash. No one but Vansha, Ryan, and I had known it was a ruse until he'd walked out on that stage, flanked by celebrities from around the globe. I take it your betrothal is a recent development. Knox's gaze slid from Cully to Ava. She answered, Yes, apparently Thora and Auden have had it in mind for years, but Cully was finishing his education at Eton and I was modeling. Now the time is right. Apparently, said Knox. Well, uh, congratulations to you both. I believe you already know my wife, he said to Ava. Yes, Ava said, her eyes dropping away from Vanch's unfriendly expression. Vancha, please accept my best wishes on your marriage. Vancha didn't even bother with a smile. I would, if I could believe anything you have to say. Ava's eyes flew back to Vancha, wide and horror-struck. The two girls shared a long look before Ava mumbled, Excuse me, and skittered away in the opposite direction. You must be wiped out after your trip, Fancha, Ryan said, breaking the awkward silence that followed. Let's get you some food and some sail water, maybe a glass of wine, or two. She tugged Vancha toward the table where a feast had been laid out for guests to peruse. Cully, Knox, and I all let out simultaneous laughs of discomfort. Well then, Cully said. It seems I have some ruffled feathers to smooth. See you boys later. He headed off in the direction Ava had gone. How are your feather smoothing skills? I asked Knox. He smiled at me and slapped me on the back. Getting better all the time. I hope you're brushing up on your own since you're about to be a married man. Let's go dance with our girls, huh? I turned to him, genuinely happy to see him again. Best idea I've heard all night. Chapter 16, Ava I had deserved Vance's remark, but that hadn't made it hurt any less. After what had happened in L.A., she believed I was a traitor, a horrible friend. That one hadn't been my fault. I had truly liked her and tried to be a friend to her during our time as roommates there. But then Davis had used his sway on me, and I'd found myself powerless to resist telling him everything Vansha had said and done, including some things she really didn't want him to know. Tonight, I would have no such excuse. No one was swaying me to do what I was about to do. Coercing me, maybe? But technically, I had a choice. I supposed I could defy Auden and just walk out of here, leave Lad and Knox to live and rule in peace, leave the royal couple to carry on with their plans to marry and live happily ever after. But then I pictured my mother being kicked out of the dark court, sent away to live the rest of her life alone with no support. I pictured my father's face and the way he'd cared for her, the way he'd always instilled in me that family should stick together. These people all hated me anyway. I laughed bitterly. Tonight, I guessed I'd at least earn their poor opinion of me. 
As Ladd and Knox made their way toward the buffet table and their significant others, I hurried to intercept them. Now that Knox's relationship was bonded and secure, my glamour would be wasted on him. That's why it was Ladd I touched on the arm. May I have a word with you in private? He glanced down at me, surprised, and then I saw concern cross his face. His gaze slid to Ryan, who was deep in conversation with Vansha. It's about what happened with Vansha, I offered. I'm afraid it may affect diplomatic relations between our courts. I need your advice. It will only take a moment. Lad nodded and then spoke to Knox. Tell her I'll be right there, would you? Giving his attention back to me, he seemed to have second thoughts. Maybe it would be better for you to speak to Vansha directly. I will. I just need a word with you first. It wasn't actually advice I needed. It was his undivided attention and a little information. Information I could erase from his mind and replace with something damaging. I sat at a table near the wall, gesturing for Lad to sit beside me. He took a seat, appearing stiff and distracted. He cast another glance in Ryan's direction and then turned his focus back to me. How can I help? There was that twinge again, that unwanted surge of regret, even before I'd done anything. Still, I pushed ahead. What is your most treasured memory of Ryan? He blinked, blinked again. What does that have to do with your quarrel with Vansha? I'll explain in a minute. I need an example so I can compare my situation to something to help you understand. He regarded me with narrowed eyes for a moment, but then answered my question. I was almost sorry he did. There are many, so it's hard to choose just one. But I would say it's probably our first kiss. Tell me about it. Why would you need to... Indulge me, I said. There's a point to this. Again, a cold, squirmy feeling passed through my insides at my deception. Well, I had rescued her from a near attack by coyotes, pulled her up into a treetop with me, revealing my inhuman attributes. I knew I was in trouble. A nostalgic smile spread across his face as his eyes gazed into the past. But not as much trouble as I was about to be in. I carried her to a safe spot, got her back to the ground. I was trying so hard to resist telling her anything. I definitely didn't plan to do it. I'd never kissed anyone, you see. The light elves don't. He looked at me to see if I already knew. Yes, I know. Go on. Right. I'd read about kissing in books. Also her fault. She had dropped her little fable and fairy tale book the night she was lost in the woods as a child, and I kept it. I learned to read English so I could communicate with her. Anyway, there she was, gazing up at me. So beautiful, I could hardly breathe. Begging me to open up to her. Our faces were close together, and her eyes closed, and I could hear her soft breaths. It was the best feeling I'd ever had in my life. The story was so sweet, I almost sighed. It was also full of ammunition for my own personal weapon. That's beautiful, I said aloud. Then to his mind, I spoke the words that would obliterate every lovely curve of those mental pictures. You never shared that first kiss. You never found that children's book. You learned to communicate the human way because your father was suspicious and needed you to spy on them. You met Ryan and you were curious, so you formed a tentative friendship in order to gather information for the light court. You found that you liked her but you've never fully trusted her. Humans can't be trusted after all. There are too many of them and too few of us. Lad stared at me, unblinking, and then took a sudden deep breath. What, what were you saying? He blinked rapidly now, 
his head turning from side to side as if he wasn't quite sure where he was. I had to strike again while he was off balance. What's your worst memory of her? Um, worst memory? I don't. Tell me now. What mental image nearly kills you every time it pops unwanted into your mind? Quickly. Still reeling from my memory-altering glamour, he answered, almost robotically. Seeing her with Knox. The two of them kissing in her yard on the swing. And then, in front of the campfire, the night she broke things off with me. She told me she loved him that day. And when I went to L.A. to warn her about her mother and Davis, I walked in on them. His voice drifted into silence. Walked in on what? What were they doing? He winced, as if giving voice to the words was physically painful. They were kissing. She was sitting on him. Her shirt was off. His hands were on her. Jackpot. Auden had been correct. He had heard from his mentor Davis that Knox and Ryan had been romantically involved. And he was right about another thing. Those memories were painful enough to drive a wedge between the light and dark kings so wide it would never be bridged. All I had to do was get out the mental crowbar and go to work. Listen to me, lad. Every time you look at Ryan, you will see Knox's hands on her skin, his head bent over her. You'll hear the sounds of his lips on her body and her sighs of pleasure. Lad frowned, his eyes tightly closed. He shook his head, groaning. He was fighting me. No, uh, but they didn't. Maybe they did. Or maybe they did everything but. Maybe she's given him what she's never given you. What she'll never give you now, because her heart belongs to him, and she secretly longs for him whenever she's with you. He moaned, his eyes still shut. I did catch them in bed the night Davis sent his men to attack us. She thought I was dead, and she was in bed with him. That's right. What do you think happened in that bed, huh? You know Knox's reputation. You've seen how women react to him. As far as Ryan and Knox knew, your body wasn't even cold, and they were wrapped up in each other's arms. I was improvising now, but it seemed to be working. She couldn't wait for you to be out of the picture so she could be back with Knox, the one she really wanted. She dreams of his touch, his kiss. How could she not? I watched a tear slide down Lad's handsome cheek and knew I'd succeeded. Real or implanted, memories could be so powerful. They worked hand in hand with your most glorious life experiences or your most haunting fears, growing, branching off, painting new pictures in your mind. The result could be a breathtaking masterpiece or a horror show. Thanks to me, Lad's mental reel was now set on a constant loop of pain and betrayal. God, what have I done? Shaken, I touched Lad's hand to awaken him from the near-hypnotic state I'd put him in. He opened his eyes and stared at me, his expression blurred with disorientation. Thank you for all your advice, I said, making my tone bright and casual, though sickness swamped my belly. Shall we get back to the party? Where is everyone? Oh, there they are. Cully and Vansha are getting to know one another. And I believe Knox is dancing with your fiancé. Don't they move well together? Lad followed my line of sight and literally growled before standing abruptly and stalking out of the ballroom. I stood slowly, staring after him, filled with despair. I'd done my job, and now I hated myself. A voice at my ear made me startle. 
I see we've been a busy little worker bee tonight. Cully, and his tone was so smug. Mummy will be very proud. Care to dance, love? I believe we have reason to celebrate. I turned and regarded his glib expression. How do you live with it? With what? He smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. The aftermath. The destruction. Pulling me into a slow dance, he whispered the answer in my ear. Try not to focus on all that. It's better to just enjoy the spoils of war. I know I'll be enjoying mine tonight. His eyes drifted over to Ryan, who was turning around in a circle on the dance floor, obviously searching for Lad. An ice-cold sensation filled my chest. What are you going to do, Cully? His gaze came back to me, and he gave me a fiendish smile. The same thing you're going to do. Throw an after-party. By tomorrow, we should both be able to go home. Chapter 17, Ryan Where's Lad going? Vancha asked, turning toward the back of the ballroom. I spun around to see a glimpse of his golden head as he left through the ceiling height double doors. I don't know. I'll go check on him. He's fine, Knox assured me. I'm sure it's some bit of business. Nobody makes a decision around here without checking with him. <laughs> Wish it was the same in the dark court. Bunch of greedy renegades. He laughed. If he's not back soon, I'll go and rescue him. I need you to stay here and prevent a catfight between my wife and Ava. Following his gaze, I spotted Ava and Cully dancing together. Both of them glanced furtively over at our group as they spoke in hushed tones. What happened between you two anyway? I asked Vansha. She pretended to be my friend, and then she betrayed me. Davis had her spy on me when I went out to California to start modeling. She told him everything I said, everything I did. He treated me like a virtual prisoner after that. Oh, now I see why you acted so weird when you saw her. She told me she was sorry a few minutes ago, you know, mind to mind. But it's a little too late for that. I don't trust her. You shouldn't either. I don't have to trust her, I said. I trust Lad. Fancha nodded in agreement. You should, but I'd keep an eye on her anyway. Although, I guess I can't blame her for everything. She said Davis made her talk with his sway. You know how powerful he was. That's true, honey, Knox said, wrapping an arm around Vancha's waist and pressing a kiss to her temple. Only Ryan was able to resist his glamour. Let's hope Lad can resist her glamour, I muttered, watching Ava's gorgeous red hair swing in a thick curtain as Cully spun her. Her figure was elven perfection in the clingy black dress she wore tonight. Lad loved me, but he wasn't blind. There was no not noticing that girl. What do you mean? Knox asked, suddenly keenly interested in the conversation. Do you think she's here to spy on him? She's supposed to be an ambassador. His glower indicated someone on the Dark Council was going to get their ear chewed off, or worse, when he got out to California, or the next time he could get a good cell signal. I'm not exactly sure what her intentions are, I said, but Lad acts weird around her. I'm sure the sexual glamour isn't helping. Knox looked at me strangely his heavy, dark brows drawn together, shaking his head. She doesn't have sexual glamour. But she's always flirting with Lad, and he's... I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what else to make of the distraction I'd witnessed in him since her arrival. Are you sure? Knox's expression confirmed it, and he should know. She doesn't have it. And even if she did, you'd have nothing to worry about. 
The boy is whipped for you. So true, Vancha added, laying her head on Nox's chest. So if that's not her glamour, what is? Nox shrugged. Thora's never said. When I get to L.A., I can ask her, or Auden, in person, mind to mind. Before then, we could try asking Ava, but we can't be sure of an honest answer. A while later, Lad re-entered the ballroom and surveyed it, catching sight of me. I smiled at him, but his expression stayed stern. His glance went to Knox, then Ava. Then he walked over to a group of people and started talking with them. Troubled, I left Knox and Ava to join Lad. I'll talk to y'all later. Enjoy the party. As I came to his side, he glanced down at me and nodded, then continued the conversation he was having with a member of his council. Since I couldn't hear their communication, I stood there quietly, waiting, and feeling more awkward around Lad than I'd felt in months. In fact, other than our breakup, things had never been this strained between us. Something was off about him. There was a coldness that frightened me. When he and the man finally wrapped things up, Lad turned and looked at me directly. His eyes roamed over me, and for a moment, his face warmed. Then the uncharacteristic frown returned. Excuse me, I see someone I must speak with privately. He started to walk away, but I wrapped my hand around his wrist to stop him. Lad, is everything all right? He glanced at my hand on him, then back at my face. Yes, of course. Why? You just seem, I don't know. With a flick of his wrist, he broke my grip. I'm busy, Ryan. I have obligations. You're going to have to be understanding if you're to be queen here. I've certainly been understanding with you. I did a double blink almost speechless with surprise. What? What does that mean? He stared at me for a moment, then shook his head and blew out an irritated breath. Nothing. I have to go. Why don't you find your friends, Vansha, and Knox? Stunned, I wandered away and made a plate of food I didn't actually want to eat. Spooning various items onto the dish, I did a little calming self-talk. Lad is busy. This isn't a party to him, it's work. As Knox said, many people needed him. I couldn't monopolize his time, and I wouldn't pout about it. This was his life. If I wanted to be a part of it, I had to share him with his people. Thinking back over our interactions at the beginning of the evening, I racked my brain for anything I could have done to upset him. Everything had been fine. Lad had complimented my dress, looked at me in that loving way he always did. He had made a remark about me being eager to see Knox, but he was clearly joking. And he'd been as thrilled to see Knox and Vancha as I was. A while later, when Lad seemed more relaxed, talking and laughing with someone, I approached him again, just to be near him. He all but ignored me. I walked away and took a seat at an open table near the orchestra, working hard to keep myself from overreacting or crying. Busy or not, he was being rude. He wasn't acting like himself. It was too much like the worst time in our relationship when he drove me away purposely. The chair beside me moved and Vancha sat down. What's going on? You bored with all this elven nonsense yet? I looked into her eyes, absorbing the desperately needed kindness. Something's wrong. What do you mean? She glanced around. Did Ava do something? No, it's Lad. Something's wrong with him. He's not acting right. His face doesn't look right. Her eyes searched the ballroom and found him now speaking to Ava, Cully was beside her, yawning and rolling his shoulders, obviously bored out of his mind. Ava dipped her gaze and then threw her head back in a laugh. Lad grinned at her like she was the most adorable thing he'd ever seen. 
He loves you, Ryan. Only you, Bancha said. Trust me on that one. Thinking of his beautiful handmade wedding gift, the words he'd written, I said, I know, but he sure isn't acting like it tonight. He must have a lot on his mind. Nock said he bit his head off a little while ago, too. She patted my hand resting on the tabletop. It's not easy being with a king, is it? They've got so many demands on their time. Knox has spent half of our honeymoon running around negotiating with the European tribes, whining and dining their leaders. And I've already done enough hostessing to last me a lifetime. But you're not sorry that you married him? She laughed. <laughs> I'm so in love with him, I can hardly see straight. And the other half of the honeymoon? Let's just say it makes it all worthwhile. Her blissful smile filled me with envy. She and Knox had what I so desperately wanted with Lad. Closeness. Bonding. Eternity. His frosty demeanor tonight made it feel like a dream that would never come true. I was overcome with a desperate wish that we'd already bonded, so nothing could threaten to tear us apart. I sighed, and it must have been pretty loud because Vancha patted my hand again. Then she looked at me speculatively. Ryan, have you two, uh... Reading her face, I gathered her meaning without her having to say it. No, not for my lack of trying. Lad wants to wait until we're married. The Light Elves are old school, all right. She paused as if considering whether to say any more. You know, one thing that always works for me is a sheer nightgown. Bancha! My cheeks instantly went hot, and my eyes felt like they were bulging out of my head. My gaze went to the floor, the tablecloth, the dancers. She laughed out loud. I'm telling you, it gets Knox's mind off of business and back where it belongs, with me. And he's so much more relaxed and fun afterward. I have a brand new nightgown in my suitcase that I bought in Paris. It was going to be a bridal shower present for you, but you can have it early if you'd like to try it. I shook my head, my heart pounding. I can't. Bancha once again glanced over in Lad's direction. You sure about that, girlfriend? I followed her gaze to see Ava now practically draped across Lad's body she was standing so close. Cully had disappeared. Knox was wrong about that sexual glamour. What else could it be? Where is it? I asked, getting to my feet. In your room? Vancha grinned and pushed back from the table. Follow me. Chapter 18, Ryan. The nightgown was exquisite. And as advertised, it was sheer. I stared at myself in the full-length mirror, the contours of my body clearly visible beneath the delicate fabric. When Lat saw me in this, if he saw me in this, there'd be no doubt in his mind what I was there for. I still hadn't made up my mind to wear it. I'd followed Vancha to her room, accepted her generous gift, and then gone back to my own suite to try it on. My thoughts were racing almost as ferociously as my heart. What if somebody caught me sneaking into Lad's room? Well, most everyone was still at the banquet. And really, what were they going to say? No, I was the king's betrothed. I had a right to come and go as I pleased. What if the nightgown worked and Lad and I got started and I messed things up somehow? I really didn't know what I was doing. He was already in a bad mood. What if I made things worse? And that brought me to my chief concern. What if he saw me in this transparent gift wrap and turned me away? I'd never be able to look into his eyes again. This whole scheme could blow up in my face. But what if he did like it? 
I spun around and peeked over my shoulder to check out the back view. Okay, then. What if Lad saw me and wanted me and things went right? All this worry for the future and concern over his recent behavior would be gone. We'd be bonded for life this very night. And in just over a month, we'd be married. I wrapped a heavy robe around myself to hide the naughty secret underneath and let that happy thought propel me out of my room and down the hallway toward Lad's quarters. My breaths were quick and shallow as I scanned the corridors, praying I wouldn't run into a servant or, God forbid, Lad's mother. Pulse racing, I stole through the dim hallways like a cat burglar, jumping at the slightest faraway noise or flicker of light. I ended up seeing no one. Reaching Lad's door, I pushed it open and peeked inside. Empty. He was still out, just as I'd hoped. I slipped inside and shut the door behind me, still hardly able to believe I was here. My heartbeat thrummed not just in my chest, but in every part of me. Before, when we discussed bonding before marriage, it was just that, a discussion. I was hoping there would be no discussion tonight. If Lad saw me in this and wanted to talk, we had a problem. For a few minutes, I paced the room, nervous and unsure of what to do with myself. The lighting provided by the phosphorescent stones was already perfect, romantic, and low. Mood music wasn't exactly an option here with no electronics. That was probably cheesy anyway, right? I went to his bed and stretched out on top of the coverlet, experimenting with poses. Should I lie on my side, facing the doorway? So he'd see me there when he first walked in? Should I get under the covers? No, that would defeat the purpose of the nightgown. The debate ended when I heard the door opening. Without even thinking about it, I shot off the bed and stood in front of it with my bare feet and might as well be bare body, my thoughts scrambling and my heart whizzing around my chest like an entire pack of fireworks that had been lit from the same fuse. Lad entered the room and turned to close the door, his wide shoulders slumping with relief. Then he turned around and froze in place. Hi, I said, the word strangled and barely audible. His eyes traveled over my body, blazing with heat and giving me hope. He liked what he saw, or at least I thought he did. My emotional glamour was overwhelmed by a sense of yearning I was pretty sure was his, could have been mine. He looked incredible standing there in his formal attire with raging desire in his eyes. I was as scared as I'd ever been in my life. I felt so vulnerable standing before him, basically naked, waiting for him to respond. I took a tentative step toward him. He took one toward me. Lad swallowed hard, his Adam's apple moving under the smooth, tanned skin of his throat. His voice was rough and low. Why are you here, Ryan? I... I had to stop and swallow, too. My mouth had gone completely dry. Then I glanced down at myself, thinking it had to be pretty obvious why I was here. Finally, I managed to speak. My voice was shaking. I love you, lad. And I want you. Like, I've never wanted anything anything before in my life. I want to be yours completely, forever. Let's not wait anymore. Make me yours. Make love to me. The wait for his response was excruciating. I watched his eyes as they warmed and filled with unmistakable anticipation. He took another step toward me, closed the distance between us, and reached for me. His fingers coasted lightly over my bare arm, then traced the plunging neckline of the gown. He licked his lips and took a shuddering breath as he pushed one tiny strap from my shoulder. His gaze was riveted to my chest. Yes, yes, oh God, finally. And then he stopped. His eyelids closed. He scowled and a full-body shudder passed through him. He fell back a step, his hand dropping away from me. 
I think you should leave. The breath I'd been holding left me in a painful gust. I could barely manage to ask, Really? You should go, Ryan. I'm tired. It's been a long day. He turned and walked away from me toward a chair on the opposite side of the room, gripping it so hard I heard the wood crack. His arms were so tense they shook. Alarmed and no longer the least bit turned on, I followed him. Lad, what is the matter? I pleaded for an explanation. What's going on with you? Talk to me. He wouldn't look at me. Just go, Ryan. We'll talk in the morning. His tone was so angry. I had expected some resistance, maybe, but not fury. Was he that serious about waiting? Or was it something else? Someone else? I wanted a second opinion on whether that little witch Ava had sexual glamour. She'd done something to him. I was sure of it. And I'd made a huge mistake coming here. Humiliated, I drew on the robe and left the room, casting a last glance back before leaving. Lad was still facing the wall, not even watching me go. What the hell was going on? There was desire in his eyes. I'd seen it. I'd felt his longing for me. How could he just send me away like this with no answers? Battling my tear ducts, I rushed through the dark hallways, desperate for the sanctuary of my own room, where I could let the tears flow freely. This had been the night from hell, and I just wanted it to end. I rounded the last corner before reaching my room and ran straight into someone. Assuming it was a servant, I backed away and stammered, I I'm so sorry. Cully's concerned face stared down at me. His hands came to my upper arms, steadying me. Ryan? Are you all right there, sweetheart? I shrugged from his touch. I'm fine. Good night. I moved to walk around him, but he sidestepped into my path. Hold on now. I don't think you are fine. You've been crying. Noticing the way his gaze wandered down my front, I looked down and snatched my robe back into place. Our collision had apparently knocked it askew, giving him an eyeful of something meant only for my fiancé. Of what he'd just turned down, rather. Glancing down the hallway in the direction from which I'd just come, Cully's eyes took on a new gleam. They came back to meet mine. You know, if you showed up in my room looking so utterly tempting, there's no way in hell I would have sent you away. A loud crack echoed through the hall as my palm met his cheek. I hadn't meant to slap him. It had just happened. Cully was always flirtatious, but that was just plain mean, and my emotions were all haywire. Mind your own business, I spat out and charged away toward my room, shaking my stinging hand. Now the tears did flow, breaking through all of my control mechanisms, that was just perfect. I was being propositioned by someone who was betrothed to another woman, and I couldn't get my own fiancé to sleep with me. Passing a room that served as an overflow pantry, I spotted a tray full of wine glasses. I knew they were intended for the banquet, but no one needed a drink more than I did at the moment. I stepped inside, and peeking around to make sure I wasn't observed, swiped two of them. One of them was drained before I'd even reached my bedroom door. The other glass, I almost dropped. Because when I stepped into my room, Lad was waiting for me. Chapter 19, Ryan. Lad, I yelped. You scared me. What are you doing in here? Standing deep inside the room, he crooked a finger at me in a gesture to come closer. The lights were turned down very low. He'd obviously covered most of the glowing stones in my lamp face. Only the gleam of his blonde curls and white teeth were clearly visible. That, and the outline of his magnificent body. He was fully undressed, 
the glow of the colored stones gilding the cut of his muscles. He was perfect. The wide shoulders, the long legs, and tightly sculpted midsection. Mesmerized, I closed the door and moved toward him. As soon as I got close, he grabbed me and dragged me to him, kissing me with near frenzied passion. My heart pounded as if it would burst. Where had this come from? What had changed his mind? At the moment, it didn't seem as important as his lips moving hotly with mine and his hands roaming freely under my robe. He pushed it from my shoulders and it fell in a heap at my heels. When he moved his mouth from my lips to my throat, I moaned with excitement, giving in to the pleasure. It was finally happening. He wasn't rejecting me. Lad was on fire, acting nothing like his usual responsible, cautious self. When you sent me away, I gasped, I thought you didn't want me. He whispered a response against my neck between kisses. I was an idiot. Relief and arousal flowed through me as he swept me off my feet and carried me to the bed. He set me on the mattress and in one swift move yanked the flimsy nightgown over my head. As I lay there, bared before him, ready to give him my body, my soul, my love forever, Lad sat back on his knees and stared down, drinking in the sight of me. But he didn't touch me. He loomed above me, hands clenched on his own thighs. His chest rose and fell, his accelerated breathing loud in the quiet room. Oh no, not again. What are you waiting for? I prompted mind to mind. You do want me, don't you? Another few seconds passed before he answered. You are tempting, love. Taking you now would almost make this whole permanent mark business worthwhile. My body went rigid, my fingertips digging into the bed covers. His voice was wrong, and the words had been pronounced with a distinct Australian accent. Chapter 20 Ava. Dread slowed my steps as I walked toward Lad's room. I had waited for Cully's signal before leaving the banquet. He told me he'd seen Ryan leave the ball early with Fanshawe and suspected the two girls may have caught on to us. Now I was creeping through the royal residence like a beady-eyed mouse or a rat. Unfortunately, my mission hadn't ended with manipulating Lad's existing memories. That was bad enough, but apparently I was required to go above and beyond the call and make certain the Light King's brains were scrambled by going to his room tonight and implanting some entirely new false memories. When I was done, he'd no doubt kick Knox and Vancha out of Altum along with Ryan, which was the whole point of my mission, actually. Part of me hoped I'd get there to find him in bed with his fiancée. Not likely, after the mental poison I'd injected. He'd find it hard to even look at Ryan without putting his fist through a wall. Guilt assaulted me again. Poor girl. I'd seen her face at the ball when Lad had been so aloof toward her. She'd be primed and exceptionally vulnerable to Cully's plan of attack, especially with his glamour. What did he look like to Ryan? He probably appeared to be a clone of Lad. I shivered at the creep factor of it. Just do your job, Ava. These people are not your concern. Think of your family. I shook off the shame and continued toward Lad's quarters, wondering how I'd contend with the inevitable guards when I got to his door. But the weirdest thing happened. Before I even reached his corridor, I spotted him running toward me in the hall. I moved into his path and put my hands out, stopping him. Hi, where are you going so late? I asked him in as casual a tone as I could produce. Lad looked terrible. His hair was disheveled as if he'd run his hands through it a hundred times. His eyes were wild. To find Ryan. She came to me and I, I don't know what's going on with me. I heard her feelings. I didn't mean to. She looked so good and I, I wanted, but then 
I thought I was over the thing with her and Knox, but it's like, it's haunting me. It's all I can think of. Maybe it's just cold feet or something. I know she doesn't want him, but I keep seeing them together. I keep trying to think of something else, of the good times, but it all just seems kind of bad now. I don't know. He stopped rambling and stared at me wide-eyed as if just realizing I was there. Ava, I'm sorry. I'm not feeling very well. I think I might have had something to drink tonight that didn't agree with me. I'm really confused. There was no doubt my glamour had worked exactly as intended. Lad was a mess. It wouldn't take much more to seal the deal. Well, maybe we should talk for a minute and let you get your head straight before you go running off after her. Regarding me again with bleary eyes, he nodded. Okay. I patted his arm and led him to sit with me on a bench in an alcove of the hall. Now, what's the problem? She came to you tonight, and you didn't want her? Maybe it's a good thing you figured that out before you married her, right? It's not something to take lightly, you know? Lad glared at me. I do want her. I love her. Okay. Okay, I said. I took a second to gird myself for what I had to do next. Lad's mind was in such a fragile state, all I had to do was turn my glamour up a few more notches, and I could remove every good memory he'd ever had of Ryan and amplify every bad one he'd ever had of Knox. I could erase every proof of love she'd ever given him, strip away his reasons for wanting her, and obliterate his relationship with his brother as well. It was, after all, what I was here to do, it was what I was good at, the only thing I was really good at. And it was too late to turn back now. I'd already done more harm than could ever be forgiven. I inhaled deeply and covered one of his large hands with mine. Lad, why do you suppose you sent her away? Is it because she doesn't love you? Then Lad said something that stole my breath away. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if she loves me. He shook his head, his voice changing, rising in tone and volume, as if he was just coming to a new understanding. It doesn't matter what she's done or what she will do. I love her no matter what. I always will. I've only ever wanted her. I'll never be able to want anyone else. If she won't forgive me for the way I've acted tonight, for rejecting her, then I'll just be alone. I won't take a wife, ever. I won't have an heir. My family's reign on the light throne will end with me. I was too stunned to speak. Of all the people whose minds I'd altered, he was the only one who hadn't changed course, who hadn't immediately cooperated and aided in his own destruction. He was confused. He was a disoriented disaster. But he still loved her. Lad finally lifted his eyes. Do you think it's too late? I stared at him, my mouth opening and closing in silence. The word yes waited there on my tongue. The false memories crouched just behind it, ready to invade his brain, to wreck and ruin what was left of his life. I knew I had to do it. But I couldn't. Instead, I grabbed his arm and jumped to my feet. We have to get to Ryan's room right now, I shouted. It might already be too late. Chapter 21, Lad. I broke into a sprint, not even asking Ava for details. The tone of her voice told me enough. Ryan was in danger. A flood of adrenaline screamed through my veins. My heart pumped like it never had in my life. In minutes, I reached her door and threw it open. It hit the wall with a crash as I charged inside. Ryan! There was a sound of surprise, sort of a hoarse shout. The voice was male. The room was unusually dark, and I scrambled toward the vase of glowing rocks, 
ripping off the drape that covered it. And there on Ryan's bed were two people, shock painted across their faces. One of them was Knox. No, wait, it was Cully. They looked like freaking twins. He was unclothed and kneeling. His surprise morphed into a delighted smile as he recognized me. Straddled beneath him was Ryan's naked form. She was absolutely beautiful, despite her horrified expression. She bolted upright. Lad! A ragged cry shook the walls. More of a roar, actually. It took me a second to realize it had come from me. I whirled and tore from the room, unwilling to see any more of the horrible picture. I had seen more than enough. Ryan's plaintive voice came from behind me, stopping me. She'd followed me. Lad, lad, please, come back. We didn't bond. I was going to. I thought it was you. I spun around and gave a harsh, anguished laugh. Right. You mean you thought it was Knox? He looks just like the backstabbing bastard. She stood naked in the hallway, weeping before me with her hands outstretched in front of her. Her eyes were wide, her voice desperate sounding. No, lad, I thought he was you, I swear it. Until he spoke, and then I knew, please, please believe me. She sounded so distressed. Her face was so destroyed. I wanted to believe her. My heart was torn to shreds, but still the pieces of it pulled in her direction. And then I heard that cocky little pretty boy laughing on the other side of the doorway, and my blood boiled. I don't know what to believe anymore, Ryan, but I'll tell you one thing. Every time I look at you, all I can see is some other guy between your legs. Don't follow me. And put some clothes on. You'll need them when you leave Altum tonight. Her keening wail ripped at my insides as I strode away. But it did not stop me from going. Chapter 22 Ava What were you doing? I demanded, watching Cully roll off the bed and get to his feet. He strode toward me, his expression fixed in its usual unreadable mask. What are you doing? You interrupted some of my best work. You weren't supposed to, to rape her. You were supposed to get her all mixed up. Don't be silly. I wasn't raping her. We were just having some fun. I raised an eyebrow and gave his naked body a significant once over. Cully chuckled. Yeah, well. He walked over to a pair of pants draped across a chair, pulling them on in the leisurely manner of someone who felt no need to hide his nakedness. I wouldn't have let it go all the way. I have no wish to be eternally bonded to someone who's lovesick over another bloke. For your information, I tipped her off just moments before you two barged in here like the cavalry. She was no doubt about to throw me out on my finely formed ass. Anyway, this has worked out quite handily, I think, if that god-awful screeching is any indication. Lifting his shirt from the chair, he nodded toward the hall outside where Ryan's heartbroken wail still echoed. I stood for a moment, listening as my insides sank, then studying his nonchalant expression. So like his depraved father's. Was this really what my glamour gift was meant for? Serving that madman? Torturing people? Destroying relationships? Breaking hearts? I'm going to help them. Cully's wide-eyed stare met mine. Come again, love? I said, I'm going to help them. I'm going to tell her what I've done, what my glamour is. Yours too. He froze in place, his jaw literally dropping. Are you insane? Has all this underground living got you completely starkers? His arms waved wildly around his head. Lack of oxygen getting to you? You can't do that. 
you'll be banished for treason. My heartbeat whipped in my chest like a lifeguard flag during a hurricane. But now that I'd said it out loud, I couldn't get the idea out of my mind. I stood straighter, lifting my chin. I don't care. And what do you care? You didn't finish your mission either. You bailed at the last second. I pointed toward the rumpled and now empty bed. Cully sauntered toward me, barefoot, his shirt still hanging open to reveal his perfectly cut chest and abs. His bold expression told me he was well aware of how much I appreciated the view, just like everyone else. That wasn't my mission. I haven't even begun my mission yet. That was just for fun. And so is this. He wrapped a hand around the back of my head and pulled my face to his, taking my mouth in a blistering kiss. I was so shocked that at first I did nothing to stop him. The scent and taste of him was so alluring, it was almost impossible to resist. But then I came to my senses and broke the contact, shoving him away. I added an extra push for emphasis. You're disgusting, you know that? I'm not one of your pathetic little groupies or your next mission. And I'm definitely not just another place to stick that lying tongue of yours. I stormed out of the room, grabbing Ryan's robe on the way, and went into the hall where she was still crumpled on the floor, weeping quietly now. Wrapping the shielding garment around her, I coaxed her to sit up and then get to her feet. She allowed me to walk her into her bedroom like someone in a catatonic state. It was empty. Cully had slipped out already, thank God. Leading her to the bed, I helped her sit and then pulled the bed coverings over her lap. Ryan, can I get you something? She shook her head, not looking at me. Her movements were robotic, as if there might not be a life force inside her body anymore. It was frightening to witness, and I was responsible. You sure you don't want a drink of water or something? I started searching the room. There had to be a pitcher of sail water around here somewhere. I spotted one on a table in the corner and headed for it. My clothes. Ryan's voice was a hoarse whisper, barely audible. I spun around again to face her. You want your clothes? She nodded weakly. I'm leaving. He told me to leave. Snatching her clothes from the floor, I took them to her and pressed them into her hands. I kneeled in front of her so she'd be forced to see my face. He didn't mean it. You should stay. I'm going to help you straighten this out. Her eyes didn't meet mine. No, there's nothing you can do. He hates me. He told me to leave. Ryan, listen to me. He's confused. I can help you. I hope. Finally, her gaze lifted. Her eyes were swollen and wet. She looked like she hadn't slept in days. What are you talking about? I squinted as I confessed. I may have some idea why Lad is acting strangely. She gave me an alert look, obviously waiting for me to continue. My glamour. You see, I'm able to work with people's memories. Her eyebrows pulled together. Work with them? Yes, I can, you know, remove them? I paused. Or add them. You can erase people's memories, she said, as if understanding was just dawning. A flicker of life entered her face. You erased Lad's memories? I did. And I enhanced some. I'm sorry. I thought I was doing what I had to do, my duty. But then I felt bad about it. Once I got to know you both, I felt bad. Now I had her full attention. Her voice was soft, still ragged with spent emotion, but deadly serious. Her gaze burned into me. Which memories did you enhance, Ava? I can fix it. Which memories? 
she demanded. The ones of you and Knox. Oh, my God. Ryan's eyelids closed and her head dropped back on her shoulders. No wonder he's been so upset. She brought her gaze back to me. That is not even... It's old news. It was glamour-induced. I didn't love Knox. I always loved Lad. I know that. Lad knew it, too. He really fought me on it. For a while. My stomach turned at the sound of my own voice. God, I'm as much a monster as Auden. How could I have ever agreed to go along with this? Ryan stared at me for almost a full minute without speaking. Then she said, Get out. What? Get out. I don't want to see you anymore. I don't want to see your face. And once I tell Knox what you've done, that you came here under false pretenses and used your glamour against Lad, I doubt you'll want to hang around for long. No, you need my help, don't you see? I want to make it right. I've changed my mind. I don't want to work for the Dark Council anymore. She glared at me. You, Davis, Cully, all the Dark Elves I've met so far are the same, full of tricks and lies. Just leave, Ava, while Knox will still let you. Unless you've screwed with his mind, too. No, I haven't. I didn't manipulate anyone but Lad. I'm sorry, Ryan. I really am. I have changed. She looked at me as if I were a snake or some disgusting bug. You'll never change. For a moment, I felt my heart stop. Then I rose to my feet, turned around, and staggered out the door. Where could I go? I couldn't stay here, clearly. I couldn't go home, either. I'd already confessed my intention to commit treason to Cully, and now I told Ryan exactly what I'd done to Lad. I couldn't face my mother, knowing what I'd done to her by this failure, and the thought of standing before Auden to account for it, frankly, terrified me. The scariest thing of all was the idea that what Ryan had said about me might be true. I'd never change. I'd always be exactly what I was now. My mother's crutch. Auden's pawn. Cully's unwanted fiancé. I didn't want that. I didn't want to hurt people. I didn't want to be used anymore. But there was nowhere for me now. I was out of options. Chapter 23, Lad Not even sure where I was going, I moved aimlessly through Altum, ducking my head away whenever I'd pass someone, not interested in talking or even making eye contact. Thankfully, there were few people out and about at this late hour. I ended up down by the river, stopping on the bridge to stare morosely into its dark depths. What was it Ava had said about memories when we'd strolled here during the tour? Some memories are so deep they seem to have no beginning and no end. I wished the memories gnashing around in my mind would end. I wasn't sure how much more I could take. I had tried to sleep to no avail. All I could see when I closed my eyes was Ryan's inconsolable expression. All I could hear in the silence of my room were her desperate pleas. That's when I'd left the palace and started walking, trying to wear myself out, trying to forget. From the river, I wandered up the path toward the caves where the sailwater went through its final stages of production. The air surrounding them was sweet as always, but I took no pleasure in the familiar fragrance. Nothing would ever smell good or taste good or be good again. 
There was no joy left in life. The past was a nightmare. The present was unrelenting agony. And I couldn't even bear to think ahead toward a life without Ryan. The sugar-making fires were dark at this hour, the workers either attending the banquet or home in their beds. As I passed, the copper bowls barely shone with a dull reflection of the glowing stones I held for light. If only sail water could cure what ailed me now. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I loved Ryan. But I hated her. I wanted her fiercely. But touching her made me sick with disgust. Why couldn't I just forget the past and move on with her, with my future? She was my future. Or so I'd thought. If I couldn't get these negative thoughts out of my mind, I wouldn't be able to stand being around her. Or Knox. Just thinking about the two of them was getting my blood simmering again. I shook my head, trying to clear it, and trudged forward. A metallic clank made me spin back toward the caves. Someone was exiting them, crouched low and moving quickly. I squinted to see him more clearly. Knox? I shouted. What the hell are you doing in there? I ran after him and grabbed the back of his cloak, suddenly very glad to have run into him. I had a few things to say to this conniving, girlfriend-stealing, so-called brother of mine. I jerked him back and dragged him roughly around to face me. Oh, hello, your majesty. Lovely night for a walk. Cully Rune. He had the nerve to smile at me. It was only in the interest of preventing a full-scale elven civil war that I didn't beat him until those perfect white teeth were buried in his spleen somewhere. On second thought, maybe I would. My fist was cocked and ready. Why are you stalking around here in the middle of the night? I demanded. I thought you had enough sense to be long gone by now. I was just, you know, looking for a drink? He shrugged, culpability creeping across his face. That's a lie. The palace is full of sail water. All you had to do was ring for a servant, and you would have had it in minutes. I know. Excellent staff you have there, by the way. I just, after our tour the other day, I was curious to know what it would taste like, fresh from the tap, so to speak. I wanted to try it before getting on my way. But it seems things are rather dead here now, so I was toddling off toward home, to pack. He backed away, slipping out of my grip. I'll wish you good night then. Rather tired. Busy day. He gave me an insolent grin and turned to go. I tackled him and threw him to the ground, pinning him beneath me before I even knew what had happened. Inter-elven relations were quickly plummeting to the bottom of my list of concerns. Busy, huh? My fist slammed into his cheek, and the violence felt so good, so satisfying. I bet you're tired after all your activities tonight, after seducing my fiancé. Picturing him looming above Ryan's naked body, I hit him again in the face. One of his forearms came up to block my next blow, while his other fist crashed into my ribcage. I lurched forward in pain seeing stars. I didn't take it all the way, I swear, he said, rolling and throwing me off of him. You are a bloody big bastard, aren't you? Now the two of us crouched, face to face, breathing hard as we circled each other, scanning for a way past the other's defenses. Cully swiped at his bleeding lip with one hand, backing toward the open mouth of the cave. I'm not sure why you'd still care about the little half-breed, though. She's your brother's sloppy seconds. He gave me a red-tinted grin. And now mine, too. If I'd had my dagger with me, I wouldn't have hesitated to throw it straight at his heart. This arrogant filth deserved to die, no matter who his daddy was. If it caused a war, so be it. I charged him. He must have known I would. 
Cully roared as he swung with all his force. There was a flash of copper and then an explosion of pain before everything went dark and I dropped to the ground. When I opened my eyes again, Ryan's face hovered above me, tears streaked and alight with relief. Oh, lad, thank God. What happened to you? Chapter 24, Ryan Since Lad was basically immobile and unable to resist, I kissed his face over and over again, taking care to avoid the goose egg-sized lump on his forehead. Its color had deepened from light blue to purple since his guards had first carried him through the front doors of the royal residence. Who did this to you? I asked. Can you speak? He tried to sit up and looking nauseous, laid down again. His hand came to the wound on his head, probing gingerly. Where is Cully Rune? He growled. My eyelids flew open. Cully attacked you? I don't know where he is. Guards! I turned and silently communicated with two of the royal guard who were standing watch inside the door of Lad's room. Turning my attention back to Lad, I asked, how are you feeling? Wickthorn was here and applied some medicine to your head, but it still looks pretty bad. What did Cully hit you with? A copper bowl, I think. That makes sense. Your guards were searching for you. They found you down by the sailwater processing room. What were you doing there, lad? What was Cully doing there? Do you think it was an assassination attempt? I was taking a walk trying to clear my head. I'm not sure what he was doing there, though I would love to know. Maybe he was following me. Was he apprehended? Not as far as I know. No one had any idea who'd done this to you, so no one's been looking for him. I told them to find Cully just now. Taking in the vision of his battered face, my eyes filled with tears. I was so scared when they carried your body in here last night, I confessed. I wouldn't be able to go on if our last words to each other had been so... I got choked up and couldn't continue. Lad's eyes softened, filling with the warmth they usually held for me. His hand came up to stroke my cheek. Ryan, I'm sorry. Cully told me you didn't... Well, I should have known better anyway. I should have listened to you when you told me he tricked you. It was just seeing you like that. I've been having a hard time with old memories lately, and he looks so much like Knox. I just... What? No. I shook my head, baffled. He looks just like you. That's why I thought it was you in the dark. Lad's brows pulled together in confusion, and he winced from the pain. What is going on here? Is he an illusionist? Is that how he tricked you? I'm not sure, but I do know that Ava tricked you. She told me last night. She's been influencing your mind, shaping and changing your memories, especially about us. What do you remember about us? You're my fiancé. We're to be married when the mourning period for my father ends. I nodded. His answer was correct, but it was so clinical. There was no emotion behind it. Lad, I asked on a hunch, do you remember our first kiss? His gaze went to the ceiling, not seeing it, but rather some faraway place in time. Was it, oh, I'm not sure, I think it was after I saw you with Knox on the swing in your yard. You were touching his arm. You ran your fingers through his hair, and then he held you and lifted you off your feet and kissed your cheek. I remember I was furious. We argued. And then we kissed. A fist grabbed my heart. That was the memory she'd left him? 
That dirty trick I'd played in my desperation to convince Lad we were destined to be more than friends. No wonder he'd been so hostile lately. My throat felt like it was closing. No, Lad, that wasn't our first kiss. What about how we met? Can you remember that? He nodded. That one's easier. You were about to be attacked by coyotes. I saved you. I could barely remember how to breathe now. Ava had stolen our very first meeting from his mind. Our childhood connection had been erased. As far as he was concerned, it had never happened. Lad, I said, fighting a sob. That was not the first time you saved me. We met as children. I was six, you were seven. You told me you searched for me for years after that. You were never able to forget me. Remember? He shook his head, then grimaced as if the motion hurt him. I don't, I don't remember that. A new light came into his eyes. This is all Ava's fault. My preoccupation with you and Knox, my constant anger lately. Her glamour is memory manipulation. Wow, Hodden must love having her around as his personal weapon. I should never have accepted an emissary from the dark court, not with Knox out of the country. Auden managed to deceive him somehow. I stroked his blood-streaked hair, trying to calm him. It's over now. At least you know. And she's gone. I sent her away. I'm sure Cully's long gone, too. Lad's eyes narrowed, his jaw tensing as he stared at me intensely. Did he hurt you? Ryan, did he force you to? No. I ran my hand from his uninjured temple to his jaw, holding it tenderly. No, I was humiliated. I was angry. And then when you thought I'd betrayed you, I was devastated. But no, he didn't hurt me physically. He let out an audible breath. I may let him live then. This isn't over. We can't have peace with the Dark Court while there are still dangerous elves like those two criminals in their employ. I think the problems there are bigger than either Knox or I realized. I ran my hand over his chest, soothing him the way you might a fretful child who'd had a nightmare. Shh, it's okay. Don't worry about that right now. Knox can handle it. And that's exactly what they want, I'm sure for you to declare war on the Dark Court and blow up what you and Knox have created. They probably think they've won already, ruining the relationship between you two. I swallowed hard, remembering his incensed face last night, his cruel words. And between you and me. He buried his fingers in my hair, pulling my face down to his. No, Ryan, they did not win. He kissed me once, then spoke again, his eyes holding intense contact with mine. I didn't mean it when I told you to leave, Altum. I don't want you to leave, now or ever, okay? I nodded. Nearly crying in relief, I pressed my lips to his, wanting to show him all the love I still held for him. A misunderstanding, some harsh words, they were painful, that they were not enough to destroy what we had. Lad kissed me back with equal passion. His groan was filled with pent-up desire. Abruptly, he broke the kiss and jerked away from me, rolling to the side of his bed and throwing up violently. Oh my God! I jumped back and sent a mental message to the nearest guard to fetch Wickthorn. Lad had a concussion, no doubt. We shouldn't have been making out when he was so badly hurt. He rolled onto his back again, breathing heavily, his eyelids squeezed shut. I grabbed a wet cloth and pressed it to his face. He took it from my hand, wiping his mouth. I called the doctor. He'll be right here, I assured him. I'm so sorry. His eyelids opened, and he gave me the strangest look. No, I'm sorry. I couldn't. He shook his head in amazement. I can't kiss you anymore. 
I was all right there for a second, but then I kept seeing you with Knox, then with Cully. You were undressed and his hands were all over you. Squeezing his eyes shut again, he said, It was repulsive. I'm sorry. It's okay. I understand. I answered weakly as dismay chilled me to the bone like cold rain. I did understand, but it was definitely not okay. We had a problem, a huge one, and it wasn't going away. A new fear struck my heart and reverberated through my bones. What if it never went away? What if Ava's glamour had permanently damaged Lad's brain and altered his memories of me to the point he couldn't love me anymore? Repulsive was not a word I wanted my husband to associate with me for eternity. The doctor rushed into the room, followed closely by Lad's mother. She sat on the bed next to him and took his hand, gazing directly at him in a way that told me she was talking to him, comforting him. After a while, she and the doctor both withdrew. I went back to Lad's side. Thanks to the elven capacity for accelerated healing, and probably to the elixir Wickthorn had given him, Lad's wound already looked better. But there was something haunted in his eyes. You feeling okay now? I asked. His head rocked side to side on the pillow. I don't know what to do, Ryan. He sounded sick and so very tired. Maybe I just need some time. I'm sorry. It's not fair to you. I think we should postpone the wedding. No, I yelped. Then more quietly I said, no. I'll find her, lad. Ava said she could fix it. I was too mad to listen last night, and I told her to go away. But I'll find her. Lad's hands came up to cover his face as he released an exhausted breath. She could be back in California by now. It doesn't matter. I slipped off his bed and headed for the door. Wherever she is, I'm going to find her. I'll find her and bring her back. Chapter 25, Ava. How many flipping pine trees were there per square foot in this flipping country? I drove along the two-lane county road leading away from Deep River, finally picking a direction and committing to it. Since I had nowhere to go, it didn't really matter which way I went. I'd spent the night cruising through the small town, actually sitting in the parking lot of the food star for several hours before giving up and putting the car into drive again, sighing in disappointment. I wasn't sure what I'd been hoping for exactly. Well, there was a Sonic across the street, and I'd watched cars as they drove in, stayed for a while, and left. Some of them, the ones containing teenagers, never even stopped, but made a slow pass through the drive-in restaurant, looped through town, and then came back again. Not one of them had been a big red pickup truck. I literally laughed out loud at my own stupidity. No one could solve a problem like mine. I was the problem. The road sign said the Interstate 55 connection was three miles ahead. When I reached it, I'd have another decision to make. Which way? North toward Memphis? South to the ocean? What did it matter? No matter where I went, I'd be alone. And I should be alone, since the only thing I was good at was hurting people. I pulled over to the shoulder of the road, my eyes too blurred by tears to continue. There were no buildings around, and hardly any traffic at this early hour. Nothing but farms and pine trees and a row of electrical towers, standing like tin soldiers and dividing the dense tree line, as if an enormous comb had come down and formed a perfect part on a mythical giant's head. I stared at the leggy metallic structures, my thoughts wandering. Like me, they contained a powerful, destructive force. Unlike me, they met a need in this world, providing light and heat and all sorts of useful functions. Opening my car door and leaving it ajar, I got out and started walking through the tall grass toward the towers. I dropped my keys somewhere along the way, but didn't bother to stoop and pick them up. Someone else could find them. 
Coming to the foot of the nearest tower, I tilted my head back and peered up at its peak, where cables connected it to the tower behind it and stretched across the two-lane road to the one on the other side. The electrical hum was loud, but not unpleasant. Very slowly, I reached out a hand to touch the steel leg of the structure. Now the buzz vibrated through my body as well as in my ears. So much power to give energy, to take it away. Searching the structure, I found what I was seeking. Built into one of its legs was a sort of ladder, a lattice of metal that went all the way to the top. The ladder started high off the ground, but being elven, I was tall enough to reach it. I chuckled to myself again. Lucky me. Stretching my arms over my head, I jumped and caught the bottom rung with my fingers, then worked my hands firmly onto it. I pulled myself up until I could hook one foot over the rung, then dragged the rest of my body up onto the ladder. Now, it was just a matter of hand over hand, one foot after another, until I reached the top. As I climbed, I had vivid flashbacks of another climber another person who'd reached the furthest boundary of what he could handle. His tower of choice had been the California State Capitol Building's historic dome. The disgraced former governor had climbed up to the highest open point, the cupola, and stayed there for six hours while a police negotiator spoke to him through a megaphone, trying to persuade him that a lost re-election bid wasn't the end of the world. The Sacramento news crews had gone to continuous coverage. Even the national news picked up a live signal of the desperate man waiting for him to decide. Some people thought he should jump after what he'd done. After being caught flagrantly cheating on the state's beloved first lady, the fool had claimed he'd actually forgotten he was married. Of course, no one believed the bizarre excuse. No one but me. The buzz up here was very loud, the electricity in the air lifting my hair around my head like dandelion fluff. I felt like I could see for miles from this height. I'd always been a city girl, but I nursed a secret fascination for rural places. There was just so much life where things grew. The air was clean, you could hear yourself think, like this place. It all looked so peaceful from up here the farms with their patchwork quilt field plots and red barns and white farmhouses. A herd of cows grazed just on the other side of a copse of trees, resembling tiny play school toys from this distance. A green tractor putted along a row of dark brown soil, maybe preparing it to nurture a new crop. And coming down the highway, in a blaze of color, was a red truck. My grip on the ladder tightened as my pulse picked up. I glanced up at the lines over my head, not close enough to touch. Then I looked down at the ground, a dizzying distance below. Certainly far enough. The blare of a horn drew my eyes to the pickup again. It had left the road and was now tearing across the field toward the tower where I was perched. My heartbeat kept time with the constant beep, beep, beep of the horn that the driver was pounding. What is that idiot doing? His truck approached the base of the tower at such a high speed, I thought he was going to hit it and take the decision out of my hands. Instead, just before reaching it, the driver slammed on the brakes and the truck did a donut, spraying dirt and grass in a 15-foot radius from the nubby tires. The door flew open and out jumped the guy from the Food Star parking lot. Asher, he was shouting. Hey, up there, Miss California, Ava, right? I just stared down at him, not answering. What was he doing here? How did he recognize me? Then, cutting my eyes over to my car on the side of the road, I understood. He cupped his hands around his mouth, are you, by any chance, having a problem? His question was so absurd, I almost laughed. Instead, I yelled back, I told you the other day, I don't have any problems. I did not want to deal with this guy right now. 
He nodded and looked around, then back up at me, shading his eyes from the bright morning sun. Yeah, me either. Sometimes when I'm having a really great day, I like to come take a walk on a live power line myself. Very invigorating. In fact, that's why I'm here. But you seem to be on my favorite tower, and I don't like to share. So I'm going to have to ask you to get down. I stared at him a few seconds more, still processing that he was actually there talking to me. Why did he have to drive by? Why did he have to see me like this? Didn't my life suck enough already? Apparently not. No, I had to have a hot guy witness my darkest moment. Why are you here? I shouted down at him. Why are you out driving around so early in the morning? He raised a brow, tactfully not asking why I was 200 feet off the ground so early in the morning. Some of us losers are still in high school. I was driving into town, trying to make it for the morning bell when I saw your car on the other side of the bypass with the door standing open. I pulled a Yui and came back to check on you. Well, I'm fine, I insisted, just as a gust of wind buffeted me, making my feet rock on the metal rung and my arms tighten around the steel support. My heart lurched up into my throat. Okay but if it's all the same to you, could you be fine down here on the ground? Asher paused as if searching for some magical persuasive words. That way, you won't have to yell to tell me where you're headed. He threw his hand out to the side, gesturing toward my car. Even from here, my luggage was clearly visible in the back seat. Where was I headed? Now that Asher was here, and I'd had a moment to think and to see myself from his perspective, I realized I wasn't headed for the ground below. Not that fast, anyway. Slowly and carefully, I climbed back down the ladder. When my feet hit the bottom rung, Asher's hands grabbed my hips and lifted me the rest of the way down, causing me to fall back against his chest. His rapid heartbeat nearly bruised my back. His tone gave nothing away, though and as I turned to face him, he smiled and let out an audible breath. Okay, then. Now that I'm officially tardy, we might as well go out to breakfast. I stared at him like he'd lost his mind. Breakfast? Yeah, I don't know about you California types, but here in Mississippi, we like to eat a meal in the morning. Usually consisting of biscuits and some sort of pan-fried meat. Bacon, sausage, you know. Grits are optional, but recommended. There's a great little diner on Main Street that serves them hand ground and swimming in butter. I had no idea what a grit was, but the thought of biscuits and bacon had my stomach rumbling. I hadn't eaten since the appetizers at the banquet last night. Looking at his expectant face, I realized how adorable this guy was and how impossible it was to go to breakfast with him. I shook my head. No, I, I've i got to get going. I can't stay around here. It can't be that bad. And even if it is, remember what I said? I'm pretty good at solving problems. I shook my head emphatically. You can't solve this one. I ruined someone's life. To someone's. Actually, I have ruined lots of lives, more than I want to count, and it's too late to fix things. Asher held up a staying hand. Now that I must disagree with. My granddaddy always says, it ain't too late till the possum puts on his pants. I couldn't stop myself. I laughed out loud. That's ridiculous. Does he really say that? He gave me a happy grin, clearly pleased with himself for cracking up the weird suicidal girl. He sure does. And I believe it. It's never too late to change. It's never too late for love. And it's never too late to say you're sorry. He glanced at his watch. Sometimes, though, it gets too late for breakfast. So let's get a move on. 
he made one of those come-along hand gestures, nodding toward his truck. I glanced at it, but my feet stayed planted. Why was he being so nice to me? I didn't deserve it. Sometimes it is. Too late, you know. If you only knew what I did. Asher took my hand, surprising me. I don't care what you did. I can tell you're a good person. He tapped his chest. In here. And the fact that I came along and found you where I did this morning proves it's not too late for you. If you didn't care about what you'd done, you'd have kept on driving that sassy little car of yours to wherever you damn well please without a second thought. Instead, you're here with me, about to tell me a very interesting story over breakfast. And then we'll figure out a way to fix that problem of yours and make things right. And then you won't have to run off. You can stick around and find out all the other crazy things my granddaddy taught me. Staring into those tropical blue eyes, I found there was nothing I'd ever wanted to do more. For a moment, I actually considered telling him everything and finding out if his grandfather's wisdom offered anything that would apply to recovery and redemption from life as a dark elven memory assassin. But I couldn't, of course. He was a human, the sweetest, most attractive human I'd ever met. And this wasn't going to happen. I can't. His crestfallen expression tugged at my insides. But thank you, really. Thank you for turning around and coming back and missing school and telling me what your granddaddy said about possums and for your kind, kind offer. You have no idea how much I wish I could take it. He nodded slowly and dropped his gaze to the ground the toe of his boot kicking at a hunk of earth and grass his truck tires had dislodged. Then his eyes came up to meet mine again. He looked like he wanted to make another argument, but he didn't. Okay, then. Where will you go? Actually, I'm going back to where I've been staying the past few days. Until I'd said it just now, I hadn't known the answer myself. Now I knew I had to try again to repair the damage I'd done. I'm going to try one more time to make things right. After that, who knows? His grin returned. Good for you. And California, if you need a little company on the way to who knows, let me know. Big Red is always up for an adventure. I nodded, knowing I'd never see him again. Asher turned around and walked back to his truck, climbing into the cab and slamming the door behind him. I crossed the grassy flat toward my own little car, stooped to pick up my dropped keys, and pulled it back onto the road, turning back toward Altum. Chapter 26. Ava I halfway expected the light elven guards to take me out with long-distance arrows before I got near the massive magnolia, but it was Cully I ran into first. He was on the forest path, making his way toward the road. His eyes flared when he spotted me. Ava, you can't mean to go back there. I think they hate you even more than they hate me, which is saying something. You must have succeeded brilliantly. I nodded grimly. Yes, actually, I did. But I failed at being a decent human being which is why you're not a human being, Cully interrupted with a sneer. You're better than that. We all are, every last one of us. I shook my head, giving him a pitying look. You're wrong. An image of Asher's kind eyes was burned into my mind. We've all been wrong. My father says... I thought you didn't believe everything your father said. Right now, you sound like his little puppet. For a moment, there was a stony silence, except for Cully's rough breathing. As we stared at each other, there was a flicker of something in his eyes. I wasn't sure what. He was so hard to read. A strange look passed over his face. 
He seemed to be grasping for words that were hard to find or hard to say. Finally, the tense standoff ended. His usual world-weary expression returned, along with his signature sarcasm. So what? You going back to say you're sorry? Enjoy your time in Ultum's deepest, darkest prison cell? Yes, I am going to say I'm sorry and try to fix what I've broken. Maybe it's not too late. And don't bother to warn me about what Auden and my mother will say. I already know I'll be banished. I don't care anymore. The mocking look on his face slowly morphed into anger. Well, that's just lovely. And what about me? I blinked. Blinked again. What about you? I assume you completed your mission, whatever it was, or you wouldn't be leaving. You'll be fine. You won't be implicated. If they track me down, I'll tell them you had nothing to do with my treason. That's not what I meant. You don't care about me anymore either? I am your betrothed after all. Or is this the official breakup? I stared at him, bewildered by his question. Cully, we did this, came here and agreed to the betrothal because we had to. You know that as well as I do. He let out a harsh laugh. There was unmistakable pain in the sound. Yeah, I know that. I know I'm only wanted as long as I'm useful. And you're just like the rest of them, tossing me away now that you're done with me. Well, have a wonderful banishment then. Now that I've gotten what I came for, I'm off to L.A. myself until Father finds me too much of a bother to have around and sends me somewhere else. Tell you what, Angel, just for old time's sake, I'll make sure my phone's not working until I get there. Give you a few days head start. I had never seen him so upset or so vulnerable. What was he saying? That he wanted to be with me? Why would he be interested in me when he had so many other choices? We didn't even get along that well. It made no sense. I studied his face, trying to see past his defenses. Unfortunately, Cully Roon was a master of disguises. When I didn't say anything, he blew out an irritated breath, shook his head, and charged past me down the path. Cully? I called after him. He stopped in place but did not turn around. He stood, shoulders tense, hands clenched. I hesitated, then said, Thanks for the head start. He gave a tight nod and resumed walking, his long strides carrying him out of sight within a minute. I turned back around and continued on toward the tree that marked Altum's entrance. When I reached it, the expected guards were indeed on duty, and thankfully, they elected not to shoot me on sight. Instead, one of them grabbed me by the arm to escort me down the winding earthen tunnel entranceway. The king's betrothed has been looking for you. Awesome. Someone must have alerted Ryan to my return because she came running up to me as we emerged into the common area. Ava! Oh, Ava, thank God! She gripped my arm, her hands ice cold against my skin. I'm so sorry for what I said to you last night when you offered to help fix Lad, and I'm begging you, if you can do anything to help him, please do it. I was wrong. I didn't mean it. People can change, and maybe it's not too late. Her words lit a new fire in my heart. Not a big one, a tiny spark of hope, but it was there. She was willing to give me a second chance a chance to repair the damage I'd caused and use my gift for good for once. I stared into her desperate eyes. Take me to him. I'll do my best.
Chapter 27 Ryan I stood by, impatient, as Ava was brought into Lad's room. The lights were low. A small crowd was gathered, including Wickthorne, Knox, and Lad's mother, Maya. Vancha was there, too. She'd been the one to tell Lad about Ava's return to Altum and what was about to happen, since he felt strange and mistrustful around both Knox and me. At her urging, he sat in a chair in the center of the room. The scene reminded me so much of the anxious moments after Lad had been shot and brought here, when I had stood in a corner and watched helplessly while he hovered between life and death. Now it wasn't his mortality at risk, but our entire future together. Just as back then, I could do nothing directly to help him, except maybe to verify that Ava's intentions were pure. Reading her emotions, I detected nothing but remorse, sincerity, and determination. If she could help him, she would. What's she going to do? He asked Vansha, his voice filled with suspicion as he watched Ava approach. Ava was the one to answer. Just talk to you, lad. First, I want to say I'm sorry for what I did. Thank you for giving me a chance to make it right. He gave her a terse nod. I'm still not sure what you did, but Vansha and my mother both say I need your help, so I guess do whatever you're going to do. Thank you, she said again, and took a seat in the chair placed directly in front of him. They sat, their knees almost touching, their gazes locked. Ava reached out and placed her hands over his. He flinched but didn't pull away from her. Focus on the sound of my voice, she instructed in a low, measured tone. Your memories are still there. They have not been erased, only sunk to the farthest depths of your subconscious. Think of it like the underground river here. Your past experiences are caught in the deepest current. It's strong, but we're going to fish for them, and together we'll bring them back to the surface. Lad's eyelids drifted closed as Ava continued to talk, guiding him on a mental journey in search of what had been buried so deeply, of those things hidden from his conscious mind by her glamour. I shifted from foot to foot, fiddling with my fingernails as I watched and prayed her efforts would be successful. Let's go back to the beginning, okay? She murmured. You were seven. It was a cold night, January and you were on your way to your special treetop hideaway. When you got there, someone was already there, huddled at the base of the tree. Can you see it? Lad's slow, even breathing continued. His voice, when he finally spoke, sounded sleepy. I can't. Wait, I'm not sure. He winced and opened his eyes, shaking his head in frustration. I can't do it. I'm not getting anything. It's all right. It will come. Close your eyes, please. Ava glanced over to my corner. Ryan, come here, please, she asked silently. I stepped away from the wall and went to her and Lad, instinctively tiptoeing because she had communicated with me silently. Stand behind him, she directed me. Place your hand on his shoulder but don't speak. Aloud, she said, Lad, someone's going to touch you, but don't worry, it's all right. It's part of the process. You'll get this, don't worry. Just relax. As she'd instructed, I stood behind Lad and lay a hand gently on his shoulder. Immediately, the tension released. She nodded and resumed her work. Someone is there at your special tree. It's no one you've ever seen before. A little... It's a girl, he interrupted. A little girl. She's not elven. She's different. There was a smile in his voice now, a hushed, almost reverent quality. She's beautiful. I think she must be a human. Father told me about the humans who live on our land. I couldn't help but smile thinking of all the times I'd insisted Lad and his people were living on my land, on Grandma's land. 
That was before I found out the Light Elves had prior claim to it for about, oh, 8,000 years or so. The pace of his breathing picked up. I could feel it in the movement of his shoulders. I should go. I'm not supposed to let them see me, but... What is it? What do you see? Ava prompted. She's in trouble. She's shivering. And she shouldn't be sleeping out here in the open at night. Where are her people? What do you do, lad? I... First, I just look at her. She's beautiful, he repeated. I've never seen anyone like her. Then I squat down so I can see her face. She doesn't know I'm there. She can't hear me, I guess. She's really shaking. I'm afraid. I think she might be sick from the cold. She might be dying. I can't just leave her. I reach out and touch her face. It's so cold. And her eyes open. She jumps, and that makes me jump. She's surprised to see me, I can tell. I wonder if she might scream or run away. But she doesn't. She laughs. Now my smile turned into a ferocious battle to hold in sobs. Tears streamed from my eyes. He remembers. Maybe even better than I did. His description of our first meeting took me right back to the moment back to our magical first contact, the moment that changed my life. Lad and Ava talked through his other lost memories in similar fashion, some aloud, some mind to mind, helping him to retrieve and relive them one by one. After a couple of hours, Ava brought her attention back to me for a moment. You can go sit down now if you'd like. We're almost done. Did it work? I asked anxiously. We'll see. It's looking good. I crossed the room and sat on Lad's bed, observing as she guided him out of his state of deep relaxation and concentration. Lad, you can open your eyes now. He did, and she asked, How do you feel? He didn't answer her question. Instead, his gaze swept the room, landing on me and focusing with laser-like intensity. Ryan! He stood and crossed the room in wide, purposeful strides, stopping in front of me and taking my face in his hands before I could even say anything. His head lowered and our mouths met in a scalding kiss that went on for minutes and left me weak-kneed and dizzy. This time, he did not pull away in disgust, or for any other reason. He kissed me and kissed me until we were both starved for oxygen. Only then did he break contact with my mouth and draw back just enough to look into my eyes. I searched them for any trace of repulsion. All I saw was love and blazing desire. Wow. I guess it worked, I gasped. Marry me, he said. Not a question, a command. I nodded vigorously, my heart surging and my face still firmly clasped between his palms. Yes, of course. I want to, as soon as possible. Marry me today. No more delays. I don't want to wait for the next disaster to strike. I don't want to wait for anything. I'm going to make you mine tonight. His gaze went to the bed and then flicked around the room, cataloging all the people present frowning as if tonight weren't soon enough and right now was more like it, if only he could make them all disappear. What about the mourning period for your father? I asked, glancing over at his mother across the room. I knew how important tradition was to her, and it was her husband who was being honored. Lad turned and met her gaze for a few moments. When his eyes came back to mine, they were filled with passion and certainty. I'm ending it early. It's what I should have done in the first place. I am king, after all. I can make decisions for the good of my people. And this, you and me, is necessary. Wrapping me in his arms and holding me close, he lowered his forehead to mine. I have spent far too much time living in the past. It's time to move on to our future. Taking in my expression, which no doubt conveyed my shock at his complete turnaround, 
He smiled and puffed a little laugh. Am I scaring you? I shook my head, matching his smile with one of my own. Not even a little bit. I'm ready. If it were up to me, we wouldn't wait even a few more minutes. Now his laugh was louder, and he lifted an eyebrow at my eagerness. Tempting, very tempting. But I need a little time to make everything perfect for you. I'm king, but I'm not a miracle worker. He held my face between his hands again and gave me a look that was also a promise. Tonight. And then, oh, princess, you'd better run. Chapter 28. Lad. Servants scurried about the palace's great hall making preparations. I walked through, admiring their progress. Already the chairs had been draped in shimmering white fabric, and fresh flowers had been brought in to adorn every table. Delectable smells drifted in from the kitchen, the palace's head chef already hard at work on preparations for the evening feast. My family's ancestral home had hosted many special events throughout the centuries, but I doubted any of them could have rivaled the beauty of this one. Not for me, anyway. I wanted everything to be perfect for Ryan, and thankfully most of the supplies and planning had already been in place, ready for the royal wedding which had been scheduled for next month. Still, I'd expected a little more panic from my assistant, Rickard, and the wedding coordinator, Dagny, when I'd sprung the news on them that I'd moved our wedding to this evening and they'd have to get everything ready, ready or not. They only smiled, congratulated me, and got to work. Probably had something to do with the fact they'd rather have me celebrating than rampaging through the palace, threatening everyone's jobs. Or lives as I'd apparently spent the past day doing. Parts of the past 24 hours were a blur. Everything before that, crystal clear and fully intact in my mind. As Ava had sat with me, holding my hands, speaking quietly, the memories poured back into my brain, like a dehydrated sponge being flooded with water, blooming and growing instantly. My first encounter with Ryan as a child, our first kiss, all the happy times we'd shared. They were all once again entrenched in my recollections. As for the memories of Ryan and Knox together, Ava said she could put them back into proper perspective in my mind, or maybe reduce them a little if I preferred. I opted for the accurate version, the whole truth. Everything Ryan and I had been through had brought us to this point, and it was all worth it every single moment of pleasure and pain. The bedroom scene with Cully still made me want to punch a wall, but it was no longer Ryan my anger was directed at. It was a good thing for Cully that he'd fled Altum already. My guards had done a thorough search and assured me he was gone. Extra security had been posted to make certain he didn't return and interfere with the wedding somehow. Good riddance. He was gone, but not forgotten. He wouldn't get away with his crimes forever. Sooner or later, he would pay for what he'd done to her. I watched the decorator arrange tiny candle lanterns on a branch in the center of one of the tables. Similar centerpieces adorned the surrounding tables, and together with all the greenery and flowers, they gave the ambiance of a secret garden. I grinned, knowing how much Ryan was going to love it. Not bad for a shotgun wedding. I turned to see Knox's smiling face as he walked up and laid a hand on my shoulder, joining me in viewing the bustling scene. I trust I'm back on the invite list now that Ava's patched up that thick head of yours? Yes, I assured him. Luckily, Ryan has forgiven me for my behavior. I hope you can too. Don't worry about it. I couldn't detect much difference from your usual charming self, he joked. So everything's all right then. You didn't have to promise the light council your firstborn or anything to get them to go along with moving the wedding up? No, surprisingly. In spite of my new habit of blowing tradition out of the water, they didn't put up much of a fuss about it, especially when my mother spoke in favor of it and assured them father would have done the same thing. 
Besides, I think I scared him with my furious dictator act. Apparently, I've been a bit unpleasant to be around. He grinned widely and rolled his eyes. You were a bit uptight. Smirking at his vast understatement, he added, but I guarantee you'll be more relaxed by tomorrow. Speaking of, in the absence of your father, do you need me to have a talk with you? I folded my arms across my chest and shot a murderous glance in his direction. Thanks, but no, I'm good. Now his laughter rang through the hall, causing the workers to turn their heads in our direction. He lowered his voice. Seriously, though. I'd be a terrible best man slash minister of ceremonies if I didn't at least ask. No cold feet? My voice sounded as certain as I felt when I told him. None. I'm more sure of this than I've ever been of anything in my life. His large hand clapped me on the back with enthusiasm. All right, then. Let's get you hitched. Chapter 29. Ryan. There were actual butterflies living in my stomach. Either that, or I was filled with so much anticipation my body was excited at the cellular level. Lad had sent me to my suite to be pampered and prepared, while he took care of all the arrangements for our wedding. I stood on a small platform in the center of my room, while the seamstress worked on the hem of my gown, hurrying to finish it in time. Grandma Nina had just returned with Mom, who was wide-eyed and grinning ear to ear. It's a good thing I already had my mother of the bride dress, she said, holding up a hanging bag emblazoned with the name of Deep River's only nice clothing store. Because if I had to attend my only daughter's wedding in my work clothes, someone was going to have a very unhappy mother-in-law. He's doing the right thing, Mom. You don't even know all that we've been through. She nodded. I know it's right, honey. Mama explained a little to me. It's your daddy I'm worried about. He's more nervous than you and Lad put together. Poor daddy. Where is he now? He's in the reception area, supervising things with Lad and Knox. He must think he's stepped through the wardrobe. My heart squeezed thinking about how my father must be feeling right now. It was one thing to hear about this place. Quite another to see it with your own eyes and he had not a drop of elven heritage to ground the mind-boggling experience. Lad agreed that Daddy should attend the ceremony, but told me I'd have to give him a small dose of my sway afterward to prevent him from telling anyone how to get to Altum, or let Ava remove the memory altogether. It was the only way the Light Council would agree to his being here for the event. They still didn't love it, but they understood. Many of them were Daddies as well. I insisted mine be allowed to keep the memory of walking me down the aisle. After all, who was he going to tell? We were all planning to keep the fact I was married secret from our human friends anyway. Which led me to Emmy. Her absence was the only thing keeping the occasion from being perfect, but it just wasn't possible to have her here. As much as I loved her, she wasn't known for her discretion, and her brain had been swayed enough for one lifetime. Vancha would stand in, performing the usual duties of a maid of honor instead. She came into the room, speaking excitedly before rounding the corner to see us all. Ryan, you should see the great hall. The reception's going to be... Oh, wow. She stopped in her tracks as she saw me standing in the dress. You look amazing. You really do look like a princess. I glanced down at myself at the exquisitely crafted gown, letting my fingers float over the white tulle A-lined skirt that flared slightly from my waist and covered my toes. The fitted strapless bodice had a sweetheart neckline and was intricately embroidered and covered with crystal beading. I knew Vancha was right, and it was no credit to me, but rather my elven dressmaker. This dress really was something out of a fairy tale. I had never seen anything like it made by human hands. The headpiece was made especially for me, too. It was a jeweled headband that resembled a crown with its multitude of crystals. I would wear my hair down in flowing waves, 
so it seemed like the perfect complement to the simple hairstyle and the diamond drop earrings Mom had brought with her from her own jewelry box. Something borrowed, she whispered, her voice thick with tears as she fastened them on for me. And something blue and old like me. Grandma chuckled as she presented me with a diamond and sapphire bracelet. Van gave it to me on our first anniversary. It's a dream come true to give it to you on your wedding day, especially since I know I'll get to enjoy seeing you wear it for a long, long time to come. If Lad's father, Ivar, had not allowed Grandma Nina to return to Altam and be reunited with her family, she would have eventually had to fake her death and move away from all of us. It would have been impossible to explain her unnatural longevity and youthfulness to her human friends and acquaintances in Deep River. Now, we could all stay together and keep being a family. I stepped out of the dress so Sigrid could finish her work. She whisked the gown away, promising to have it back soon as I slipped on a soft robe. Okay, makeup time, Vancha announced. She plunked a heavy-looking bag onto the vanity tabletop, gesturing for me to take the chair in front of the mirror. Into the hot seat you go. As she was a model, and none of the light elves even wore makeup, she'd volunteered for the task of making me glamorous. I eyed the bulging makeup case. Not too much, okay? I don't want to look unnatural, just better. Don't worry, you're in expert hands, she assured, and then gave me a mischievous grin. It's fun to fix up someone else. I'm usually the one being tortured. This is nothing, I had to admit. I let other people bathe me today and wash my hair. Apparently, it was tradition, and since we were already abandoning so many of those, I went along with it to keep my female elven relatives happy. They escorted me to a beautiful bathing room, where I'd soaked in a huge tub, then endured an exfoliating scrub. Okay, endured was probably the wrong word because it smelled luscious. And then given a relaxing massage by the elven servants who attended me like workers in a high-end spa. My skin had never felt or looked so good. After that came a polish-less manicure that left my nails glowing. They curled and styled my hair applying a sweet-smelling product that made the long locks shine and behave like they never had in my life. Maybe I should have been selling that instead of sweet tea. Human women would be trampling each other to get to the beauty supply store for this stuff. By the time Vancha was finished, Sigrid had returned with the dress and a gorgeous pair of jewel-encrusted shoes. The light elves tended to go barefoot most of the time, but I hadn't gotten used to the idea and I really couldn't imagine walking down the aisle on my wedding day without shoes. I stepped into the dress first and waited as the seamstress adjusted the drape of it around my body and then moved behind me to fasten the bodice where it scooped low on my back. Because the back of the dress was so lovely, I wouldn't be wearing a veil. It would seem like overkill anyway with the ornate headband. When she finished, she stepped back and checked me over, then gave me a nod and left. I slipped the shoes on, then turned to face Vancha and Mom and Grandma, who'd been busy dressing themselves. Mom burst into tears. Oh, Ryan, you look like an angel. She looks like an elf, Vancha said, clearly proud of her work. She looks ready, Grandma said, adding a remark mind to mind just for me. You feel ready, too. I wouldn't let you go out there if I couldn't tell you were sure about this. I gave her a teary grin in return and nodded repeatedly. I was ready. There was a knock at the door, and Grandma went to answer it, coming back a moment later. It's time. I nodded, those butterflies upping their game and careening around like kites in a hurricane. You sure about this, baby? Mom asked. It's not too late, you know. This is a big commitment, even more than it is for most people. I want you to be happy, no matter what. Thank you, I said, meaning it in every sense of the word. 
for everything. I am happy, and I will be happy with Lad forever. She nodded, satisfied. All right, then. Look out, everybody. Here comes the bride. The only reason I could believe it wasn't all some fantastical dream was that I'd been living and breathing a real-life dream since the first day Lad had surprised me at the spring-fed pool in the woods. Ready for your moment in the spotlight? Daddy smiled down at me as we stood just inside the grand double doors of the royal residence. Um, I'm ready to get married. My lips trembled as I said the words. The spotlight, I could live without. But, you know, the royal thing. Are you ready? Tears shone in his eyes, and the tip of his nose was red. Not a bit. Not a bit. But let's do it anyway. We both laughed with tears in our eyes. The doors opened and we waited our turn as Vansha stepped out onto the winding pathway through the center of Altum. After a few beats, we followed, making our way toward the wedding spire I could see rising over the river in the distance. With its soaring walls and the colossal support columns formed of interwoven tree roots, Altum's vast common area was more beautiful than any man-made cathedral could ever hope to be. Flickering white candle lanterns had been suspended all along the processional path, which was otherwise dark. It was lined with elven people of all ages. As I passed, each one uncovered a glowing stone and held it up, bathing me in its colored light. To those watching from the cave-like openings high on the cavern walls, it must have seemed like the globes of colored light were dancing over the ground on their own. Groups of musicians were positioned at regular intervals along our route. Somehow they all played the same entrancing tune on their exotic stringed instruments, keeping perfect time with one another, though the path to the river was too long for them to actually hear each other the whole way. They must have been using mind-to-mind -mind communication to stay in sync. The melody itself was enchanting. Soft and lilting in places, and then soaring, the beautiful notes enveloping me in emotion that threatened to lift me from the ground and float me down the aisle. I swallowed hard, battling another surge of nerves and disbelief. Could this really be happening? To me? Not just the fact that I was the focus of every eye in a mythical underground world, or that I was wearing this exquisite dress and listening to an otherworldly orchestra play in my honor, but that I was going to spend the rest of my life with Lad. Nothing would be able to separate us after this day. It had been such a battle to get here. I halfway expected some villain to jump out of the darkness and stop me from reaching the altar. Or maybe someone would step out of the crowd and object. Glancing from one side to the other, I searched their faces, seeing nothing but peace and benevolence. A little girl, she appeared to be about seven or eight, lifted a hand and waved to me with an enthusiasm that made me smile. Despite what Cully had insinuated, these were my people. They did accept me. Even if it hadn't been obvious on their faces, I could feel it. Either that, or these folks sure did like royal weddings. Wow, this is some kind of crowd, Daddy muttered under his breath. His voice was shaky. I know. I squeezed his hand. It's a little bigger than First Baptist Church, huh? I'll say. Good thing they don't expect the bride's family to pay for the reception in the elven world. We'd be serving peanut butter and crackers. We both giggled and continued toward the bridge spanning Altum's impressive central river. The wedding shrine had been erected atop it, high enough to provide a view of the ceremony for all the onlookers. The extraordinary structure was doubled by the river's reflection, making the scene nothing less than magical. The arch was constructed of woven vines, the same one that had been used in Knox and Vanch's recent wedding. 
This time, it was overflowing with various types and sizes of flowers, all of them white, in contrast to my bridal bouquet, which was bursting with fall color, a fragrant mixture of sunflowers, roses, hydrangea, wax flowers, and spider mums. A crystal chandelier hung from the center of the spire, casting an alluring glow that drew me forward and gilded the top of Lad's golden head. Knox and Grandma Nina stood beside him, and my mother stood just to the side with Lad's mom, Maya. Parents played a big part in elven weddings, as they were normally the ones who'd arrange them. The two women had such different lives, but standing together, dressed in their finery, they looked remarkably similar. Mom's elven heritage was more obvious tonight than it had ever been in her life. As Daddy and I completed the last curve of the path, and stepped onto the bridge, I caught sight of Lad's face. And suddenly, all the dazzling decorations paled in comparison. Even from here, his emotion was clearly visible. He broke into a melting smile, his green eyes shining with elation and love. He sent me a silent message. You are too beautiful for words. I can't believe you're mine. Always, I told him, my bottom lip already quivering. I was never going to make it through this without crying. The best I could hope for was a tearful, elegant cry, and not the full waterworks that would ruin all of Vanch's hard work. As we reached the center of the arch, Daddy kissed my cheek, whispered, Love you, baby girl, and stepped back beside Mom. Lad and I reached for each other at the same moment, joining hands in an instant of joyous connection. I turned to give my bouquet to Vansha, and then Lad and I faced each other while Knox began speaking, aloud for the benefit of all those present who communicated verbally. For millennia, our people have recognized the wedding ceremony as our most sacred rite, unbreakable, eternal and the foundation of our society. This day, our ancient custom joins not only two lives and two families, but a king and his queen, and the elven people with our human neighbors. His expression was sober as he continued, looking from Lad's face to mine, then down at the time-worn book in his hands. And so it is an occasion of deepest significance, as are the words which I will now ask each of you to repeat. In some ways, the traditional elven vows were similar to those spoken in the few weddings I'd attended. In some ways, they were different. For instance, the part where a human bride and groom might say, for as long as we both shall live, was replaced with, until the sun no longer rises and sets. I didn't know how many sunrises and sunsets I'd get with Lad, but at the moment, all that mattered was we'd have the next one, and the one after that. As long as my hybrid human elven heart kept beating, it would belong only to him. At Knox's prompt, Lad took my hand and slid a ring onto my finger. The large, clear stone was a rose-cut oval set in a silver band engraved with a beautiful leaf pattern. I looked back up into Lad's jewel-green eyes. What a gorgeous crystal. I love it. It's not a crystal, he corrected with a sneaky smile. There's a diamond mine just next door in Arkansas, you know. I called in a favor. That had my gaze flying back to inspect the jewel, which, if it was a diamond, was way too valuable. I'd have to lie to people at school and tell them it was fake. My attention was wrenched away from the beautiful ring when Lad's mother stepped forward and placed something in Lad's hand and then in mine. It was heavy, a coppery medallion of some kind, emblazoned with the image of a man who looked an awful lot like Lad, clearly one of his ancestors. Though we hadn't been able to have a wedding rehearsal, I was told it was traditional for the parents of the groom to offer the bridal couple a symbolic gift like this. I smiled and thanked her, 
and she pressed her cheek to mine and then to Lad's. She lingered a bit, leaning her forehead against his before stepping back. Knox invited Grandma Nina to take part in the next custom. He handed her a silver chalice. She held it up to Lad's mouth, then to mine, for us each to take a drink. Just a small sip. It's very strong, she warned as the rim of the cup touched my lips. The liquid inside was sweet and syrupy and zinged my tongue with instant warmth. It was something like the sail water, but much more concentrated. A pleasurable heat filled my body, and Grandma was right. I was almost tipsy from just one tiny taste. As soon as the ritual was completed, Knox's face broke into a beaming smile. Good job, guys. You did it. Nobody fainted. <laughs> Not even me, he said, too low for anyone else to hear. Then he turned us to face the assembly below. Lad raised our joined hands high. A swell of cheers and joyful laughter filled my ears. The music began again, and from above, a shower of white flower petals released making it appear as though it was snowing huge fragrant flakes inside Altum. The only thing sweeter than their scent was the expression on my husband's face as he drew me to him for a kiss. I love you, Ryan. And I love you. I want to make you so happy, lad. I want to give you everything. He drew back and smiled, his eyes holding a playful spark. I'll take it. Chapter 30, Lad I am the luckiest guy on earth. Elf, human, or whatever else may exist out there. That's what kept going through my mind. Finally, finally, I had everything I could ever want. Ryan belonged to me and I could look toward my immortal future with excitement and anticipation instead of dread. To the exuberant music and sustained roar of cheering voices, we proceeded from the wedding spire down the path to the palace. Showers of flower petals fluttered about us as we walked hand in hand. They covered the path ahead and got stuck in our hair. Glancing over to see Ryan, her face glowing, her head adorned with a crown of white petals, I was nearly overwhelmed with happiness. My smile was so big, it literally hurt my face. Just before we reached the palace, Ryan swayed a bit in her heels, clenching my hand harder for balance. You all right? She nodded and laughed. What was in that drink? Oh no, you didn't take a big swallow, did you? No, I promise, just a sip, but I'm totally feeling it. We slipped inside the doors, followed by a stream of wedding guests heading for the great hall. Good, I grinned at her, because any more than that would lay you out for the rest of the night, and I don't want you to miss anything. Shooting her a suggestive look, I added, I have plans for you later. You did say you wanted to give me everything, right? For a moment, we shared searing eye contact. Then the ballroom doors opened, and she turned her head, gasping audibly at what she saw inside. Happiness swelled in my chest like a sunrise. There was nothing better than pleasing her. Do you like it? Ryan's fingers came up to cover her mouth lightly as she nodded. It's incredible. It doesn't even seem like the same place. She stepped into the room, her head on a swivel as she took in the elaborate decorations. I followed her through the room while she admired the miles of fine white fabric draping the long banquet tables, the candlelit crystal chandeliers, the flowers and greenery and candle lights that adorned every flat surface. It's like a fairy tale, she breathed. Thank you. I leaned down and kissed her cheek feeling more than a little proud of myself for pulling it off. You deserve it. You deserve everything I can give you and more. Would you like a drink? Maybe just some sail water. I don't think I could handle any wine until I've eaten. 
I really am feeling that. What was it called? We just call it sail. It's made from the residue of the sail water making process, aged and fermented for a long time. It's very intoxicating and addictive. That's why we use it only for ceremonial rituals and only in the smallest quantities. I led her to a table where hundreds of glasses sparkled in the warm candle glow of the room. Lifting two glasses, I handed her one. Here you are. To our future. She clinked her glass delicately against mine. To forever. That was our last private moment for a while, as a flood of well-wishers surrounded us, and we were obliged to speak a few words to each one. After a short time, the musicians who'd been staggered along the processional path finished setting up as a single group on one side of the room and began playing together as a full orchestra. Their music was lively, but not too loud. The wedding feast would begin soon. After that, the tables would be cleared away for dancing. The peal of a single bell signaled the beginning of the meal. Ryan and I took our seats at the center of one of the long tables, our families on either side with Knox and Vansha across from us. At my insistence, Ava had stayed for the festivities, but she looked uncomfortable, sitting quietly next to Knox and picking at her food. Perhaps she was thinking about her next step. After the way she'd helped me and confessed her wrongdoing, it was doubtful she'd be welcome in the dark court any longer. I supposed that meant her betrothal to Cully was over as well, if it had even been real in the first place. She had defied his father, making an enemy of him. She'd given up a lot to do the right thing. You're welcome to remain here in Altum for as long as you like, I assured her. She glanced up from her plate and gave me a grateful smile. Thank you, your highness. But I'll probably leave in the morning. Congratulations on your marriage. I know you'll be happy together. So, Ryan, Knox said, drawing my attention his way. What did you think of your song? She gave him a quizzical look. The one they played while you were walking in? I called it. Ryan's theme. Very original, honey. Vansha teased, patting Knox's hand. Ryan's eyes went wide as she realized what he had done for her, for us. Oh, Knox, I loved it. Truly. It's the perfect wedding gift. Well, that wasn't your actual gift. He grinned over at Vansha. She pulled a set of keys from her evening bag and set them on the table in front of Ryan's plate. Ryan picked them up, her pretty face contracting in puzzlement. What is this? This is a Mercedes emblem. Well, I know how attached you are to the old caddy, Knox said. But stylish as it is, it's not going to last forever. We thought you needed something a little more reliable. And a little less hideous, Vansha added with a laugh. Ryan glanced over at me, open-mouthed and wide-eyed before standing up and leaning over the table to hug Vansha, then Knox. This is too much. It's too much, she said. Knox waved a dismissive hand. Nah, actually, it was entirely self-serving. Now that you have a decent car, you can drive us to the airport. Watching the two of them laughing and talking together, I was happy to note a complete lack of jealousy on my part. Maybe spending the past few days eaten alive with a jealous rage had burned it all out of me. Maybe it was just knowing she was inextricably bound to me now by elven and human tradition. After dinner, the music turned spirited and celebratory, perfect for dancing. Servants whisked away the tables and chairs, and Ryan and I took the center of the dance floor directly under the Great Hall's colorful, glowing mosaic. I have no idea what I'm doing, she muttered through a clenched smile. Don't worry, I whispered. I do. I led her through the steps of one of our traditional dances, 
and in spite of her warning, she followed me easily. After that, she danced a turn with her father, and then with Knox, while I danced with my mother, then hers. Noticing Vancha standing alone, I looked around for Ava, but didn't spot her anywhere in the crowd. I was grateful when the formalities were finished and I was able to dance with Ryan again. The orchestra must have read my mind because they slowed the tempo and played a romantic waltz-like tune. Other couples surrounded us, but I felt like we were encased in our own private bubble of happiness, moving slowly together, my arms around her, hands stroking the silken skin of her back. This is nice, Ryan murmured, laying her head on my shoulder. She smelled amazing and felt like heaven pressed close to me. I glanced around, wondering how much longer we'd be obligated to stay at the party. I shaped her waist with my hands, loving her curves, anticipating exploring them at leisure and very, very thoroughly. She must have been feeling a similar anticipation, because she raised up on her tiptoes to kiss me, a delicious appetizer before our wedding night. It took everything in me not to groan loud enough for our neighbors on the dance floor to hear. She drew back and stared into my eyes. She was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Are you happy? Did you enjoy your wedding day? I asked. It was perfect, she said. The best day of my entire life. I agreed. Almost. There's only one more thing I need to make this day the best of my life. Her face flooded with pink color. Obviously, she'd read my meaning, or maybe my emotions, which had to be fully charged and obvious to her glamour right now. I know I'll be relieved when it's over, she said, making me bark out a sudden loud laugh. And the pink deepened to red. No, I mean the reception. You know, I'll be relieved when we're finally alone. I didn't mean... I dipped my head and laughed against her neck, pressing a kiss into it, then murmuring against her ear. Good, because there's no way I'm rushing through what comes after this. I smiled as I felt chill bumps spring up on her arms and heard her breath quicken. It may be the shortest reception in history, though. Her body surged against mine. She kissed me, then pressed a feverish whisper into my ear, her fingertips digging into the muscles of my back. I want you, lad. And we're leaving. I grabbed Ryan's hand and started across the dance floor toward the exit, nearly dragging her in my haste to get her alone. I'd been primed and ready for days, for months, but those four words had made it impossible to stay here another minute. Every muscle in my body was strung tight. My blood was raging, my desire for her at the boiling point. We can go now? She asked, practically running to keep up with my pace and obviously confused by my abrupt actions. I nodded. We have to go. The bridal suite is ready, and so am I. We're not going to your room? Wait, where are we going? Lad? What have you done? You'll see. I gave her hand a reassuring squeeze. Come on, before anyone tries to stop us. Though I doubt anyone's that stupid. Knox was walking into the ballroom as we were sneaking out. He gripped my shoulder firmly, wearing a big smile. No one is that stupid, I repeated. You sure when Ava put your brain back together, she didn't forget a piece or two, brother? I know you're not bailing on your own wedding reception and leaving me here to hold the bag. My next words were silent and just for him. Out of my way, brother, if you value those straight white teeth. It might be kind of hard to sing without them. Knox looked from me to Ryan to our clasped hands, then laughed and slapped me on the back, sprouting a knowing grin. Good point. Okay, then, you two enjoy your night. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. I didn't care what he would or wouldn't do. 
I only knew what I was going to do as soon as possible. I wished him a good night and led my new bride to her room. I stopped at the door. Change as quickly as you can. We're leaving Altum. Okay. Do you want to come in and wait? Staring down at her wide eyes and beautiful mouth and the hint of cleavage at the neckline of her dress, I considered it. I released a tense breath. No, I'd better wait out here. If I come in with you, we may never leave. And you'll never see all the surprises I have planned. I leaned in for a brief kiss. That was about all I could take at the moment. Hurry. Chapter 31, Ava I didn't wait for morning to leave. I cut out of the wedding party not long after dinner ended. Not that I wasn't happy for the happy couple, I was. I just didn't belong there, not really. And they certainly didn't need my help to celebrate the occasion. They didn't need me for anything. They were surrounded by family and friends. I had played my role righted the wrong I'd done to Lad and Ryan, and now it was time for me to go. I wasn't any more certain of my direction tonight than I'd been yesterday when I'd ended up at the top of an electrical tower. This time, though, I wouldn't be seeking to end my life, but begin a whole new one. I had no home, no family, no people, but at least I had finally been true to myself. For the first time in a long time, I didn't dread catching a glimpse of myself in the car mirror. And maybe Asher had been right after all. Maybe it wasn't too late for me. After hurriedly packing my belongings, I left Altum and walked to my car. Nosing it out onto the rural route that ran nearest the hidden underground kingdom, I looked one way and then the other. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. North. Sure, why not? Having made my choice... I drove past the Deep River City Limit sign. Taking the northern route meant driving through the small town, but this time I did not park at the grocery or cruise the Sonic looking for a big red pickup truck. I actually hoped I wouldn't see him. Out of sight, out of mind was the best policy when you were tempted to want something you could never have. Seeking him out to say goodbye would be like putting a plate of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies on the kitchen island while trying to stick to a diet. It was early evening anyway. He'd probably be at a football game or having dinner or maybe on a date. That thought curdled in my brain and produced an unpleasant clench in my chest. It doesn't matter, Ava. He's not for you. There is no one for you. I drove past the darkened storefronts on Main Street, the graceful, column-fronted library, the railroad museum. Waiting at one of the town's three stoplights, I stared up at the steeple of a huge brick church, wondering what it must be like inside, sitting in the filtered light of those tall, multi-hued windows. Something slammed into my car from the passenger side, the force snapped my head back and caused my seatbelt to compress my chest like a vise as the car rocked on two wheels, then fell back to the ground with a shivering thud. I looked around. No, wait, there's no car. What hit me? What's happening? The panic thoughts raced through my mind even as another powerful impact flipped my car. As if tossed by a giant hand, it rolled over and over before coming to a stop on its roof in the middle of the intersection. I hung upside down from my seatbelt, ears ringing, staring at the contents of my purse, which now decorated the interior of the car's roof. And then I saw the fire. Chapter 32, Ryan Lad and I walked hand in hand through the dark woods. Once we'd cleared the palace doors, his pace had slowed, thankfully. My heart rate, however, was even faster than before. I wasn't afraid of the woods or what might be in them that my human eyes couldn't detect. Lad was with me. He was the reason for my crazy fast pulse. The beginning of the forest path was lined with hanging lanterns, Candles in glass jars suspended from the tree branches at regular intervals on either side, 
much like the ones that had adorned the aisle during our wedding. Stars lit the night sky in glimpses where the canopy of treetops broke here and there. The light breeze was fresh with the fragrances of pine and wildflowers, and the crickets and frogs and cicadas sang their nocturnal ballad, accompanied by the occasional call of a whippoorwill. The woods had never seemed so magical or so romantic. I glanced up at Lad's candlelit face. He wore a serene smile, ripe with the promise of things to come. When were these lights put up? I asked. I may have been a bit of a slave driver today. Lad winced, but his sheepish grin told me he wasn't sorry at all. I'll give the servants a few extra days off to compensate when we go on our honeymoon. Honeymoon. We were married. It was like a dream. And when will that be? Since our wedding had been unexpectedly moved up, I wasn't sure quite what was happening with our planned trip. During your winter break, just as we planned, you have school and we have to wait for Knox and Vancha to complete their world tour. Right. But that doesn't mean we can't start the honeymoon here at home, he said. I'd like for you to move in with me as soon as possible. Yes, yes, I will. I'll pack my things tomorrow. My heart thumped hard in my chest. As far as I was concerned, the honeymoon started tonight. I didn't care where we were. All that mattered was we'd finally be together. We'd finally be bonded. As we neared his special tree deep in the forest, I saw the first of the surprises Lad had planned for me. Fireflies decorated its branches, dotting the leaves all around the treetop hideaway, making it look like the nest itself was glowing. No wonder you told me to change out of my wedding dress, I said over my shoulder, beginning to climb with Lad close behind me. That's not the only reason, he murmured. I was ready to tear it off of you all evening. I didn't want to lose control and have our long-awaited bonding take place in the first closet we came to leaving the palace. My laugh sounded high and nervous. My hands were shaking. Though I had no fear of falling, Lad would never let me fall. He had my back in every possible meaning of the phrase. He was about to have all of me and that thought made me more nervous than I would have believed. I had longed for this moment for ages, it seemed. Now that it was here, I was acutely conscious of the fact that I had no flipping idea what I was doing. As I touched the edge of the nest, the fireflies lifted and moved higher up into the branches, so only their tiny intermittent lights were still visible, a luminous canopy over our heads, prettier and far more magical than electrical twinkle lights could ever be. I rolled into the nest, surprised to find it felt different from before. It was lined completely with the softest white fabric, which seemed to be stuffed with down or something similar. It was like lying in a cloud. You like it? Lad beamed at me, following me in and falling back into the luxurious bedding. We have pillows, too. He dragged a plushy white pillow from the side of the nest and plumped it, inviting me to try it out. I lay back on it, sighing in pleasure. So this is what you were so busy putting the finishing touches on today. It's perfect, lad. Really, I could not imagine anything better. He grinned, obviously thrilled at my approval. I'm not finished. I have something for you. Setting another pillow aside, he drew the delicate origami box from its hiding place. I felt almost guilty I'd seen it already. Almost. Knowing he had made it for me and carved those precious words into it had kept a spark of hope alive in my heart during some very dark times recently. Pulling the delicate folds apart, I drew out the exquisite carving and turned it in my fingers appreciating all over again the love and labor and precious memories that had gone into making it. It's incredible, 
I whispered. I read the inscription again, and just like before, got a little choked up. My heart literally ached with the weight of the love I had for him. My voice was raspy when I told him, I have something for you too. His eyes flared with delighted surprise as I pulled a small velvet bag from my pocket where I'd stashed it after changing clothes. Suddenly, it didn't seem like enough, not compared to his wonderful gift. But then, nothing would ever be enough to express how much I loved him, how happy I was to be his bondmate. Shyly, I lay the bag on Lad's open palm. He widened the drawstring opening with a finger and then turned the bag over, pouring out its contents. A single shiny stone dropped into his large hand. It's from our secret pool, I said. I found it on the bottom. I've been keeping it in my room. Even when we broke up, I couldn't bear to get rid of it. It was my memento of you and our special place. A couple of weeks ago, I took it to the jeweler on Main Street. He looked at me like I was crazy. I know it doesn't hold any actual monetary value. But he agreed to polish it and drill a hole through the middle. I thought you could add it to your necklace. Lad immediately reached behind his neck and unclasped the leather cord he wore. He slipped off the other stones and replaced them with the one I'd given him, then put it back on. He lay his hand over it, pressing it against his bare skin. This is the only one I need, the only one that means something. I love it. I love you. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. In two worlds, actually. No, I'm the lucky one. I stretched up to kiss him, and he kissed me back with enthusiasm. But then he pulled away again. Before I could get in a word of complaint, he held up a finger. I have one more gift for you. Crawling across the nest to the ancient chest, he drew out the ale flute that normally resided in his room, the one he'd played for me so long ago when he'd first taken me back to Altum as a child. That tune had lingered in my mind all my life, playing through my dreams and fragments of memories of that mystical long-ago night. Ooh, mood music, I joked. But as Lad began strumming, my amusement faded. The melody was achingly beautiful, tender, and enchanting like something you'd only hear in a dream. And then he sang for me for the first time ever. The words were so personal, so filled with love, I was crying by the end of the first verse. And his voice, no sound had ever touched my heart like this. I had thought Knox's voice was magnificent. If Lad had been born a dark elf, there wouldn't have been a mansion large enough to hold the fan pod he would have amassed. His singing was so alluring, there was no way to adequately describe it. The song ended, and I went up on my knees and reached for him. He set the instrument aside and moved closer, allowing me to touch his face. That was... Why have you never sung for me before? Remember what I said when you asked me before why I wouldn't sing for you? Sort of. Something about me stalking you forever. No, I'm kidding. You said you didn't want to unfairly influence me. That's right. I wanted you to love me for me, not for any elven advantage I might have. I stared at him, wide-eyed with astonishment. Does that mean you have musical glamour as well as leadership? It means, he murmured, dusting my face with light kisses as he wrapped his arms tightly around me. I have all sorts of skills you have yet to discover. My stomach flipped at his words and suggestive tone. Then Lad rocked me back and pressed me into the soft, cloud-like bedding. I gasped at the rightness of the feeling. 
The weight of him over me, his heat all around me was so good. I thought I might actually swoon, or whatever the lying down version of that would be called. I am so ready to make you mine, Lad whispered against my cheekbone, and I knew it was true. The unmistakable response of his body to mine backed up his words, and if that wasn't enough evidence, my emotional glamour was brimming and spilling over with his desire. He was about to burst into flames. I was too. My craving for him was so overwhelming, all I could do was nod in fervent agreement as his hot lips worked their way to my ear, my jaw, my neck. He concentrated his attention there while his hands roamed and teased me until I could no longer keep still. My breaths were coming in short pants, my nerve endings in flames, hips lifting against him in an urgent plea. My beautiful girl, he whispered. Let me see you. He slid the straps of my dress from my shoulders and set to work on the tiny buttons that held the front together. There were too many of them. It was taking too long. Hurry, I whispered. Lad smiled, actually slowing down, and began kissing me between each button, prolonging the torture. Please go faster, I urged him. His low laugh curled my toes. We've waited all this time. I'm not going to rush through it now. I want to savor you. What if someone comes? What if something happens to stop us? His expression got deadly serious, his tone low and chill-inducing. Nothing and no one is going to stop us. Do you hear me? Someone could come and chop the tree down, light it on fire, and I won't stop. I've wanted you too much for too long. This is going to happen. Now relax and let me take care of you. I sighed in defeat and also in pleasure, watching him unbutton and kiss his way down to the center of my chest. When he'd finally undone the last one, he peeled the fabric away from my body and stopped, staring. His expression was worshipful. His pulse was racing like I'd never felt it before. You are too beautiful, he whispered as his fingers stroked my exposed skin. The pleasure of his touch was so acute I could barely speak. My voice was a husky whisper. Lad, I need you now, please. He made a hoarse sound that was somewhere between excitement and pain. Apparently my weight was over. He drew the dress the rest of the way down my body, then stood to remove his own shirt and pants. I'd seen him shirtless many times, of course, but we'd never been completely unclothed together before. His body, in the light of the moon and the firefly glow, was almost unreal, even more perfect than I'd imagined. The magnificent chest, arms, and abs I knew so well were matched by powerful legs and hard, masculine muscle everywhere I looked. His tanned skin gleamed like polished bronze in the muted light. I was dying to touch it, to feel him all over, and for him to touch me everywhere. My skin was fire-hot and exquisitely sensitive. All my nerve endings were awake and tuned to Lad as I waited for him to settle that long, beautiful body over me for the intimate contact I'd been so eagerly anticipating all these torturous months. A fiery glow lit his eyes, sparking every part of my body and mind to full attention. No more waiting, he whispered, as he lowered himself over me, bringing our bodies into perfect alignment. After that, there were no more words. The vows we'd spoken during the ceremony tonight, some aloud, some mind to mind, had joined our families, our futures, 
even our hearts. But as our bodies joined and became one for the first time, I discovered there was another way to make a promise, and it required no words at all. We lay together, our breathing gradually slowing. One of my legs was thrown bonelessly across his body. My head rested on his chest right over that inhumanly fast heartbeat. That heart belongs to me now, forever. You know, people talk about losing your virginity, but I don't feel like I've lost anything, I said. I feel like I've gained something. Lad chuckled. You have. Your very own sex slave who's going to follow you around day and night begging for your very special attention. I smiled at that, and one of his big hands cupped my head, his fingers playing in my hair. He lifted a bit to see my face. Now you can see why we only bond with one person for eternity. Yes, I whispered. It's like we're the same now. I mean, it's difficult to express. I feel different, like you're a part of me that could never be removed, like you've always been or something. It really was impossible to put into words. All I knew was that I'd been changed and that our love never would. Yes. He nodded and relaxed again, staring up at the night sky. That's exactly what it feels like. I can't ever imagine even wanting to do that with someone else. Gazing down into my eyes again, he said, You were always the one for me, Ryan. I feel like you were born just for me. I was meant to find you that night in the woods. Thank the gods you wanted me too. Otherwise, I would have had to reenact some of the darker fairy tales and kidnap you and drag you down to my underworld as my prisoner. He laughed. As if I could resist this. I tightened my arm around his waist, loving the texture of his skin, the heavy muscle under my hands, the feel of our bodies pressed close together. I never want to leave this nest. He folded me even closer against him. Me either. I never want to do anything ever again except love you. Then don't. I kissed his neck and let my toes wander up his bare leg. I was flattered to feel the racing pulse beneath his hot skin. He was excited again, already. He let out a combination laugh, growl, and rolled to his back dragging me onto his chest. You won't get any argument from me. I suppose we'll have to eat something eventually, or maybe I'll just... A huge, thunderous noise rolled through the woods, quite literally vibrating the tree and our nest. Lad lifted me to the side, and we both sat up straight, alarmed. My heart throbbed in sharp, painful pulses. What was that? I hissed as he got to his feet. It sounded like an explosion. He was staring at something over the nearby treetops. He gave me his hand and tugged me up to stand beside him. Look. His outstretched arm pointed in the direction of town. Just as I turned my head to follow his finger, another powerful blast rocked the woods. I jumped and cringed, raising an arm defensively out of instinct. An eerie orange glow lit the horizon. My fingertips dug into the tensed muscle of Lad's forearm. It had definitely been an explosion, and now something big was burning in Deep River. One of my hands came up to cover my mouth. Oh my God, I hope no one's hurt. Ryan. Lad turned me to face him, gripping my shoulders tightly. His face was grim. I've spent most of my life watching the world from this vantage point. He paused, his lips pressing into a tight line. I'm not certain, but I think, I think that was your tea factory. 
Thank you for listening to Hidden Darkness, Book 4 of The Hidden Saga. There's more to come in The Hidden World. Book 5 of the saga, Hidden Danger, is available now in ebook, print, and audiobook. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so you'll be notified when it comes to YouTube. Here's a bit about the story. The Dark Council has struck a shocking and powerful blow against the Light Court and its human allies, defying their own king, Nox, and seeking to re-establish Dark Elven influence and domination over the human world. While Ryan and Lad work to restore production of Magnolia Sugar Tea, Ava is forced to return to the Dark Court to face her mother and Auden, the head of the Dark Council, and learn the consequences for disobeying their orders. With no other choice, she sets off on a road trip with her former fiancé, Cully, whom she does not like and does not trust, and leaves behind Asher, the intriguing and much too tempting human boy she met in Deep River. Along the way, she'll discover the truth behind Cully's mission in Altum and the disastrous effect it will have on the human race. But there's more than meets the eye when it comes to this mysterious dark elven guy with his alluring and deceptive glamour, and Ava will find herself torn between two possible futures as she sets her own course through the hidden world. Keep listening for a preview. The blood rushed to my head, making it hard to think. All I knew was one minute I was sitting at one of the three stoplights in this dinky little town, and the next my car was being blown across the intersection as if it was a cardboard paper towel tube tumbling in a windstorm. I wasn't hurt. At least, I didn't think I was. I was still strapped into my seatbelt. In fact, it constricted my chest and ribs painfully as I hung suspended from it, my hair in my eyes, my hands still clenching the steering wheel. Trying to get my bearings and figure out what was going on, I glanced to the right. Oh, God. The passenger side was crushed. That's why the car was tilted to one side. I seemed to be in the one pocket of the front seat that remained intact. Chunks of glass protruded from the frame of the windshield, like the few remaining teeth in a bare-knuckle fighter's mouth. Through the opening, the upside-down view of the street portrayed a chaotic scene. Debris was strewn across the road, things that did not look like car parts, and people running. Everything looked orange. Maybe I had a head injury after all. No, the orange glow was fire. I could smell it. Something, a building, or maybe a huge truck, was engulfed in flames. I could feel the heat of it, though I didn't have a clear view of exactly what had exploded. Yes, an explosion. That was what it was. Had to be. I remembered something slamming the car, rocking it up on two wheels, and then, just as the car righted itself again, another blast hit and sent me rolling side over side. Maybe one of those big fuel trucks had crashed into a power pole and blown up. I strained to see more, but in my restricted and increasingly uncomfortable position, I couldn't spot what was burning. What if it was a fuel truck and it was right next to me? My car could catch on fire, too. That thought brought me out of my dazed state. I need to get out of here. Pressing one hand against the ceiling for support, I fumbled for my seatbelt clasp, pressed the button. Nothing. Ugh, it was stuck or something. There was a metallic screech as someone wrenched open my car's door, which, now that I was looking at it, was oddly bent. Ava? Ava! Asher's face peered through the opening shockingly white and creased with concern. Then his expression relaxed. Oh, thank God you're alive. When I saw this little convertible on its top. Elation and relief rushed through me in a cool stream. Hi, I said. Can you get me out? My head feels like a water balloon that's about to burst. My voice was shaky. Before I'd seen his face, there had been no tears threatening. 
But now it was all I could do not to lose it. You bet. Just hold on a minute, baby. I'm gonna get you. Dropping to his knees, Asher slid an arm under me, taking some of the pressure off of my chest. I drew in a breath, the first full one I'd been able to take since the crash. The influx of oxygen was heavenly. Just as I had done, Asher pushed the seatbelt's release button, then pushed it again. He turned his face toward mine. At this angle, our noses practically touched, and his eyes were a bit out of focus. Beads of sweat covered his forehead. I'm gonna have to get something to cut this with, okay? I'll be right back. You just hang in there. Ha ha. He smiled at me. That wasn't meant to be a joke, but I'm glad to see your sense of humor didn't suffer any damage. His eyes scanned me quickly. Anything else hurting? I shook my head, jostling what felt like the entire volume of my body's blood content. No, I'm just shaken up. And it's a little hard to breathe. The creases came back to his face. Okay, I'll be right back. Don't take too long, okay? The words were an anxious whine. I won't, I promise. You can time me if you want. He withdrew from the car, and I watched as he got to his feet, watched his boots retreating. Because I had nothing better to do, and I was starting to feel a little claustrophobic and panicky, I did count. One, two, three, four. By the time I got to twenty, Asher's boots were back in sight. At twenty-five, he was once again crowded into the squashed front seat with me, this time holding an open pocket knife. How'd I do? He asked as he slid the knife under the seatbelt near the clasp and began moving his hand in a sawing motion. His other arm was beneath me again, I supposed ready to catch me when the belt was severed. I could hear his rhythmic breathing as he worked. Uh, 25 seconds, not bad. He grinned and shook his head, then paused in his sawing motion. You know, before I finish up this heroic rescue, I've got to say something. I furrowed my brow. What? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe you're having a problem. In spite of my bizarre circumstances, I laughed, which hurt my ribs. Maybe, I conceded. No, come on now, admit it. You've got a problem, and as promised, I'm helping you solve it. Are you going to leave me hanging here all day if I don't play along? Maybe, he smiled. Then, yes, Asher, I have a problem. Now, would you please get me the hell? Before I could finish the sentence, he made the last cut and sort of dived beneath me, so when I dropped the short distance from the belt, I fell onto him and not the car's roof or the shattered windshield. And for a second we lay there, his arms wrapped tightly around me. I got you, he said into my hair. I got you. You're okay now. I allowed myself to soften against his chest and breathe deeply. He smelled like fresh-cut grass and yummy guy shampoo and smoke. Oh, yeah, the fire. I lifted my head and looked around. We should move. It's okay, he said. The fire's across the street, the factory. You lie still. I'm going to slide out and bring you with me. In case you've got a broken bone or something and don't realize it yet, you may be in shock. Just pretend I'm a stretcher. I nodded and clung to him, wondering, for the first time, why a teenage boy was performing my rescue instead of a firefighter or someone more qualified. Someone with an actual stretcher, for instance. Not that I was complaining. I couldn't let human paramedics examine me anyway. And then... We were free of the wreckage, and I understood. The scene outside the car was utter pandemonium. I stood to take it all in. The beautiful church I'd been admiring was blackened on one side. 
those multicolored windows in jagged pieces or missing altogether. Across the street, a low, stretched-out building was fully engulfed in flames. It looked like a factory or a one-story warehouse. Several other wrecked cars were scattered on the street in various stages of annihilation. Mine hadn't gotten the worst of it. Or the best. I turned to look at the wreckage of my little convertible, and all the air deserted my lungs at once, leaving me struggling for breath once again. It was smashed. How had I even survived it? Feeling dizzy, I rocked on my feet. Asher's arms came around me again. You okay? You should sit down until the EMTs can take a look at you. He walked me to the nearest curb and guided me to sit, his supportive arms still around my back. What happened? I finally thought to ask the obvious question. I'm not sure. That's the Magnolia Sugar Tea Company. I was down the road near the park when I saw the blast. I drove up as close as I could and got out to see if anybody needed help. And then I saw your car. That's as much as I know. I stared at the flames, the black smoke pouring from the open roof of the building. The heat of it was immense, even here across the street. It was hard to look at it without squinting. Do you think anyone was inside? If they had been, it was unlikely they'd survived. He shook his head. No, I don't think so. It's closed for the night. My buddy's checking inside the church. Lifting his eyes, he scanned the fiery scene. Oh, man, Ryan's going to be torn up. Her grandma, too. He turned back to me. She's one of my classmates. It's her family's business. A cold sensation seized my heart. Ryan's tea factory. Cully's mission. Was that what he'd been talking about? Had he been sent here to take out the source of the tea that was freeing humans from elven influence? I twisted away from Asher and dry heaved over the sidewalk. His hands came to the back of my head, sweeping my hair back from my face. After waiting for my spasm to pass, he said, I'm going to see if I can get somebody to check on you. They've got their hands pretty full, though. God, this is a mess. You'll be okay here for a minute? I nodded weakly, but I was not okay. How could Cully have done this? I didn't know him well, but after spending the past week or so with him, I didn't think he had this kind of evil in him. Yes, he'd advised me to simply do my job, not to think about whether it was right or wrong. He said that was what he always did. But this was so extreme. He might have killed people tonight. Asher hustled toward a nearby ambulance, where uniformed paramedics were loading a writhing man into the back. I glanced around again. It seemed like everywhere I looked there were shocked faces. Some people crying, others running toward the destruction or away from it. A mother shielded her young child's eyes from a pool of blood in the street near another one of the ruined cars. Within two minutes, Asher was back, kneeling in front of me. With a hand under his chin, he tipped my face up so our gazes met. Those incredible turquoise eyes were so serious, so full of concern. Listen, they know you're here, and they're going to get to you as soon as they can. There are a lot of people who need help, a lot of people hurt. I need to help out. There aren't enough emergency personnel to handle it all. You stay right here, okay? Don't get up and wander off. You need someone to check you out. I'll be back for you as soon as I can. I nodded, but he wasn't satisfied. Promise me, Ava. Don't leave before I come back. Okay, I promise. It wasn't a hard vow to make. I had no way to leave. My car was a lopsided pancake in the middle of the road. I didn't feel like moving anyway. I was sort of numb and disconnected. This was horrible. And I felt responsible, like I should have prevented it or something. Maybe it had been an accident? My spirit lifted for a second, then immediately sank again. Not likely. 
It was too coincidental that Ryan's factory had blown up the night after Cully left Altum. He must not have headed for L.A. right away, as he'd said he would. I'd been wondering how he planned to get home anyway. I had picked him up from the airport in Memphis last week after driving cross-country myself. He'd had a modeling gig in New York City and couldn't drive out with me from the West Coast. Not that I'd wanted to share a three-day car trip with him. Now I was hoping I never saw his face again. From somewhere behind me, I heard the screech of car tires. Another town resident getting a first look at the carnage, no doubt. At the sound of footsteps hitting the pavement at a dead run, I turned at the waist to look. I'm not sure why. I guess that's just what you do when you hear someone running toward you. It was Cully. Great. I got to my feet, now feeling stiff and sore all over, prepared to walk away from the devil approaching me with his designer clothes and tense expression and treacherous beauty. With his unnatural good looks and tall athletic physique, he resembled an actor on the set of an action movie more than a real person happening upon a real disaster scene. Of course, he wasn't a person, not in the literal sense of the word. When he spotted me, Cully's pace slowed to a saunter, and I didn't walk away. No, I wanted to confront him, make him account for what he'd done. By the time he reached me, his face had lost all traces of concern and displayed his typical nonchalance. His eyes roamed over me, assessing, perhaps checking to see whether his plot against the humans would lead to any unfortunate collateral damage. Then his gaze slid to the side, taking in my destroyed car and back to me. Good thing you dumped me, Angel. If I'd been in that passenger seat, the world would be minus one cully rune. Yes, that would have been tragic, I deadpanned. What are you doing here, Cully? I thought you'd be long gone by now. I was. I made it to the airport in Memphis. But then you decided to come back to the scene of the crime. I guess criminals do that sort of thing. I've seen it on cop shows. His eyes flared. Criminals? You think I had something to do with this? Didn't you? Wasn't this your mission? For a moment, I thought I saw a glimpse of hurt in his eyes, or insult, but then it was gone, replaced by flinty blue obstinance. I did not. It was not. He reached toward me, laying a hand on my arm. So, you're okay? You're not hurt? I shrugged away from him. No, I'm fine. I was lucky, which is more than I can say for a lot of people here tonight. Across the street, someone yelled for help, and a couple of girls Asher's age ran toward him. Cully didn't even turn his head. He was still focused on me. And what about back at Altum with the Light King and Knox? They didn't punish you? Or did they just throw you out? I shook my head. They did neither. Listen. I don't really have anything left to say to you, okay? You've verified that your bomb worked, or whatever, so you should probably get back on the road. Now Cully's eyes narrowed. I didn't do this, Iva. I've already told you that. Do you really believe I'm a... a, a terrorist? The word no leapt to my mind. But what other explanation was there? Why else would he have come back here? I believe that you do what your father commands you to, and I know you're good at making people see what they want to see. I had discovered Cully's unique glamour on the day I'd met him. We'd been on a shoot together, and it quickly became obvious why he was the world's most in-demand male model. He wasn't just attractive. He'd explained it fell along the lines of the old adage, Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. No matter who was looking at him, male or female, child or adult, human or elven, they all saw their ideal. He was literally the best-looking guy they'd ever seen. Cully smirked. 
believe it or not, Iva, my glamour and my moral centre are two separate things. I think you would understand that, if anyone would. Ouch. The comment jabbed my insides and left a stinging gash. But he was right. For years, I had used my own glamour to hurt people in the service of Cully's father, Auden, the head of the Dark Council. I'd erased their memories, or implanted new ones, and it had made me feel like scum. I was seriously hoping that just because a glamour could be used for evil purposes, that didn't mean it had to be. In fact, I was making my break from the dark court and setting off on my own when my car had been caught up in the crossfire of this tragedy. It doesn't matter what I think. You should be worried about what these deputies milling around here are going to think. You're a stranger in a very small town at the wrong time. So am I. We both need to go. Cully stared at me for a moment. Then he took my hand. Come with me. I yanked my fingers from his grasp as Asher walked up. His eyes went from me to Cully, back to me again, clearly taking in the unfriendly body language. He slid an arm around my shoulders. Everything okay here? This guy bothering you? Cully bristled at his words and his familiar handling of me, straightening to his full six-foot-three height. It put him at only an inch taller than Asher. This guy, he said, his light Australian accent suddenly more pronounced, is her fiancé, so you can just nick off, farm boy. Asher's hand on my shoulder tensed. I wasn't speaking to you. Turning to look directly into my eyes, he asked again, his words gentle and low, meant only for me. Are you all right, Ava? My heart pulsed hard, a sweet pain that tightened my throat. He's not my fiancé. I wasn't sure why it was so important to make the clarification at that moment. He was, but he's not anymore. It's complicated. Asher nodded. Okay. I want you to go sit in my truck and wait for me while I check with the EMTs. I think they're about to transport some people. Did anyone get to you? No, but I'm fine. His eyebrows lowered, and his lips stretched into a thin, displeased line. I'm driving you to the hospital, just in case. Here are my keys. Go get in. I'll be right there. He held out his keys, expecting me to take them, expecting me to allow him to take care of me, keep taking care of me. I couldn't do that. And I couldn't go to the hospital. Before I had a chance to tell him that, Cully spoke up. Listen, mate, I'll take it from here. You've been all Johnny on the spot and whatever, good on ya, but I'll look after my girl. Asher took a step forward, insinuating his body between me and Cully. I believe Ava's already made it clear she's not your girl anymore. My gaze bounced between the two aggressively positioned guys and my pulse quickened. This wouldn't do. And though I would not be leaving with Cully, I couldn't leave with Asher either. I couldn't go to the hospital. I couldn't allow him to get more involved in my life than he already was. The burning building on my right was a perfect example of the reason. My world was too dangerous for a human interloper. I was dangerous to him. I touched his arm lightly. Asher, can I speak with you for a minute? He glanced over his shoulder at me, then took a breath and fell back from his standoff with Cully. Together we walked a few feet away as Asher muttered, That guy's mouth is gonna break his nose one of these days, as my granddaddy would say. I know, I know. He's kind of full of it. Asher dipped his head to listen as I spoke to him in a low voice. It's okay. I'll handle him. He's harmless. He glanced to the side where Cully stood watching us with clenched fists and a scowl. 
Even now, he was ridiculously good-looking. What did Asher see when he looked at him? Some kind of threat, obviously. Harmless, he repeated, not sounding convinced. Did he have something to do with the reason you climbed that tower the other day? Um, not directly. I can't really explain. Just don't worry about me, okay? I'll be fine. I can handle him. Asher's big hands enveloped mine. His sincere eyes bored into mine. You don't have to handle anything. Not alone. My friend Richie owns a body shop and a tow truck. I called him to get your car out of here and find you a loner. In the meantime, I'll take you wherever you need to go. Cully stepped close, butting into our private conversation. She's going to California, mate. You planning to saddle up your plow horse and take her there? Asher slid an acid glance over at him. If that's what she needs, he growled. Cully reached out and grabbed Asher's shoulder. Asher knocked his arm away. This was getting out of hand. I stepped in between them and held my arms out to either side like a boxing referee. Wait a minute. Asher, thank you, but no, I don't need your help. And Cully, I'm not going back to California. You know why. His eyes narrowed in a warning look. They'll find you, you know, even with a head start. Slanting a glance in Asher's direction, he added, even with a beefed-up bodyguard. You can't win this one, Iva. I lifted my chin, hoping he was wrong, even though I suspected he was right. I can try. They don't own me. It's a free country. Cully shook his head, his lips twisting in a sad smile. Not for us, Angel. Not for us. Take a second to hit the subscribe button and you'll be notified when Hidden Danger comes to YouTube. And join the author's newsletter at amypatrickbooks.com and never miss a new release. Plus, get a free Hidden Saga story. You've been listening to Hidden Darkness, book four of the Hidden Saga, written by Amy Patrick, narrated by Amy DeLuca. Copyright 2016 by Amy Patrick. Performance Copyright 2018 by Amy Patrick. Thanks for watching.